Section 1 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. American State Trials, Volume 2 by John D. Lawson Trial of Robert Sticks for Cruelty to Animals, New York City, 1822 The Narrative Long before the first Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals was founded, dumb beasts had their champions and friends. One of them, a Mr. Hone, walking down Broadway in the city of New York, observed a teamster savagely beating his horses, which were unable to move a heavily loaded wagon. The friend of animals protested, and the teamster replying that he had a right to whip his horses as he pleased, Mr. Hone proceeded to enforce his argument with his good right arm, in which encounter the man came out second best. Notwithstanding the beating he received, he was hailed before a New York court, convicted by the jury and punished. The judge, the well-known recorder Riker, ruling that to treat a dumb beast with cruelty was a misdemeanor at common law. The Trial In the Court of General Sessions, New York City, December 1822 Honorable Richard Riker, Recorder Jacob B. Taylor and Henry Mead, Alderman. December 20. Robert Stakes, having been indicted for beating his horses in a cruel and barbarous manner, his trial came on today. Mr. Maxwell, District Attorney for the People. Mr. Fay, for the Prisoner. The Evidence. Mr. Hone. The prisoner was driving two horses attached to a wagon containing a load of manure. The load was very heavy, and near the office of the Daily Advertiser on Broadway, above Broom Street, they stopped, unable to draw it further. Stakes thereupon struck them a number of blows over the head, neck, and shoulders with the butt end of his whip. I expostulated and told him he was brutal and must stop it. He swore at me, and as he continued to beat them, I seized the whip, which led to a scuffle between us, which ended in my bruising his face rather badly. Mr. Hone, a brother of the first witness, corroborates his testimony. Mr. Walker, I saw the beating. It was cruel and excessive. The horses could not draw the load. I saw at least a dozen blows struck. Most of the blows were on the heads of the horses. Mr. Sherwood and Mr. Bruin thought the beating was uncalled for, as the load was too heavy for the horses. One of the horses was vicious and bulky, and did not do his share. Mr. Fay to the jury. The evidence is not satisfactory against the defendant. It does not appear that the horses were injured. It was proved the horses were vicious and would not draw the load, that they had balked two or three times coming into town with an empty wagon, that the tricks of a vicious horse were extremely calculated to inflame the passions of its owner. The driver might on such an occasion as the one now before the court strike the horse ten or a dozen blows, even with the butt end of a whip, without being answerable by indictment or otherwise. A parent has a right to correct and chastise his children. A schoolmaster has authority to correct his scholars, and a master his servant, and it would be strange and an anomaly in the law if a brute might not be corrected for its vicious habits. Mr. Maxwell, the Almighty had given man dominion over the fowls of the air, the beasts of the field, and the fishes of the sea, but he must take care that his dominion be not abused, 
like other gifts of the deity, it might be, and often was, abused. In such a case, the municipal laws of the country stepped in to the aid of those of nature and religion, and would punish him for any infraction of their rules. The evidence was conclusive against the defendant. It appeared by the testimony of Mr. Hone and Mr. Walker, and also by the brother of Mr. Hone, that the beating was outrageous and without any justification. It was in the open street, in the most populous part of the city, showing an example unworthy of a man in inflicting an unwarrantable injury upon a brute. Several cases had occurred in this city and vicinity that shocked the feelings of a number of citizens, and this case called loudly for an example and punishment. The Court It appears by the evidence that the prisoner was engaged in courting manure from the city to a place in the country. The prisoner had got as far with his load as Broom Street and Broadway, when his horses either refused to draw or were unable to draw it any further. It appears he commenced beating one of them very severely. He beat the horse over the head, neck, and shoulders with the butt end of his whip. Mr. Hone, who was passing at the time, humanely interfered. A scuffle ensued, the prisoner swearing he had a right to whip his horses without being called to account. He struck them over the head and not on those parts experienced horsemen have recourse to. The testimony, in the opinion of the court, does not appear to excuse or authorize the excessive violence of the beating. Mr. Hone's testimony is explicit and positive, that he beat one of the horses over the head with the butt end of his cart whip ten or twelve blows and was corroborated by his brother and Mr. Walker, a clerk in the office of the Daily Advertiser, testified that he struck the horse's forty or fifty blows, and thinks the beating was very violent and excessive. He declared that his feelings were so wounded by the transaction that he was on the point of leaving the office for the purpose of arresting the violent proceedings of the prisoner. It is true by the testimony of Mr. Sherwood and Mr. Bruin, that the load was heavy, and that one of the horses was vicious, and sometimes refused to draw the load, yet it does not appear but that by proper management they might have been made to draw it. Yet, if they would not, the defendant had no right to beat them in the inhuman manner he did. The district attorney has stated the law truly, a man may be punished for any abuse of his gift of power over the brute. If you think this power was abused, you will find the defendant guilty. But if you think it was not abused, if you think the horses were vicious and refused to draw the load, or if you think they were not overloaded and that the butt end of the whip is a proper instrument, the defendant will be entitled to your verdict of acquittal. The jury returned a verdict of guilty. Riker, Recorder To treat a dumb beast with cruelty is a misdemeanor at common law. Cruelty to a beast cannot be justified. We have heard of several cases of late that have demanded the interposition of justice. We have heard of instances where the tongues of suckling calves have been tied for the purpose of preventing their dams being sucked, and also cases where they have been bled to death for the purpose of giving color to their flesh. In all such cases of wanton cruelty brought before this court, they will not only notice but punish the guilty offender. End of section 1. Read by Consortiania. Section 2 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker. July 11, 2023, 
Westford, Massachusetts. American State Trials, Volume 2, by John D. Lawson. Trial of Thomas Wilson Dorr for Treason, Rhode Island, 1844, Part 1. The Narrative. This is the story of an American Revolution known of by few Americans. After the Revolution of 1776, the various colonies proceeded to form new governments, and with the exception of Connecticut and Rhode Island, all of them framed and adopted new constitutions. These two states, unlike the others, continued to rule themselves under the old charters which had been granted by the crown, and without a written constitution, they were like England, not subject to any constitutional limitations but their governments were supreme. Footnote. The General Assembly was even more powerful than the Parliament of England, for it had always exercised, and it continued to exercise until the Constitution of 1842, supreme legislative, executive, and judicial powers. Just before 1842, it became felt by an ever-increasing number of the people of the state that the time had come when there should be some express limitation upon the powers of the General Assembly and an extension of the suffrage. A limitation of the powers of the General Assembly by itself would be of no avail, for whatever the General Assembly enacted, it could at any time repeal. The General Assembly had at various times enlarged and restricted the suffrage, and it could enlarge it now, but it would not. The only way to bring about these changes was through a state constitution, framed by a convention and adopted by the people. The people of the state, after much agitation and discussion extending over many years, with the necessity for action steadily increasing, finally undertook to do in the period ending in 1842 what the people of the other colonies had done in 1776 or soon after. The opposition to this course by the land-owning constituted authorities brought about the Door War that ended in Door's personal defeat but ultimately in the partial accomplishment of the establishment of the principles for which he contended. In 1724, the General Assembly passed an act limiting the suffrage to landowners and their oldest sons. With the decay of shipping and commerce after the Revolution and the War of 1812, the increase of cotton spinning brought into existence a new class in the state. It came about that the members of the class holding the government in their hands were not increasing in numbers in the same ratio that the members of the new class were, so that, through the exclusion from the suffrage of the rapidly growing class, consisting of artisans, tradespeople, and professional men, a minority was governing the majority. End quote. Mr. Eaton's paper, page 7. End footnote. In 1818, Connecticut adopted a written constitution, and in 1842, a majority of the people of Rhode Island, having many times appealed to the legislature in vain, undertook to do what every other American state had done, form their own constitution or government. The leader of this movement, which terminated in an unsuccessful rising, was Thomas Wilson Dorr, and the event is known in history as Dorr's Rebellion. Rhode Island had not a Republican form of government such as the founders of the federal constitution intended, but an oligarchy parading under the name. As early as 1777, the people began to petition the General Assembly to call a constitutional convention. They did so again in 1821, in 1822, in 1824, and in 1829, only to be told that the signers were a low and degraded portion of the community, and that if they did not like the constitution of the state as it then existed, they were at liberty to leave it. Then the people began to see clearly that the only remedy they had was to ignore the General Assembly and to proceed to form a new constitution independently of it. In 1834, the agitation became great, and delegates from the towns of Newport, Providence, and eight other towns assembled in convention in Providence 
to decide upon the, quote, best course to be pursued for the establishment of a written constitution which should properly define and fix the powers of the different departments of government and the rights of the citizen, end quote. Dorr was a delegate from Providence and was one of a committee of five to report at a second meeting. He was chairman of this committee and wrote its report, which brought him at once to the front as a leader. The General Assembly was asked to call a convention representative of the people at large to prepare a liberal and permanent constitution, urging, quote, that the same legislature which has imposed upon the citizens of Rhode Island a landed qualification not spoken of in the charter has at least as much right to suspend it for the single purpose of facilitating the exercise by the people of the great original right of sovereignty in the formation of a constitution, end quote. The General Assembly's only reply was to pass an act requesting the legal voters to choose delegates, quote, for the purpose of amending the present or proposing a new constitution for this state, the delegates to be of the same number and like qualifications as the members of the General Assembly, and the results of the labor of the convention to be submitted to the vote of the existing electorate. End quote. This, without any enlargement of the suffrage, meant, of course, no change at all, and it became at last evident to the excluded majority that it must take the control into its own hands and frame a new constitution without regard to the existing government. The Rhode Island Suffrage Convocation was formed, with branches in nearly every town in the state whose principles were that, quote, Whenever a majority of the citizens of this state who are recognized as citizens of the United States shall, by their delegates in convention assembled, draft a constitution, and the same shall be accepted by their constituents, it will then be, to all intents and purposes, the law of the state. End quote. The whole movement was thus changed. Instead of educating the people to demand reforms in the government through the General Assembly and a convention to be called by the General Assembly, a peaceful revolution was to be brought about by ignoring the constituted authorities. This was the beginning of the movement that culminated next year in the Door War. Neither of the two parties, Whig or Democratic, inaugurated this movement. It was the result of the awakening to a realizing sense of their number, power, and opportunity of the excluded classes under the leadership of Dorr and others, aided by the incapacity, the blind fatuity, and the almost inconceivable bad management of the landholders and their leaders. The convention called by the General Assembly in 1834 had been a failure. Only a few delegates attended, and they did nothing. So in 1841, it called another convention, but it maintained the existing qualifications for the election and was, of course, treated with scorn by the suffragists, who two months later met in convention at Providence and submitted a constitution to the vote of the state. It having been carried by the voters, the convention resolved and declared that the, quote, said constitution rightfully ought to be and is the paramount law and constitution of the state of Rhode Island and Providence plantations. And we do further resolve and declare for ourselves and in behalf of the people whom we represent that we will establish said constitution and sustain and defend the same by all necessary means, end quote. Second convention called by the General Assembly, like the first, was a fiasco and adjourned without doing anything. So in January 1842, that body passed an act providing that, quote, all persons now qualified to vote, and those who may be qualified to vote under the existing laws, together with all persons who shall be qualified to vote under the provisions of the Constitution, to be framed by the Convention authorized by the General Assembly, shall be qualified to vote upon the question of the adoption of said Constitution, end quote. This was a virtual surrender to the suffragists and should have been accepted by them, 
but it was not. The Assembly Convention reassembled, framed its constitution, but on being submitted to the voters, it was defeated by a narrow majority. At this stage, the judges of the Supreme Court promulgated an opinion that the convention which formed the people's constitution assembled without law, that the votes in favor of it were given without law, and however strong an expression of public opinion they might represent, their constitution was not the paramount law of the land and was of no binding force whatever, and that any attempt to carry it into effect would be treason against the state, if not against the United States. In reply, Dorr published an opinion of nine lawyers, including himself, to the effect that the People's Constitution was the Republican form of government required by the Federal Constitution, and that it had been legally and lawfully adopted. In March 1842, the General Assembly passed an act declaring illegal and void all meetings for the election of state officers not held in accordance with the laws of the state, forbidding anyone to act as an officer at such illegal meeting or to accept any office by virtue of such an election, with provisions for punishment by heavy fines and imprisonment of minor officers, and also for punishment as treason in the case of the higher officers. The act provided that trials for the offenses specified might be held in any county, whether the offense was committed in that or some other county. It was this act under which Dorr was subsequently tried and convicted of treason. One of the newspapers having stated that the Bay of Algiers was lacking in power to enforce such a law, it became known derisively as the Algerine Law and those supporting it, the Law and Order Party, were called Algerines by the Dorites. This law induced many of the Dorite nominees for office to decline, and a committee of which Dor was chairman was elected to fill vacancies. The other members of this committee, Dor not acting, now announced their state ticket, with Dor at the head as governor, and at the election held by his party on April 18, 1842, Dorr and other state officers were unanimously elected. It is impossible to account for the supineness of the constituted authorities in allowing these elections to take place after the publication of the opinions of the members of the Supreme Court and the passage of the Algerine Law, except upon the supposition that that as the General Assembly had passed no act to enable the governor to call out the militia, and as the governor had no real authority, none being given to him by the Charter of 1663, he did not feel authorized to do so. It seems certain that this failure to take any step to suppress the Dorite movement encouraged the Dorites to go on in their course. In addition, both sides well knew that the militia could not be relied upon. Two days later, the regular election under the charter came off, and Samuel Ward King was elected governor. Two rival governors and general assemblies were now in existence. The charter government appealed to President Tyler to suppress the Dorites, but were met by a refusal, and on May 3, 1842, Dorr was inaugurated governor at the first and only meeting of his legislature. A procession of perhaps 2,000 persons, including some militia companies and an independent company, some of whom were armed, preceded by the usual brass band, escorted the governor-elect and the members of the General Assembly-elect to a new unoccupied Foundry Building, whence this became known as the Foundry Legislature, and where Dorr delivered his inaugural address. At this point, Dorr made his second great blunder, the first being his not taking possession of the state capitol and offices on the day he took office. Hearing that the Charter Assembly had appealed to Washington again, he went there himself to oppose the appeal and secure the aid of the federal government for himself. The Charter authorities at once raised the cry that he had run away and issued warrants for his arrest and arrested a number of his leading supporters. 
learning of this, he returned at once, and the next day made an appeal to arms by an attack upon the arsenal to obtain possession of the guns and military supplies stored there. But, unknown to him, a detachment of militia was inside, and among its officers was Samuel Ames, who had married Dorr's sister. The night was warm, very dark and foggy. Everyone lost everyone, and it is impossible to make out exactly what did take place. There was an attempt to fire a cannon against the arsenal, and some witnesses testified at Dorr's trial for treason that Dorr himself made the attempt, but this was denied by other witnesses. The cannon would not go off because a pail of water had been poured into it. The attack failed. Dorr's force dispersed, and by morning, Dorr drove out of the city and left the state, barely escaping arrest, and went to New York. Being informed that his followers were gathering at Chapachet, Dorr joined them on June 25th. To his surprise and disappointment, he found only a slight breastwork thrown up on Acoats Hill and about 140 men in arms with no commissariat. Now at last Governor King declared martial law and called out the militia of the state, and to the number of more than 4,000 they assembled at Providence and marched and countermarched. Then a portion was sent to Foster, and an advance guard was cautiously dispatched to Greenville about halfway to Chapachet. The insignificant, undrilled handful of volunteers at Acoats Hill gradually melted away, and calling a council, Dorr and his officers decided to disband. The decision was made known to the men between 6 and 7 o'clock on the afternoon of June 27th, and was at once carried into effect. Dorr sending letters to Providence at once for publication, announcing the fact of disbandment and immediately leaving the state to escape arrest. This ended the Dorr War. Only one man lost his life, a Massachusetts man on Massachusetts soil, who was accidentally killed by a musket ball fired across a bridge. But the aftermath. On June 1824, Governor King offered a reward of $4,000 for Dorr's apprehension, but the latter remained in New Hampshire under the protection of a friendly governor who refused to honor a requisition for his extradition. In August, Dorr issued an address to the people of Rhode Island reviewing the whole controversy and the reasons for his course in announcing his intention of returning to the state, which he did a few days later and was at once arrested for treason and kept in jail in Providence until February 1844, when he was taken to Newport for trial there. Dorr's offenses had all been committed in Providence County, and there he had many supporters. It would therefore be difficult to secure a jury in that county from which all persons of his way of thinking could be excluded, whereas in Newport County, Dorr had but few adherents. The so-called Algerine Law permitted such a trial in other than the county in which the offense was committed, and for this reason the trial came off in Newport. The court that tried Dorr consisted of the same three judges who had given their opinion against the legality of the Dorrite movement, and Judge Brayton, who had since been added to the court. 118 jurors were summoned and examined before 12 were obtained for the jury, but three of the 118 belonged to the Democratic Party, now considered the Door Party. There was not a single Dorite on the jury. There were four counts in the indictment, two for acts of treason at Providence and two for acts of treason at Gloucester. In opening the defense, Door's counsel made five points. One, that treason cannot be committed against a state, but only against the United States. 2. That the Act of March 1842, the Algerine Law, was unconstitutional and void as destructive of the common law of trial by jury, which was a fundamental part of the English Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, and had ever since been fundamental law in Rhode Island. 3. 
that that act, if constitutional, gave the court no jurisdiction to try the indictment in the county of Newport, all the overt acts being therein charged as committed in the county of Providence. 4. That the defendant acted justifiably as governor of the state under a valid constitution rightfully adopted, which he was sworn to support. 5 that the evidence did not support the charge of treasonable and criminal intent in the defendant. The court easily decided that treason can be committed against a state as well as against the United States after full argument with elaborate citation of authorities by defendant and his counsel, and so it did as to the second, for Dorr had always maintained that the General Assembly had superior power, and this was the reason why he wanted a constitution. In support of the fourth point, Dorr offered evidence to prove that a large majority of the whole male adult population of the state, citizens of the United States, had voted for the People's Constitution in December 1841, and that under the Constitution he had been elected governor. He offered to produce the ballots themselves and the men who cast them, but the evidence was refused by the court. Chief Justice Durfee saying to the jury, quote, Courts and juries, gentlemen, do not count votes to determine whether a constitution has been adopted or a governor elected or not. Courts take notice without proof offered from the bar what the constitution is or was and who is or was the governor of their own state. It belongs to the legislature to exercise this high duty. End quote. The result was a foregone conclusion. Upon the evidence, the admissions made by the defendant, the exclusion of the testimony of the defendant above described, and with the jury made up as it was exclusively of anti Dorites, notwithstanding the able and eloquent address made by Dor, there could be but one result. The jury agreed at once upon a verdict of guilty. The exceptions made by this counsel were overruled, and the unseemly severe sentence of imprisonment for life was pronounced by the Chief Justice. Dorr was at once removed to the state prison at Providence, but the result of the severity of the sentence was that soon a reaction set in, and expressions of sympathy for the martyr governor flowed in from all sides, and in a very short time the General Assembly passed an act releasing him on his taking an oath of allegiance to the state. Dorr declined to take the oath required, declaring that to do so would be a recognition on his part that he had hitherto failed in allegiance, and this he could not admit. The agitation for his unconditional release increased, and the subject became the leading political issue in the state, and the following spring, the liberation candidate for governor, Charles Jackson, was elected, and the liberationists had a majority in the General Assembly. Dorr was released unconditionally under an act of the General Assembly in June 1845, having remained in prison one year. He came out a disappointed, broken-hearted man, but with resolution undaunted, although a physical wreck, his rheumatic affection having increased by the dampness of his stone cell in prison, and with some obscure affection of the stomach that kept him an invalid at home during the nine remaining years of his life. The sympathy excited by his condition, with a sense of the recognition of the value of Dorr's work as a political reformer, led to the passage, shortly before Dorr's death, of an extraordinary act of the General Assembly, wiping out all of the judicial proceedings against him. This act was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. But to the dying man, says Mr. Eaton, in his admirable essay on Thomas Wilson Dorr and the Dorr War, quote, this attempted annulment of the decree against him brought small comfort. Upon his conviction, he had appealed to the people of our state and our country. The appeal was not in vain. 
As the animosities of the conflict fade away from sight, we appreciate, in spite of the mistakes in judgment that he sometimes made, that high upon the roll of Rhode Island's great men will stand forever the name of the political reformer and public benefactor, Thomas Wilson Dorr. End quote. The Trial In the Supreme Court of Rhode Island, Newport, April 1844, Honorable Job Durfee, Chief Justice, Honorable Levi Hale, Honorable William R. Staples, Honorable George A. Brayton, all associate justices. On October 31, 1843, Mr. Dorr, who was a fugitive from justice, returned to Rhode Island and was immediately arrested and conducted to prison on a charge of treason against the state on an indictment against him then pending in the county of Newport. On February 29, 1844, Mr. Dorr was brought before the Supreme Court at Newport and being called upon to plead contended that the law of the state styled the Algerine Law, which authorized the finding of an indictment out of the county in which the offense is charged to have been committed was unconstitutional. He subsequently withdrew this plea, pleaded not guilty, and then moved the court to transfer the indictment to Providence County, where the defendant and his witnesses resided, as the defendant was constitutionally entitled to, quote, a speedy trial by an impartial jury. End quote. Neither of which could be obtained here. The court refused the request and set the trial for April 26th. End of section 2. Section 3 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rutger. American State Trials, Volume 2, by John D. Lawson. The Trial of Thomas Wilson Dorr for Treason, Rhode Island, 1844, Part 2. April 26. The whole court being present, the defendant was arraigned and pleaded not guilty. Joseph M. Blake, Attorney General, and Alfred Bosworth for the state. The defendant per se, George Turner and Walter S. Burgess for the defense. Mr. Turner stated to the court that both the defendant and himself had to regret the absence of Honorable Samuel Y. Atwell, the principal counsel who was detained at home by a severe, if not dangerous, indisposition but the defendant would not ask for delay on this account. The attorney general proposed to the court several questions to be put to jurors, as they should be severally examined, touching their competency to sit in the case. 1. Have you attended to the reading of the indictment of the state against Thomas W. Dorr, the prisoner at the bar? 2. Have you formed or expressed the opinion that the said Thomas W. Dorr is guilty, or the opinion that he is not guilty of the crime in said indictment? 3. Did you vote for the said Thomas W. Dorr for governor at the election on the 18th of April, 1844? 4. Have you formed the opinion, or do you believe that the said Thomas W. Dorr was the governor of the state? or authorized to exercise the duties of governor at any time between the 16th day of May, 1842, and the 28th day of June, 1842. 5. Are you a relation of the said Thomas W. Dorr? 6. Are you a freeholder in the county of Newport? Defendant objected to the third and fourth questions as unreasonable and improper. The Attorney General contended that if these questions were not put, jurors who had taken part with the prisoner and approved his proceedings would sit to try him. If they voted for him or believed him to have been governor of the state, they had prejudged his case and, of course, would hold him justifiable against the charge in the indictment. If Mr. Dorr was governor, then he had a right to do all that he did, 
and those persons who believe that he was are certainly incompetent to try him. Mr. Dorr said that although, as had been remarked, this was a novel case, novel and unusual expedients ought not to be resorted to to procure conviction. It was impossible to doubt the purport and tendency of these questions. They were aimed at all persons belonging to one of the political parties in the state, the party with which the defendant was connected. All such were to be excluded from the jury, and all of another description were to be admitted without any such test as had been proposed. This would ensure to him not the impartial jury guaranteed to him as of common right, but a partial jury of political opponents, and would work the most flagrant injustice. These questions were involved in the second question, or rather that question involved all that could be properly asked of the opinion of the jurors. If the reply was that the juror had neither formed nor expressed an opinion concerning the guilt or innocence of the prisoner, he had qualified himself, and it was improper to go behind the oath he had taken to extort from him other answers, when the first covered the whole ground upon which it was competent to examine him. To go farther than this was to invade the right of the juror himself, to question his veracity, and virtually to charge him with perjury. If he had told the truth in his answer, he was competent. How far could an investigation of this kind be carried? Where was it to stop? A great variety of opinions upon political questions involved in this case had been entertained, and different opinions by the same individuals at different times. Some were still for the old charter, some for one constitution, some for another. Some had voted for the defendant and believed he was duly elected and qualified as governor who afterwards went over to the opposite party and contradicted their former assertions and acts. If these questions were to be put, then many others might be asked with the same propriety. The oath of the juryman to his impartiality would be nugatory, and an inquisitorial process would be devised such as had never been heard of in a court of justice. If the juror answered that he voted for the defendant as governor and considered him to be governor between the times named, then it would be necessary to ask him if he still remained of the same opinion, and, if not, when and how he changed his mind. There is no end to this sort of inquisition. Then again, look on the other side of the question. If a person who says he believed the defendant to be governor be unfit to be a juror because of partiality, how much more fit and less partial is he who says he believes the defendant not to have been governor and has thereby closed his mind against all the evidence of justification that the defendant may offer? The difficulty is in the case itself. It is a political question, and all persons have conversed about it and canvassed it more or less. If a fair trial be intended, the jury must not be selected from the political opponents of the defendant. He cannot ask the prosecutor to put an entire list of defendant's political friends in the box, and he has a right to protest against the exclusive selection of his political enemies. A jury at large without selection will be the nearest approach to fairness. A fair trial is inconsistent with such a procedure as that suggested, and with any other tending to the same result. No man can mistake the political meaning of the questions which it is now proposed to ask. The court after deliberation, were equally divided upon the motion of the Attorney General, and the question was overruled. Chief Justice Durfee and Judge Hale were in favor of putting the questions, and Judges Brayton and Staples in the negative. The prisoner on being asked the usual questions by whom he would be tried replied by an impartial jury. The indictment was then read again. Footnote. 
the grand jurors of the state of Rhode Island and Providence Plantation, and in and for the body of the county of Newport, upon their oaths present that Thomas Wilson Dorr of the city of Providence in the county of Providence, attorney and counselor at law, being an inhabitant of and residing within the said state of Rhode Island and Providence plantations, and being under the protection of the laws of the said state of Rhode Island and Providence plantations, and owing allegiance and fidelity to the said state, not weighing the duty of his said allegiances, and wickedly and traitorously devising and intending the peace of the said state of Rhode Island and Providence plantations to disturb and stir up, move and excite insurrection, rebellion, and war against the said state on the 17th day of May in the year of our Lord, 1842, at the city of Providence aforesaid, in the aforesaid county of Providence, with force and arms unlawfully, falsely, maliciously, and traitorously did conspire, compass, imagine, and intend to raise and levy war, insurrection, and rebellion against the said state. And in order to perfect fulfill and bring to effect the said compassings, imaginations, and intents of him, the said Thomas Wilson Dorr, he, the said Thomas Wilson Dorr, afterwards to wit, on the said seventeenth day of May, in the year of our Lord, 1842, at the city of Providence aforesaid, in the aforesaid county of Providence, with a great multitude of persons, whose names are at present to the jurors aforesaid unknown, to a great number, to wit, the number of three hundred persons and upwards, armed and arrayed in a warlike manner, that is to say, with guns, muskets, swords, pistols, dirks, and other warlike weapons, as well offensive as defensive, being and gathered together, did falsely and traitorously assemble and gather themselves together against the said state, and then and there, with force and arms, did falsely and traitorously and in a warlike hostile manner array and dispose themselves against the said state of Rhode Island and Providence plantations, and then and there, that is to say, on the day and year aforesaid, at the city of Providence aforesaid, in the aforesaid county of Providence, within the said state, in pursuance of their traitorous intentions and purposes aforesaid he, the said Thomas Wilson Dorr, with the said persons so as aforesaid, traitorously assembled and armed and arrayed in a manner aforesaid, most wickedly, maliciously, and traitorously did ordain, prepare, and levy war against the state of Rhode Island and Providence plantations, contrary to the duty of his said allegiance and fidelity, against the form of the statute in such case made and provided, and against the peace and dignity of the state. End footnote. The regular drawn jury for the term consisted of sixteen. Sixty, in addition, were selected and summoned upon a veneer by the sheriff, previous to the commencement of the term. Of the 119 juries summoned, 83 were set aside by the court in consequence of their answers that they had formed and expressed an opinion of guilt or innocence of the prisoner, or upon proof by witnesses to the same effect. Only one person was set aside on proof by a witness for the government that he had formed and expressed an opinion. Several were set aside on proof produced by the defendant. April 29th. The selection of the jury was completed today, the following being selected. Benjamin Carr of Tiverton, Asa Duvall, Ditto, William L. Melville, Jr. of Newport, William Card, Ditto, Jonathan Cogscall, Jr. of Portsmouth, David Seabury of Tiverton, Benjamin Corey, Ditto, Charles W. Holland of Little Compton, Borden Chase of Portsmouth, Joseph Paddock, Jr. of Newport, Richard C. Norman, Ditto, 
William D. Southwick Ditto. Mr. Bosworth to the jury. The crime charged was happily a novel one. A terrible oppression had been occasioned by trials for treason when carried on by the king and government in England, and this had been the occasion of the crime being restricted here to those odious and atrocious acts which stab maliciously and wickedly at the life of the state. The prosecutors could have no feelings which would lead them to desire a conviction in this case. The jury were fortunately relieved from the duty of ascertaining the law. The court will instruct them in the law, and they will apply it to the facts. The violation of high duties is treason. By the statute against treason, two witnesses are required to each overt act. Levying war was an unlawful assembling in warlike array, with treasonable purposes, and with ability to commit the act, appearing at the head of armed men, and advising them to act is a levying war. Dispersion without any actual engagement does not take away the character of treason. Maneuvering in the face of the government is enough. There are four counts in the indictment. Two charge the acts done at Providence on the 17th and 18th of May, 1842, and two of those done at Gloucester on the 25th and 27th of June. Mr. Bosworth asked the court whether the prosecution may prove the intention of the accused before the proof of the overt acts of treason. The court, upon the authority of Chief Justice Marshall in Burr's trial, decided that the prosecutors might proceed in the order they pleased. Chief Justice Durfee said that the intention may well be proved first. Quote, for the law does not presume that a man at the head of armed men is committing treason. April 30th, Witnesses for the Prosecution Jeremiah Briggs was present at the meeting of an assembly at the Foundry on 3rd of May, 1842, saw the officer sworn, saw Mr. Dorr hold up his hand and take the oath of office. The oath was taken by the representatives, senators, clerks, and the state officers, excepting the general treasurer. Mr. Dorr took an oath to support the Constitution of the state and of the United States as governor saw a large procession formed on Christian Hill. The General Assembly and the Governor were attended by about 150 men, crossed over from the hill to the house where they were to meet, was there the whole time, and heard Mr. Dorr deliver his address as Governor. It was very long. The Assembly passed acts to renew the charters of several of the military companies. They also elected military officers and passed several resolutions. They also amended some laws passed by the General Assembly and some time previous. Recollect in particular the Riot Act. Some of them seemed to think that the foundry was not a fit place to sit in, as it rained through and some drops fell on the speaker's head. They requested the sheriff, Burrington Anthony, to obtain the courthouse for their session the next morning. Witness passed in with the procession. They went in uncovered through files of soldiers. Cross-examined. Heard Mr. Dorr deliver his address from a printed paper. There was nothing unusual in it for such an address. Never heard one delivered before, heard nothing in it about using force. The procession was like others I have seen since, have seen better-looking men. William Burrow saw Mr. Dorr at the foundry acting as governor of the state, saw the procession form. It was composed of men armed and unarmed, saw Mr. Dorr take the oath in the common form. Military guards were stationed about the building for some time, the General Assembly passed acts and appointed military officers. They appointed a committee to call on the Secretary of State to take possession of the papers of his office, also a committee to take possession of the public funds. 
Mr. Anthony, the sheriff, was authorized to prepare the courthouse for the use of the assembly. They abolished the laws respecting offenses against the state, called the Algerine Laws. They appointed civil officers and continued the courts. They appointed a speaker and clerks and altered the law respecting riots, saw a guard at Anthony's house on the 18th of May. There were several cannon there and some companies of armed men supposed they were there to protect Mr. Dorr. Cross-examined. There were armed men in the procession on the 3rd of May. Some had clubs or canes. They were not ordinary walking sticks. Some of them were as large as my arm. The committee spoken of to take possession of the public funds were to demand them after a new treasurer was sworn. There was nothing warlike or riotous in the proceedings of the assembly. Do not recollect hearing any forcible measures proposed. B. Anthony was authorized to go and demand the keys of the state house, and if he obtained them, to prepare it for their use. Nothing was said about what he was to do if he did not get the keys. Saw no difference from other legislatures in the mode of conducting the business. One man there seemed to know more about business than the rest and told them what to do. Others did not seem to understand the manner of doing business. Never saw anything just like it elsewhere. Levi Salisbury saw Mr. Dorr at the foundry. The assembly was held there for the purpose of organizing the new government, and they took the necessary steps for that purpose. Was not present when Mr. Dorr took the oath of office as governor, heard him deliver his message. He was standing on the platform at the end of the building. Don't recollect seeing him before he came in. The procession was decent, well-dressed, and orderly. The armed men had guns or swords. The General Assembly passed acts and resolutions and appointed officers chiefly military. Do not recollect the appointment of any but military officers, excepting those necessary to organize the two houses. Committees were appointed to inspect the public offices and to transfer to the new officers the books, property, and papers. A resolution was passed directing the new treasurer to receive a receipt for the funds. Do not recollect hearing Mr. Dorr propose to take possession of the public property by force or any other person in his presence. Was not at B. Anthony's house on the night of the attack on the arsenal. Know of it only by report. Do not recollect of hearing Mr. Dorr say anything about attacking the arsenal. Cross-examined. Believe the General Assembly passed a resolution authorizing the governor to demand and require the surrender of the public property to the new officers of the state. The organization of the government was conducted in every respect in an orderly manner. There was nothing unusual except that both houses met in one room, saw no dictation of any one person over the rest. There was by talk and conversation among the members of the legislature, as in other public bodies. Resolution was passed in the House requesting the sheriff to prepare the courthouse for the use of the assembly. Do not recollect that anything was said of any alternative if the House should be refused to him. Saw nothing unusual in the procession. Did not see any of the procession carrying large sticks or clubs. Witness hesitated in replying to a question from the Attorney General whether he knew that it was Mr. Dorr's wish to take possession by force on the 3rd of May 1842 on the ground that he might subject himself to prosecution for misprison of treason if he stated he had such knowledge and gave no information of it. The Attorney General said it would be such an offense to refuse to testify what he knew of such a desire or intention on the part of the defendant. Mr. Dorr said he hoped Mr. Salisbury would not withhold anything he knew on his account. 
the court said that the witness was not asked whether he divulged or concealed at the time his knowledge of Mr. Doar's intentions, but now generally what he knew on the subject and that he must answer the question asked of him. Mr. Salisbury certainly understood at the time that it was the wish of Mr. Doar to take possession of the state house and of other property, understood Mr. Doar was for vigorous measures. There was some discussion in the house on the subject, but it was dropped informally. There was a division of opinion in the house upon taking such a step. The resolution that was passed requesting the sheriff to prepare the state house for the sitting of the assembly did not authorize or imply the use of force. William H. Smith was at the foundry at the meeting of the General Assembly, heard Mr. Dorr deliver his inaugural message. Think Mr. Dorr took the oath, but do not positively recollect. The procession was formed near the Hoyle Tavern. Mr. Dorr was near the head of it. Some were armed, others not. Persons with arms walked by the side of the members of the assembly, also by Mr. Dorr. The assembly elected military officers. Do not know that Mr. Dorr signed any military commissions to officers then appointed, or that such commissions were issued, or of Mr. Dorr's procuring a seal of the state. I have seen commissions with Mr. Dorr's signature to them, but do not know that they were issued to the persons named in them heard Mr. Dorr say that he was elected to the place of chief magistrate and was bound to perform the duties of his office. Have the impression that Mr. Dorr said it would have been better to go at once to the state house and take possession of it. Know that it was Mr. Dorr's desire to take possession of the state house at all events. Did not know at the time that force must necessarily be used. There were different opinions as to the necessity of force to accomplish the object. Cross-examined. A resolution passed the assembly requiring all persons in possession of any state property or papers to transfer the same to the newly elected officers, and the governor was authorized to carry this into effect. State officers, senators, and representatives were elected. A committee was appointed to count the votes. The votes were counted and the result was declared to the assembly. There were about 7,000 votes given in. There were few, if any, against Mr. Dorr. Do not know that any other governor of the state was ever elected by an equal majority. Mr. Dorr made no proposition hostile to the true interests of the state. He acted as governor of the state, never knew of his acting otherwise than from a high sense of duty. He was treated by the assembly and those associated with him as governor. Do not know where the votes given in for defendant as governor now are, or where the votes are at present, which were given for the people's constitution under which Mr. Dorr acted. Roger W. Potter was sheriff of Providence County in May 1842, saw defendant at the assembly held at the foundry. He was called the governor of the state. The day after the assembly adjourned, a warrant was placed in my hands against Dorr and another against William H. Smith as secretary of state. Mr. Dorr was not to be found. Saw him again on the 16th of May, the day he returned from New York. He was in a carriage surrounded by a guard of armed men. Cross-examined. It did not go out of the middle of the city to look for Dorr, was first directed to go to Burrington Anthony's house for Dorr, but after dinner was directed not to go there, but to arrest Dorr if I should find him down street in the city. Did not know what might be considered his place of residence, as he had removed from his former home to the Franklin house, and afterwards left that house did not know that his residence was at B. Anthony's, did not inquire for him there, was told he might be found at the printing office of the Herald or Express. Duty J. Pierce, 
do not know what day Mr. Doar left the state for New York after the adjournment of the People's Legislature. I left on Saturday and met Mr. Doar in Philadelphia on Monday. We proceeded to Washington, left him in New York when I returned from that place. Knew Mr. Doar intended to return to Rhode Island, but nothing respecting his intention to maintain himself as governor and to take possession of the public property by force. Mr. Doar did not communicate with me on the subject. The proposition to take possession of the public property was made at the time of the sitting of the legislature, but did not hear defendant make it. I took ground against the proposition and opposed it. During the session of the legislature at the foundry, there was a meeting of several persons at B. Anthony's house, and the subject of taking possession by force of the public property was talked over. Several persons were in favor of it. Do not recollect that Mr. Doar expressed an opinion. During this absence of defendant, heard him speak of bringing a force to the state to resist the force which might be brought by the general government in aid of the charter government. Defendant never spoke of wanting or using any force from abroad except in the contingency of an interference from abroad by the U.S. troops. He did not say how many men would be wanted in such an event. His object was to prevent an interference on the part of the general government. Was informed after I left Washington that defendant saw the president. Mr. Doar stated to me afterward at Chapachet that he'd considered himself the lawful governor of the state and that he had as good a right to use force to defend the government as any other officer had to overthrow it. Did not hear him hold out any inducement to anyone to stand by him. He certainly did not to me. Cross-examined. Did not hear Mr. Doar say that he wished to take forcible possession of the State House. Had no doubt of Mr. Doar's intention to take possession of the State House. William P. Blodgett. Saw Doar in the procession on the 16th of May. Followed the procession to Federal Hill near B. Anthony's house. He addressed the multitude, do not recollect whether from a carriage or a platform. He said it was false, as he had been accused, that he should have the aid of 500 men from abroad that he had asked for. He expected 5,000 when they were wanted. He drew his sword and said that it had been dipped in blood once, and before he should yield up the rights of the people of Rhode Island, it should be buried in gore to the hilt. Dor was surrounded by between 300 or 400 armed men in the procession and a concourse of unarmed. Witness never heard such a yell as when the defendant announced his determination. They applauded him with the yell of fiends, was told it was not safe for me to remain there, was not much frightened. The men about door were more like desperados than men. They only wanted a leader to do anything. Gave information of these proceedings to the governor and the council. The cannon of the artillery company were taken by Doar's men on the afternoon of Tuesday, the 17th of May. The detachment came down about four o'clock. No authorized person was present to defend them. Tried with some friends to prevent carrying off of the guns in case the order should arrive from the governor in time. They did not arrive and the guns were carried off. The officer in command of the detachment said the muskets of his men were loaded, so also did one of the company. The troops from the rest of the state were ordered up and came during the night of the 17th and in the morning of the 18th, was not at the arsenal, but was ordered to await the arrival of the troops. In the morning, the column of about 550 men marched up Federal Hill under the command of Colonel William Blodgett. Marched beside the commander, someone came and told them for God's sake to stop, as they would be fired upon. Companies were then deployed to the right and left, and the cannon of the Newport artillery were unlimbered in front. 
The hostile guns were then withdrawn some distance. The numbers around them decreased very rapidly when the troops came up to 40 or 50. The cannon were said to be loaded with round shot and slug iron. After a time, B. Anthony promised that the guns should be returned at four o'clock in the afternoon if the troops were withdrawn. Anthony said the men were drunk and could not be influenced by him. The troops were consequently withdrawn. Cross-examined. Did not see on what door stood when he made his speech. The shout was more like an infernal yell than anything else. To understand it, one must have seen Dorr's countenance when he made the speech. It accorded with the whole scene. Dorr did not make any explanation as to the use of the 5,000 upon the interference of Tyler. His name was not mentioned. Did not derive the story of the sword from a newspaper. Have not said that I came here to get Mr. Dorr convicted or to that effect, have said that I should say here all I could against Mr. Dorr. Edward H. Hazard saw the procession of the 16th of May. Information was received by the authorities that Dorr was in Stonington, and an armed force of his friends went to Stonington to escort him up. A proposition was made to the governor to arrest Dorr at Kingston Depot, but it was not accepted. Went down to the depot of the Stonington Railway on Monday morning and saw Dorr arrive. There were probably about 1,400 men in the procession. Went with Colonel Blodgett afterwards to Federal Hill. Heard Mr. Dorr say that the sword had been dyed in blood and should use it again in the same way in defense of the rights of the people of the state. Dorr also requested the military officers to meet him at Anthony's, saw the men at the breastwork after they had fallen back from Anthony's house. The wolf was to take charge of them, and if they could hold out a short time, Dorr was to return. Cross-examined. Dorr spoke boldly and candidly. Think he may have said that the 5,000 men who were to come from New York were to stand against Tyler. Do not distinctly recollect, did not derive the story about the sword from a newspaper. Henry S. Hazard was in Providence on the 17th and 18th of May, saw Dorr on the 16th of May when he came from Stonington, saw the procession first going to the bridge, didn't follow it, saw a large collection at B. Anthony's house on the 17th of May. Many were the same as those who were in the procession. There were 300 or 400 up there when I went up. They were in companies. Their arms were stacked, and guards were stationed round them. On the night of the 17th, about 12 or 1 o'clock, her cannon fired, rode up on horseback over Federal Hill, saw the men in line, rode along the line, and over to the arsenal, told Colonel Blodgett that they were coming. He said he was ready for them, rode back and heard them asking one another in line whether they were going to the arsenal. Some said they were, some said they were not. Then rode to the light infantry armory and told Colonel Brown there were four or five hundred men, but not all under arms. The cannon were in the road. They appeared ready for service. Cross-examined. Should think there were a rising 400 men with arms. There was a very heavy fog that night. Rode along the line from one end to the other. Couldn't see more than half the length. They were standing in line, not in the best of discipline. Think they were mostly in double line. Stopped a little from the farther end of them. Went there on purpose to see how many there were. Didn't see Dorr that night. Had said I hoped justice would be done to Dorr, and was anxious to have him arrested. Had no hard feelings against Mr. Dorr. Joseph S. Pittman Heard on the 15th of May that Mr. Dorr had requested an armed force to meet him at Stonington. The next day saw him escorted through the streets of Providence. Henry S. Hazard recalled, As we marched up, the cannon of the insurgents was planted opposite Anthony's house, 
pointed down the hill. We marched up until we could see into the muzzles of the guns, and then halted. The insurgents then withdrew their cannon, and many of them dispersed. Should think that when they posted their cannon again, not more than forty or fifty remained. Saw a man swinging a torch as if to apply it to the cannons. Someone took hold of him and prevented it. Orson Moffat saw a door in Providence on 16th and 17th of May. Saw him marching through the streets on the 16th. On the 17th, an armed force came down from B. Anthony's house to seize the cannon of the artillery company. Saw them take the guns and carry them away. They said their muskets were loaded. Saw a door on the 16th draw his sword, and something was said about a sword dyed in blood. Could not hear exactly what else he said. Went to Warren on the 17th at night to bring up the troops. Came back and went through the city the rest of the night. Went into Doors lines. Heard him give the order to fire. Saw one gun flash and then heard Mr. Door himself call for the torch. Saw the other gun flash. Saw him holding the torch. Could see him plainly when the gun flashed. Was near enough to him to have touched him easily. The cannon was near the arsenal. Pointed at it. When he found the gun only flashed, he said he was betrayed. He appeared to be commanding, heard him give no other orders than the one to fire. It was obeyed instantly. There was no guard on the plain when I was there. Saw a number of men about. They generally started to go off, and I left soon after the gun was flashed. About 12 o'clock that night, I was fired into going down Carpenter Street. Was challenged first, did not stop, and the musket was fired was leaning down and looking out of the carriage, else I should have been hit. End of section three. Section four of American State Trials, volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. American State Trials, Volume 2, by John D. Lawson. Trial of Thomas Wilson Dorr for Treason, Rhode Island, 1844, Part 3. Cross-examined. Saw Dorr draw his sword on the 16th. Could not exactly hear what he said. Saw Dorr on the night of the 17th. Am certain that he applied the torch to the cannon. Knew him by the voice at first, and then by sight. Could not say anything about the dress of Mr. Dorr, whether he had a hat or a cap, or what sort of a belt, or what was the position of the guns, or who were near, or standing around, or who flashed the first gun. Was in the midst of the men about the guns. George O. Byrne, a person who was following the march to the arsenal, told me there were three or four hundred under arms, and that others were to be armed with the guns that might be taken. They were then to march toward the city. The cannon were placed near the great tree. Thought the men in the arsenal could reach those around the cannon on the field with muskets. One of the insurgents told me there were 1,000 men without arms who were to be furnished from the arsenal. May 1st, Roger W. Potter, recalled, went on Federal Hill on the morning of the 18th of May while insurgents were there, was called upon in the morning to go to the council chamber. A warrant was put into my possession against Thomas W. Dorr, went up with the governor to Federal Hill. We missed the troops who had started before us. When we got there, John S. Harris was addressing the crowd, went in and inquired for Dorr. B. Anthony pledged his honor that Dorr had been gone some time. A call for the governor to come to the window arose. Governor King then said that the sheriff was in the house with a warrant for Dorr. They cried out, no, no, shoot him, shoot him. 
Governor King then retreated from the window. I went to the window. They cried out, shoot him. A man leveled a gun at my head. We looked at each other a moment, and the man lowered his musket. At Burrington Anthony's request, I called to the crowd not to fire into the house. The cry then arose that the landholders were coming. William Dean gave the information, and the men rushed away from the house and the cannon. Went out to the cannon. A man named Gould was flourishing a lighted port match above one of them, which was pointed directly at the troops coming up the hill. Carter said that he should stand by the guns till he was shot down. Gould said that the cannon were loaded with round shot and scrap iron. When we first went up there was a line of men with muskets before the house, perhaps a hundred. There were armed men in the house, on the stairs and above. When the troops came up, there was a great rush of both armed and unarmed men from about the house. One man cried out, where the hell are you going? A pretty soldier to be running away. Hiram Chapel was in the procession which escorted Dorr from the Stonington Depot. They were under arms. Don't know that the muskets were loaded. The men had ammunition. Remained at and about the house of Burrington Anthony till they went to the arsenal. Isaac Allen had command of the troops at Burrington Anthony's house. He said at the time that he was appointed major by Dorr and received his orders from him. No of ammunition being purchased for the purpose of going to the arsenal. Dorr gave me money to buy powder and flannel, $25. Dorr went with the troops to the arsenal. I did not go on the field. All the troops left the field about daybreak. Went back with Dorr in the same squad. He said nothing about disbanding his troops or going away. Did not know that Mr. Dorr had left till eight or nine o'clock. Drew the charges of the guns in the morning with Carter. Found first a bag of slugs, then a ball, then a cartridge, then another ball, then another cartridge. The last cartridge was fired off and the guns reloaded. They were loaded with ball and bags of slugs when the troops came up. Went to Chepachet on the 24th of June. Saw men under arms, about 250 or 300, and in the morning saw a breastwork thrown up. Isaac Allen had command of them. Afterwards they chose the wolf commander. Saturday door came with an escort and stayed there till Monday night. About dark a letter was read on the hill ordering the troops to disperse and go home peaceably. There were 25 or 30 of the Spartan band who were said to come from New York. They were armed with muskets. They were out on scouts most of the time. The wolf was chosen by the officers. There was a pike company there, a picked-up company. There was a large quantity of scrap iron for the cannon and three boxes of balls. Looked as if they came from some fort. One of the cannon came from Olneyville called the Governor King. A rumor rose at one time that the Algerines were coming, and Major Allen made a fuss and called up the wound socket artillery to stand with match ropes lighted by the guns. Allen said that if the Algerines did not come up, then they would go into town on Wednesday. The Wolf and Allen took their orders from Dorr. They so reported, and Dorr directed the troops to obey them. Dorr's order was that no stranger should be admitted on the hill. The report was there that men were coming from New York, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. Also that Mike Walsh had written to New York for the rest of his band. The muskets were said to have arrived at Norwich and were then in boxes on the wharf, as the railroad directors would not let them be brought over. The troops were encouraged by these reports. Know that arms and ammunition were obtained and secreted after the Federal Hill affair for the Chepachet gathering. Had some in my own house. Knew of the expedition to Warren as the men came to my house for arms. Knew that they wished to go and get arms from the wharf of Messrs. Brown and Ives. At Chepachet, guards were set. 
countersigns had, and one prisoner was taken heard from Captain Bradley that he had surrounded Sprague's house with his company to find if Dorr was there, ascertained that he went away about a half an hour after the letter was read upon the hill, knew that half an hour previous that Mr. Dorr was going to leave. Dorr came on the hill soon after he got there, and also on Monday, heard that Dorr's father had been there Monday. When the letter was read upon the hill, the troops dispersed in great confusion, like a flock of sheep with dogs after them. Know that arms were purchased in other states for the use of the troops at Chepachet. Tents were there which came from Massachusetts. Two men there told him that they were stolen. Thor went off from Federal Hill before the governor and sheriff came up didn't leave till after it was purported to me that the troops were coming. Cross-examined. There were 250 or 300 men armed at Chapache. They were going and coming continually. They were not permitted to go or come freely from the hill. No one could go from the hill except by permission of the sergeant of the guard. An expedition went out after arms on Saturday, heard there was a council of officers before the order to disband was given. The balls for the artillery that were there were put up in boxes, as they are kept in forts and armories, had information of Allen that aid was coming from New York, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. On Monday night, it was rumored that the state troops were encamped at Situate, did not hear at the time we left that any state troops were marching from Greenville. Stated before the commissioners upon my examination that I plugged the cannon at Federal Hill, before they went to the arsenal, did plug the cannon with short pine plugs. This was done about eleven o'clock in the night. Didn't tell anyone of it then. Should have been very foolish to have done so went out with the pieces and halted there till morning, was present when the charges were withdrawn from the guns the next morning. The pine plugs were jammed through. By the 250 or 300 men in arms in Chapachet mean only those who were on the hill. There were men armed and unarmed in the village. There were guards in the barracks, as they were called, at the upper end of the village and at Sprague's Tavern. The men around street went where they pleased, except when the companies marched. The object of the assemblage in arms at Chapachet and at Federal Hill was to take possession of the state. Was an officer, but without a commission. Did not tell anyone, after examination by the commissioners, that my story to them about plugging the guns was false, and was related to them to gain favor. Jonathan M. Wheeler was in Providence on the 16th, 17th, and 18th days of May. Men were under arms in the escort. Dorr delivered an address on Federal Hill, was on the hill afternoon of the 17th, didn't know that the cannon were taken till evening, was on the hill the night of the 17th, saw Mr. Dorr there once on the ground at the arsenal. The troops were around him, stayed there till 2 o'clock, and then went away. Don't know what the troops did. Think I heard Dorr say that if he was legal governor, he had a right to take possession of the public property and was bound to do it. Understood the intention was to take the arsenal that night. Saw the guns flash. Was not near enough to see how they were pointed. Understood the guns were brought on the field to take the arsenal. Think the men in the field were under the command of Thomas W. Dorr. General Leonard Blodgett was appointed to command the arsenal in Providence by Colonel Samuel Ames, Quartermaster General, and by the approval of Governor King, commanded the arsenal on the night of the 17th and on the 18th of May, 1842. On the night of the 17th, an attack was expected. Somewhere from one to two o'clock in the night, a sentinel came and informed me that there was a flag of truce at the door went downstairs to the door and saw two men with a flag. One of them demanded the surrender of the arsenal. I asked him in whose name. He replied in the name of Colonel Wheeler, adding in an undertone, and of Governor Dorr. 
said I knew no such persons by those titles, and should not surrender but defend my post. They then said that he or they would come and take it. Replied very well, then come and take it. The bearer of the message then answered that Dorr had a large force with him, understood that the demand was made by Colonel Wheeler in the name of Governor Dorr, was informed that there would be an attack just before the men came on the ground went out once and heard their voices. There appeared to be a large number, but saw them indistinctly. The arsenal and the arms in it were state property. The quartermaster general supplied the provisions and ammunition. From thirty to fifty men were enlisted by me for the defense of the arsenal. Governor King came into the arsenal from ten to twelve o'clock on the night of the seventeenth and went away again. Two companies marched into the building from the city to assist in the defense. The cadets and marine artillery, numbering about 75 men each. A number of citizens were also present, making about 200 in all who were in the arsenal that night. Did not see the flash of guns before the arsenal. Cross-examined. Do not recollect that Orson Moffat made any report to me of proceedings that night. Do not recollect seeing Moffat. Sent out Mr. Bark and Colonel Pittman as scouts. Know nothing in particular of the movements of Mr. Dorr on the outside. Governor King remained but a short time at the arsenal. The building is of stone, two stories high, the walls 18 inches thick, the doors and windows of iron. The artillery pieces were placed in the lower story, five, six pounders. The doors toward the attacking party were to be opened, and the pieces were to be run out and fired. Nelson B. Aldrich saw Mr. Dorr on the plain before the arsenal on the night of the 17th of May, with the men who marched there. They had two pieces of cannon, saw the flash of a cannon, but was not near enough to see the direction in which they were pointed. The cannon were north of the arsenal. When Dorr passed, he was going along the line of a company, understood that the object was to take the arsenal, was at Chapachet, and saw Dorr once on the hill. Can't say whether he was armed. There were armed men there, and saw cannon, implements of war, and musical instruments. Saw door at Sprague's Tavern, the headquarters. He had a belt around him. Cannot say whether he had arms or not. Richard Knight. On Saturday, 25th of June, started from Providence for Chapachet about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Nothing strange took place till near Chapachet, past two young men from Chapachet going to Providence in a wagon. They turned and followed me. They could not overtake me. My horse got near the fort and became frightened and ran. Men ran down the hill and crossed his track. There were three blacks there. One of them had a gun. Guns were pointed at me, and one was fired. A black man told me the next day there was a ball in it. Several men ran along the hill and headed him off. The horse ran, but about five rods farther, and then stopped. The men asked where I was going, and I said I was going to Jeremiah Sheldon's. They told me to pass on. I stopped and asked for Mr. Sheldon. The two men then came up and stopped opposite. Sheldon was sent for and went into an inner room with me. Soon an armed man came to the door and said Captain Bradley wanted to see me at the door of the house, went out and saw a man with a sword, who said that Governor Dorr had sent to have me arrested and carried on the hill. The officer told two men to take hold one of each arm. They moved on three or four rods and halted. There were twenty-five or thirty men about who were ordered to fall in, and they then marched me on the hill. They carried me up to near where the marquee was. There was a gathering on the other side of the marquee, was taken up to the place, and saw Dorr in the circle. The salute of the officer was returned by Mr. Dorr. They took me into the ring, and the officer said to Dorr that he had taken a man and asked what should be done with him. Dorr said that depended on which side he was. 
the officer returned and said, I must go into the marquee and be examined by the officers, went in and saw a man with no hair on, who was called secretary. They asked me several questions, and the answers were noted down in a book. Understood the secretary was Seth Luther. Mr. Carter was present during the examination, was then marched over with 16 men to the guardhouse, was kept there that night and the next day, got permission to go to Colonel Aldrich's, who was colonel and commissary in that army. A great many men came in from the Thompson Road. On Sunday, there were from 600 to 1,000 men in the village, mostly without arms. They were said to be companies from places out of the state, some with drums, some without. The companies were marched up and down the street. Some of these companies said they were from one place at one time and another at another, saw pikes made in the blacksmith shop near the guardhouse. On Monday at two or three o'clock, Colonel Aldrich came and said I was released, but must stay till sunset and then go without giving any information that I was released. He said that Governor Dorr was going away, asked him to let him have an officer to go on the hill. Aldrich called a man whom he called the sergeant of the guard, and I went with him. Down round the tavern there were men that grabbed me, but the officer caused me to be let go, went up the hill and looked round. When I first went there on Saturday, Sheldon told me that the Algerines were deceived, that they could have 3,000 men and as much money as they wanted, went up on the hill and saw about 150 men under arms and probably 150 more standing around. On Monday, there were three or four hundred men under arms, half of them well armed. They pointed me out as the old Algerine. They were expecting some communication from the governor and were impatient. Someone said he had gone. Another said that it was a damned Algerine lie. They expected the communication to be to go and attack the column at Greenville or Situate. Saw door with a belt on. Cannot say whether he had any sword or pistols. The men said that they were going to take possession of the government of the state. Left the hill about seven o'clock. Went towards Providence and about two or three miles from Greenville was stopped by the other kind of troops. At least they looked differently. Cross-examined. Door was not present in the marquee when the man with no hair examined me. Experienced no ill treatment from Door or by his orders. Was released by order of Mr. Door. Door was not present at any time after I was taken into the marquee and never heard him say a single word. Bradley said that I was taken in the camp. Replied that I was taken in Sheldon's house. Carter said they were not going to have any Algerines coming there to contradict them. He would find that I had been taken in their camp, which would soon be the whole state of Rhode Island. Carter took up a bag apparently of bullets and said that those were the pills for the damned Algerines. Went to Chapachet upon the suggestion of a daughter of Mr. Sheldon. Had other business there. Thought I had as good a right to go there as anybody. Paid tolls and went on my own hook. Don't recollect of having seen any of the governor's council that day before starting. A great number of men there on Sunday were spectators. The companies marched up and down the street several times, saying they were from as many different places. The last company was a large one of 60 or 70 men. They hurrahed and said this is the first company of the 3,000 men from Hartford would be all there before the next night. Understood these movements of men pretending to be from different places were merely for show to produce an impression of their large numbers. Saw no men intoxicated on the hill. Everything was orderly there. But there were one or two near the tavern who appeared to be affected with liquor. Don't recollect that they were armed. Was insulted most at the guardhouse. Charles J. Shelley. On the night of 22nd of June, was hailed on the road to Chpachet and ordered to stop. Didn't stop. Drove on till near Sprague's Tavern and was again ordered to stop. 
drove on till near the tavern when we saw a cannon on the bridge a short distance off. We then stopped and went into the tavern and asked someone to take care of the horse. Captain West, as they called him, took out a pistol and ordered me to sit down, saying that I had been at large long enough, did not see door or hear that he was there. There was a warlike assemblage at Chapachet, at Sprague's Tavern, and at the guardhouse. Should think there were a dozen or fifteen men. Mr. Dorr objected. The court decided that it was proper for the witness to state the object and intentions of the men collected there. Mr. Shelley, body of armed men were in Sprague's house. Newell stated to me that they were officers and soldiers of Governor Dorr. He was called General Newell, was taken prisoner by them, was retained in Sprague's bar room half an hour, then was taken over to the guardhouse, the building described by Mr. Knight, protested against being taken from the house of Mr. Sprague, Sprague said these men would take care of me, that I was a prisoner of war. They took me for an Algerine, a spy, a damned scoundrel. They stated that they were arrayed against the Algerine government, was searched, and was taken from the guardhouse, bound in the street, marched off towards the north, and finally reached Woonsocket. There were in a company from thirty to forty men armed with muskets and a piece of cannon. Major Allen had the chief command. Captain Bradley, Captain West, and others were present. After marching six or seven miles, I was put into the ammunition wagon. After they reached Woonsocket, an alarm was fired, and men collected in arms, was taken to a room called the Arsenal. After having been kept there for some time, was released. Two others were taken at the same time and were marched over with us. Saw a wagon at Woonsocket, said to be loaded with muskets in boxes and tents. This load went back with us to Chapachet. Went over with Carter, stayed in Chapachet about an hour. There were considerable numbers of men in arms there then. They stated that their object was to take possession of the government and to place the rightful governor at its head. Seth Luther was there. He talked of the object of the assemblage. He said they had a large number of men in New York who were coming on with Mr. Dorr at the head. Carter said the same. He said they were all prepared and wouldn't have to go home for their breakfast as they did on Federal Hill. Cross-examined. Don't know that I heard at that time of any apprehended attack upon Chapachet from the city of Providence. They talked at Chapachet of an express being sent towards Providence, was complainant in certain cases in Providence County against part of the persons for offenses committed at this time. Some of these men were acquitted and part of the matter was compromised. The defense set up was that there was a state of war and the offense was merged in treason. It was not set up in their defense that there was any deficiency of evidence. Henry A. Kendall saw the body of men who marched on the night of May 17th to the arsenal and saw them again on the plain before that building. They had arms and a cannon, drums and fifes was there when they started and on the plain. Cannon were stationed so as to fire upon the arsenal. The purpose of the marching to the arsenal was to take it. Was a part of the time near Mr. Dorr. Can't say that I heard him give any orders. Orders were given by various persons. The troops marched on the plain. They halted a while and then advanced. Saw the artillery pieces attempted to be fired. They flashed. Don't know who attempted to fire the guns. Was about 10 or 20 feet from them. Don't know where Dorr stood at the time. Think another attempt was made to fire the guns or one of them. Discouraged Dorr from making the attempt on the arsenal. He did not comply with the advice. The men, some of them, remained on the field till daylight. They went on about 1 o'clock. Heard of the flag of truce being sent. Think Carter bore it. Don't know when Dorr left the plane. 
cannot recall the particulars of any conversation I had with Mr. Dorr on the field, know what my own intention was in going to the arsenal, not that of anyone else. Cross-examined. Saw the man who attempted to fire one of the guns. It was not Dorr. Don't think I saw the man who touched the second gun. Did not see Mr. Dorr have a torch in his hand that night. Did not go with the men to Chapachet. Colonel Silas A. Comstock came to Providence about noon 18th of May and went on to Federal Hill, saw the embankment which had been thrown up on the brow of the hill, did not remain there, was also at Chapachet, saw Governor Dorr there and a collection of armed men. Mr. Dorr came up on the hill to inspect them. He wore a belt with two pistols in it, arrived at Chapachet before him. The men on the hill were, some of them, at work on the entrenchment. Do not recollect that they were drawn up in order when Mr. Dorr came upon the ground. There were a number of pieces of cannon, some of which were mounted. There were also powder and cannon balls. Did not hear Mr. Dorr address the soldiers. The object of the assemblage was military discipline and improvement in order to support and protect the people's legislature, which was to meet at Chapachet on the 4th of July. The meeting was accidental and not by any particular orders. Guards were stationed about the hill in the night and in the daytime also. Understood that Governor Dorr issued his proclamation to convene the People's General Assembly at Chapachet, and the men on Acoats Hill gathered there in reference to this call. They meant to defend the place. The guards were stationed about for the safety and protection of the place. The men came to Chapachet in consequence of rumors that Chapachet was to be sacked by Carter's troops from Providence. Cross-examined, acted as colonel of the men assembled in arms at Chapachet, and exercised authority accordingly. On Monday, June 27th, when the men were formed into a regiment, there were under my command from two to two hundred and fifty men under arms and orders, and this was the greatest number of armed men who were at any time at Chapachet on his side. There were many other persons on the ground and in the village who came and went as they pleased. There were as many spectators as men every day about the lines. The number of soldiers on the hill did not vary much, though the men kept changing as they came and went. Was not there on Saturday afternoon, but understood that a company then went off and returned to Cumberland. Spectators spoken of were from Gloucester and from other towns. Our men were all volunteers, without pay. Nothing was furnished them but their food. There was no fort on the hill. There was nothing more than a slight breastwork going round the south and west sides of the hill. It was a temporary work of not much strength. There were large openings or embrasures in it for the pieces of cannon. The general impression among the men was that we were to maintain the government under the people's constitution by offensive or defensive means as circumstances might require. The men did not come there as full companies in a state of discipline. They came in as squads, a dozen or so in each. Only one or two companies came there as such and officered. There were from 11 to 13 men who were said to have come from New York and to belong to the Spartan Band. They conducted themselves like the rest of the men in an orderly manner, considered them under my command as the rest were. There was no colored man under arms. There were two or three blacks in the commissary's department to prepare the provisions. None of our men were under pay. No inducement other than his food was held out to any to come there understood that a proclamation was issued by Governor Dorr to the people of the state, but did not see it. The people were called upon to assemble in arms for the support of their government. There was very little response to the call. Our men did not assemble there from the several towns as there was reason to expect they would do. The government under the people's constitution was abandoned for want of support by the people. This was the sole cause of the disbandment of the men. A council of officers was called by Governor Dorr to consider the subject at General Sprague's house. Every officer present expressed his opinion upon it.
The ground of the disbandment was that the people of the state, after having been called upon, had refused to give their support to their own government. They had denounced its officers and had gone over many of them to the other side, leaving their friends by themselves. The order to disband was submitted to the Council of Military Officers by Governor Dorr and received their approval. The meeting was at headquarters at Sprague's house. Two meetings were held there in the course of the day. At the last, in the afternoon, the order for disbanding the men was given by Governor Dorr and General De Wolf at the house for him to carry on the field and announce to the men. This order was issued toward sunset on Monday, June 27th. Believe it was within an hour of sunset when the order was sent. The men disbanded in consequence of the order. There were but few who made any objection to the disbandment or who did not approve of it as affairs were situated. Did not see Governor Dorr leave Chapachet. The last I saw of him when he gave the order to De Wolf. It was a short order to the officers to disband their men. Do not recollect the wording of it. De Wolf read it to the men on the field as given and signed by the commander-in-chief. There was no irregularity or disorder among the men at the time, though they wanted discipline. I recognized Governor Dorr as Governor of Rhode Island and Commander-in-Chief and received his orders. Do not know of any force being expected from New York or elsewhere, or of any supplies expected from abroad. It was a matter of conversation that, if the troops of the United States should interfere in our state affairs, there were men in New York who stood ready to give their assistance to repel them. There were, at the Hill, two Massachusetts men, the Wolf and another. No unnecessary restraint was placed upon the people in the village of Chapachet. No, of no person being arrested besides Mr. Knight. Governor Dorr gave orders that that private property should be strictly respected by all, and it was respected. The soldier received their provisions from the commissary. Heard no complaint from anyone that private property had been interfered with. We left the village uninjured and unmolested as we found it. Governor Dorr gave me directions to have the guns, tents, and everything else on the hill removed. I acted as a colonel, commanded the second regiment. There were a number of companies, parts of which came there. Two companies from Woonsocket, one from Burraville, one from Cumberland, one from Gloucester, one from Pawtucket. There was but one regiment there. It did not give any orders, in particular to the Spartan band. Among them were Mike Walsh, Johnson, Newman. Walsh was the leader. Didn't ask Walsh whether his object was to support the people's constitution or not had the impression that they were there to assist in any arrangements that might be made to defend it. Did not see Walsh go through any exercises. The principal reason for disbanding was that the people did not come as they had promised to support the Constitution and government, and many of our friends had come out in the papers with a public remonstrance against our proceeding further. The charter troops had no effect upon us. They had not come near us. Orders were sent to all towns by Governor Dorr for the people to assemble at Chapachet, to come out generally, all who were in favor of the Constitution, and show themselves and present a strong front. The latest of my seeing Mr. Dorr was when he gave the order to De Wolf. The consultation had among the principal officers. De Wolf was called first, as he was the tallest officer we had. Bradley, Newell, Potter, Carter, Landers, and as many more were called into council by Governor Dorr. Word was sent to them on the hill in his name. They went to his room, and he stated, in substance, that as no response had been returned to the orders issued, and the people were not with us, and declined to support us, it was proper to disband. This was the opinion of the council also. De Wolf fully recognized the propriety of the measure. The officers all separately expressed their opinions, but do not recollect that the question was formally put to the vote. Horace A. Pierce came on with Mr. Dorr from Stonington on his return from New York, May 16th. Mr. Sales was there. Mr. Dorr did not say anything in my hearing about collecting a force at Anthony's house. 
I was not an officer there on the 16th. Saw Mr. Dorr a little after sundown on the 17th. There was a considerable number of men under arms at Anthony's house, about 300. There were two companies from Woonsocket, one from Pawtucket, several from Providence. It was said they were there by order of Governor Dorr, expected the object was to make an attack upon the arsenal. They went to attack the arsenal that night, about one o'clock. Colonel Wheeler and Major Allen had the direction of the troops. Dorr was at the head of them. He went with them. When we got near the arsenal, someone gave the word to halt. They then advanced some distance to where the cannon were placed. They were attempted to be fired and were afterwards limbered again. Dorr came back and requested men to take charge of the guns. Many of the men deserted them. Some of them were afraid and left. After the guns were flashed, Dorr came and requested the men to take charge of them. They were again unlimbered, and Dorr gave the order to have them fired again. It was said he touched them off could not see distinctly whether he did so or not. Some who were standing by remarked that few men would have the courage that Dorr had, and no one could call him a coward, for he touched off the cannon himself. Those who remained then went back to Anthony's house. It was from seven to eight in the morning when Dorr left Providence. The state troops came up between eight and nine. Mr. Dorr went with C. Allen, did not know that he was going till he had gone. The first I knew of it, someone called out of the window and requested them to disband. This was not assented to by those who had charge of the pieces. When the state troops came up, someone who had the port fire swung it, as if to touch off the cannon, saw a gun presented either at the sheriff or Governor King. The pieces were withdrawn after the house had been searched. Heard a fortnight after that another attempt would be made, went to Chepachet on Wednesday, June 22nd. A company came from Chepachet to Woonsocket, and I returned with them. The embankment was begun to be thrown up on Wednesday or Thursday. There were from 100 to 150 men there then. Understood Mr. Dorr would be there. The purpose of our going there was to protect the General Assembly and to execute the further orders of that body. Mr. Dorr came on Friday night or Saturday morning. On Saturday, there were from 200 to 250 men on the hill. There were a great many without arms who were in the village as spectators. Went on the hill first with Dorr. He went round and spoke with the men. Didn't hear him give an address. There were five or six pieces of cannon on the hill. Never saw but one loaded. That was loaded with powder ball and a bag of slugs. Saw scrap iron around and pikes. They were carried up on the hill. Saw Mike Walsh and his party. Thought he had 14 men. Some said 11. Heard that if the executive of the United States interfered, men would come from New York and other states to repel the troops of the United States. The arms and ammunition were not, to my knowledge, furnished from New York. The disbanding was near sundown. The wolf brought the letter on the hill and read it. Can't tell certainly what time Mr. Dorr left Chepachet. When Mr. Dorr went on the hill, he had a belt on with a pair of pistols. Saw the handles of them think he had no sword. He had a cane. Cross-examined. A man by the name of Smith told me first that Mr. Dorr touched the cannon off. Couldn't tell what time Mr. Dorr left Burrington Anthony's house. Think there were 50 men that returned from the arsenal. There was no order purporting to come from Dorr for the troops to assemble at Chepachet. It was given by Major Allen. The organization at Chepachet was to carry into effect the government under the People's Constitution. The greatest number of persons under arms on the hill, including all who were subject to orders, was from 200 to 250 men. The men in the streets came and went as they pleased as spectators. There were some artillery balls there. Many of them did not fit the guns. There were not cannonballs enough to supply the pieces more than 15 or 20 minutes in an engagement. There were muskets and rifles in the marquee that were not called for or used. They were lying scattered about there. 
Walsh and his men were subject to orders like the rest. They drilled and worked on entrenchment. Good order and discipline were maintained, saw no disorder or improper conduct among them. Benjamin M. Darling was on the plane before the arsenal on the night of the 17th of May, 1842, arrived there from out of town just as the men were going out, and did not hear the reason for going, had heard that Governor Dorr would probably be arrested, and that he wanted his friends to come and protect him. Saw two cannon there, saw a flash, which was said to be of the cannon. Cross-examined. Saw Mr. Dorr on the ground, was near him as his aide, got to be Anthony's house late from Woonsocket, and was not in the council. It was a dark night from a very heavy fog. A man could hardly be distinguished a few feet off. The men halted on the field. It was very still there. Mr. Dorr was near the middle of the whole force. The men scattered not a great while after they went on the ground. Some scattered immediately did not move from my place till the Pawtucket Company left and marched off the ground. Saw Dorr going about among the men in different parts of the field to rally them. Dorr came up again. He gave the order to have pieces withdrawn after the attempt had been made to fire them. John S. Dispo saw Mr. Dorr at Providence on the 17th of May, 1842. He had a body of men assembled there with him in the afternoon, did not see him take the command of them, saw the men move from Burrington Anthony's house to the arsenal, think it was hard on to two o'clock at night, was frequently called for at Anthony's house. Someone would come and inquire for the Pawtucket Company, and I would go in with Dorr. Sometimes he was busy with others, and sometimes not. The officers there were talking of their plans. They were talking whether it was best to make an attack upon the arsenal or not. Don't know what conclusion Dorr came to. Mr. Dorr went to the arsenal to make an attack. Did not see Dorr on the field. Did not meet Mr. Dorr. Considered every one as being for himself and that he had no superior. Ordered my company myself to fall in and march to the field. Returned to Burrington Anthony's house about sunrise. Saw Dorr there. Don't recollect that any conversation passed between them. Did not go to Chipatchet. Received an order to go that was left at my store. Don't know by whom. A man came to Pawtucket and told me I was wanted by Governor Dorr. Don't know the man. Went round and gave notice to my men, who were handy. Ordered them to meet at the National House in Providence. Went in myself about four o'clock in the afternoon. My commission was left in my shop. Others saw it before I did, so that it became known that I had it. Was requested, when under arrest, by governor and council to bring in those papers, meaning the order and commission, when I was out on parole, and I did so accordingly. End of section four. Section 5 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. American State Trials, Volume 2, by John D. Lawson. Trial of Thomas Wilson Dorr for Treason, Rhode Island, 1844, Part 4. Cross-examined. There were 200 or 250 men at Federal Hill before going to the arsenal. Went into the Council of Officers. Don't know who presided. Recollect that Dorr said that he was not much acquainted practically with military matters. Something was said about the propriety of Mr. Dorr's going out or remaining at headquarters. Had 90 men in my company at first mostly well armed, all armed with something or other, did not know my own men well, had seen Chapel's examination before the commissioners published in the papers, in which he, Chapel, stated that he had plugged up the guns before they were carried out to the arsenal. Chapel then told me that he did not plug the guns, but had said so in order to get his discharge from imprisonment. Willis Bowen was in Chapachet on Saturday in June 1842. 
There was an assembly of men in arms there, was there but a little while, judged there were from 150 to 200 men under arms. The troops were drawn up in a hollow square. Governor Dorr went into the square and delivered a speech. He had a belt around him and the appearance of pistols. The men formed into square to hear his speech. Can't recollect much of it. He stated that he came there for the benefit of the people, and that he would rather that his bones should remain on the hill than that the people should not have their rights. He went off the hill escorted. Don't know by how many. He was attended when he came on by several persons. One of them appeared to be an officer. Saw their cannon, drums, fifes, tents, and flags flying. Cross-examined. Was a little deaf when there from a cold, and the wind blew strong. Should think Dor used the words before mentioned. Was there but a short time. Was two or three rods from Dor at the corner of the hollow square saw no disturbance or disorder. Caleb E. Tucker was at Chapachet on Saturday, saw an assemblage of men in arms, cannon, tents, etc. Saw Governor Dorr there in the afternoon. He had a belt and pistols and a small cane in his hand. The men were drawn up in order and maneuvering about. The first I saw of Mr. Dorr, a man from Thompson pointed him out and said the governor was a smart, portly looking man, heard him address the troops who were drawn up in a hollow square. He said they were there for the purpose of protecting the legislature, which was to be there in a few days. He spoke of the rights of the people, which they were to defend, could not say certainly whether he used the expression that he would rather leave his bones there or not. He said he would rather stay there till cold weather than that the people should not have their rights and their assembly meet. Guards were placed around the hill below, none upon it. Cross-examined. Asked no leave to go on the hill. There was no objection made to my going. The men I saw there were rugged, hard-handed people, farmers, and mechanics. There was perfect order on the hill, and the same in the village. There were two men from Connecticut, apparently visitors, not armed. There were perhaps 200 men under arms. The meeting there corresponded well with military trainings generally. The order was as good as at a general muster. I saw one or two not quite sober at the tavern. May 2nd, Darius Hill. Saw the assemblage of armed men at Chapachet. Understood from those there that Governor Dorr was to convene his legislature there on or about the 4th of July. Hardly think the men on the hill were the members of the legislature. Don't know what the cannon were put there for except for protection. They were pointed so as to command the road from Providence. Saw many things that looked as if they might, with a little help, go into the cannon. Heard there was a body of men coming up that way under a pretty slow progress from Providence. Did not understand for what object. The people on the hill were under the command of Major I.B. Allen. Didn't hear Dorr give any command. Didn't suppose that I acted under anybody's command. Considered myself a nation by myself. Didn't interrupt Dorr to ask him what his intentions were. Heard but few words of his address. Cross-examined. I reside four miles west of Chapachet. Am a small farmer. The men on the hill were principally of that class and mechanics, those whom I knew. George B. Aldrich. After passing Mr. Dorr in the road in a carriage going out of town about half past eight in the morning of 18th of May, I proceeded into Providence and went on Federal Hill, where I saw about 40 or 50 suffrage men with cannon. The number of men with the cannon were decreasing while I was there. Was at Chapachet Thursday, Friday, and Saturday in June. Saw Dorr on the hill there on Saturday. Did not hear him address the troops. Some of them were drilling. Mr. Dorr said that if he had had his way, the embankment would have been thrown up in a different manner. Mr. Dorr said he gave no orders to Major Allen to call the people together at the time when they were called. He said that the breastwork was not well done. 
went with Major Allen from Woonsocket up there. They went there to protect the legislature that was to meet there on the 4th of July, and that was the purpose of the greater part of them. Went because the rest did. Major Allen seemed to be commander. Heard 40 reports about the charter troops coming there. Sometimes they were at Greenville, sometimes within a mile, and sometimes at Situate. When on Saturday night about sunset, there were armed men scattering all the way up and down in the village. Saw two men who drove up to the tavern ordered out of the carriage by armed men. Can't say that I saw anyone under restraint as a prisoner. There were a good many things carried on, some maneuvering, some firing. Saw a lot of old iron there. Expect likely they were going to put it into the cannon. The cannon were on the south side of the hill, pointed southerly. Cross-examined. There was no fort at Chapachet, only a line along one side of the hill, about four feet high. They mowed a quantity of the brush, put that in the middle, and covered it with dirt. Work at farming when I do anything. General Jediah Sprague. Live in Chapachet. Keep the hotel there. Kept it also in 1842. Was at a meeting at Woonsocket about the 1st of June. Heard there was to be a military parade there and found a meeting of officers. Military movements were discussed at this meeting. An organization of the military was the intention. Understood that the organization was for improvement in tactics. The wolf was there. He might have been the chairman. Comstock, Allen, Potter, and Dean were also present. It was proposed to raise a subscription to purchase a piece of ground for the suffrage association to use as a parade ground. Was not surprised when I heard Mr. Dorr was coming. Think it was anticipated and that he would return. He took rooms at my house and was sometimes there and sometimes on the hill. During the time Mr. Dorr was there, the military officers from the hill were occasionally inquiring for him and went and talked with him. Soon after Mr. Dorr came, heard him say that he knew nothing of the assembling at Chapachet and of what was going on till shortly before he arrived. He said that he was going to convene the legislature there. Never heard from Mr. Dorr that it was his intention to go to Greenville and attack the charter troops. Mr. Dorr left Chapachet about sundown on the 27th of June, conversed with him about leaving. He expressed his intention of going because he was not sustained by his friends. He meant that he was not sustained in calling the legislature and in carrying into effect the people's constitution. He said it had become evident that he was contending against his friends and enemies and must overcome both to effect the object contemplated. Others advised him to leave. The citizens of the place came to the conclusion that this was the best course. Heard that there were large forces of the government troops to be marched there. Heard of the expectation of assistance from abroad. Heard of some at Chapachet say that they expected it from New York. Cross-examined. When Governor Dorr arrived at Chapachet, he was accompanied by citizens of the village and town. No person from out of the state was with him. Understood that the military force collected was for the purpose of protecting the people's legislature. Heard that some of the men were desirous of going to Greenville to attack the charter forces. The disbandment took place on Monday, June 27th. Heard the order read before it was delivered to the commanding officer. There were various rumors of the approach of the opposite forces. They arrived the next day, the 28th, about breakfast time, say 7 to 8 o'clock. Mr. Dorr left Chapachet one or two hours after the order to disband was given. Recollect that Mr. Dorr called on the people to support him. Governor Dorr on Saturday requested me to close my bar room that there might be no disorder in the village. The request was complied with and the bar room was kept closed. The troops were very orderly, quiet and peaceable at his house. The troops were principally farmers from the country towns. There were some Providence men among them, but not many of them answered the call. Knew a great many of the troops personally. They were men of good reputation. 
understood there were two or three instances where private property was interfered with by some of the men, three instances a horse taken, used and afterwards returned, a cow was taken for food, this was paid for. Saw Mr. Dorr pay for a part of it. Some boards were taken which were afterwards burnt on the hill. Know that these acts were contrary to the orders of Governor Dorr. His orders to his men were that private property must be strictly respected. Duty J. Pierce Went to Chapachet on Sunday, 26th of June, about 12 o'clock. Saw Mr. Dorr at Sprague's Hall, presiding in a council of officers. Don't recollect anyone but William H. Potter. Mr. Dorr was occupying the seat usually occupied by a chairman. Stopped a moment, and Mr. Dorr said that it was a meeting of officers and called me to his room. Urged upon him the necessity of disbanding his forces and stated the force which would come against him. Mr. Dorr gave no assurance that he should do so. He said he came there for the purpose of acting under the Constitution which he had sworn to support, that he had the same right to use force for the purpose of supporting that Constitution that others had to bring force to put down the government under that Constitution, told him it was altogether idle to expect that legislature, the people's, to organize again, that a great many of its members had resigned, and that I did not know one that would meet there in pursuance of any call from him. Further stated that the charter legislature had adjourned from Newport on Friday, and that their very last act was to pass a law calling for a convention under which all could vote for delegates, and that this measure had tended in great measure to allay the excitement, and that many of those who were his friends were quite willing to accept this proposition as a compromise of the difficulties. Mentioned to Mr. Dorr that I saw many of the most ardent friends of the suffrage cause in the ranks of the charter troops on Saturday. Among others, I mentioned Mr. M's of Providence, which seemed to strike Mr. Dorr with astonishment. Mr. Dorr asked if I saw the review of state troops on Saturday. I told him I saw them pass my boarding house. They were said to be 2,300 strong. There were at least 1,500 of them well armed. Also stated that additional forces to the number of 500 to 600 were expected from Washington and Kent. Mr. Dorr asked if he was to be attacked that evening. I answered that I thought not. Told him that it was the intention of the most influential charter men to adopt such a course as would prevent bloodshed. Mr. Dorr said little, showed distrust, and did not believe my statements or conclusions to the extent represented to him. Talked at Chapachet, mostly with the citizens and the guards. Asked Mr. Dorr how many armed men were there. Gave no definite answer. Got the impression that there was 300 or 400, and more were coming. Do not think that Mr. Dorr expected foreign forces. Judge so from what Mr. Dorr had said previously that he intended to rely upon the people of the state and rejected the idea of any force from abroad except upon the contingency of the United States interfering. I told Dorr also that an application had been made to the President of the United States by the Charter Government, which would probably be answered favorably on Tuesday following, and that then the United States troops would be brought against him. That Colonel Bankhead was waiting in Providence, probably for further orders. Stated also the rumor that Bankhead had been out in disguise and reconnoitered Dorr's camp. Dorr asked who was in command of the state troops, told him General McNeil. He said it was strange that he should be in such a place, referring to General McNeil, formerly of the Army, and then in the Boston Custom House. I told him it was not the New Hampshire general, but the McNeil connected with the Stonington Railroad. He expressed himself astonished, as he had lately been advising with him about his rights and movements in Rhode Island. Mr. Dorr did not say whether McNeil's advice was to dissuade him or not from an attempt to establish the government. Cross-examined have the impression that Mr. Dorr said he had nothing personal in view, but came there to discharge his duty as a public officer. Saw no disclaimer in the newspapers on the part of suffrage men of Mr. Dorr's proceedings, 
but knew that individuals had come out and disclaimed any further support of the new government. Mr. Dorr asked if I had resigned my seat in the People's Legislature, replied that when I was arrested and gave bail, I necessarily vacated my seat. In this opinion, I was confirmed by Mr. Atwell and by Mr. Dorr, who said he didn't see how I could take my seat again. Dorr did not treat me cordially, but politely. He stated that he had called on the people for support and had issued a proclamation to that effect, but that the support that had been promised had not come. Recollect telling Dorr that major power was taken, and his reply was then, My sword is gone. Laban Wade was on Federal Hill on the night of the attack on the arsenal, saw the armed men march to the arsenal and Mr. Dorr with them, did not hear him give any order, saw him at two or three different places on the plain, saw the cannon touched and flash. They were pointed toward the arsenal. Cannot say that I recollect hearing the order given to fire. Was also at Chapachet as early as any of them. Went away on Monday. Mr. Dorr was there. I considered him the governor of the state and presumed he had the command of the acting commander. Think I saw Dorr on the hill. Saw him at Sprague's Tavern, the headquarters. There were arms and munitions of war at the hill. My object in going to Chapachet was to support the people's constitution and the assembly there. Contemplated to fight hard if attacked. Didn't contemplate attacking anybody. If ordered by Governor King to disperse, should have dispersed if I had been obliged to. The reason I dispersed was because the rest went away and left me. The disbandment was in consequence of an order from Governor Dorr made up in a council of officers. Saw the cannon twice attempted to be fired at the arsenal. Can't say if the attempt was made again. Never received any order to go to Chapachet. Cross-examined. Saw Governor Dorr at two or three places on the arsenal ground. It was so dark from a heavy fog, you couldn't see anything unless you felt it first. Couldn't see how the men were situated there on the ground. A portion of them retreated and marched off soon after going on the ground. Can't tell how many. Should think nearly half. Can't tell how many marched there. The last I saw of Dor there was after daylight and before sunrise. He was near the cannon. They were being dragged off. The men had all left when I came off the field. Don't know who fired the gun. It was not Dor the first time, for I stood within two feet of him. Before the second flash, I went a little from him. Did not see him go to the gun. Couldn't say whether he did or did not. Governor Dorr had a glazed cap, frock coat, and white sword belt. Didn't see anybody wave the torch. The man who touched the cannon was a fair-sized man. The men at Chapachet were good hearty fellows, farmers and mechanics. The company I went with were mechanics. Colonel William H. Potter, Adjutant General at Chapachet, was at Federal Hill at the time of the preparation to attack the arsenal. The object of the assemblage was to take it. Saw Mr. Dorr on the field and considered him the commander-in-chief of the state. Did not know what was intended next if they should take the arsenal. Was at Chapachet. Attended the meeting of officers at Woonsocket two or three weeks before the affair at Chapachet. Colonel DeWolf was chairman. The object of that meeting was to find a place for the organization and discipline of the militia and to carry into effect the people's constitution against all opposition. If assaulted, they intended to defend themselves against the forces of the state or any other forces. The officers adjourned to meet at Chapachet. General Sprague was appointed a committee to select a piece of ground suitable for military exercise. Sprague, Comstock, and others were present. No letter from Mr. Dorr was read there cannot swear whether the meeting was held with the consent of Mr. Dorr or not. The next time I saw Governor Dorr was at Killingly, Connecticut. Fifteen or twenty went into the room with me to see Governor Dorr. Mr. Dorr came down with them to Chapachet. Colonel Newell gave the information that Governor Dorr was in Killingly. It was expected that Mr. Dorr would come to Chapachet. 
Some officers were appointed by Mr. Dorr before he came and after. Colonel de Wolf was appointed next in command to himself, with the title of general. Did not hear Governor Dorr's speech at Acoats Hill, or hear him say anything about attacking the forces at Greenville. Some forty or fifty of the men wanted to go and see what they were made of at Greenville. Do not know what they might have done before they got back. If the charter forces had made an attack on ours at Chapachet, they would have been resisted. There were six or seven cannon at Chapachet. Do not know where they or the ammunition were procured. Some of the powder was brought by the people of Chapachet. The object of the assemblage was to carry into effect the people's constitution by all means that might be necessary." The greatest number of men in arms at Chapachet at any time was about 225. The object of the troops was to support the General Assembly and the People's Constitution in any way that might be required and as should be directed by Governor Dorr upon consultation with his officers. Orders were issued in writing by direction of Governor Dorr to the people of the towns particularly in the county of Providence, to assemble in arms at Chapachet, and these orders were sent a second time. Pikes were made for the use of some of the men, and there was scrap iron on hand for the purpose of loading the pieces. Cross-examined. No of an order issued to convene a council of officers before the affair at Chapachet. They were requested to consider whether the people's constitution could at that time be put in force, to consider whether anything should be done, and if anything, what. This council did not meet as requested. The assemblage at Chapachet was voluntary and without orders. The men came from Woonsocket and other places voluntarily with their officers. After Governor Dorr's arrival, a general call was made upon the people similar to the order to dispo, and that call was repeated up to Monday. It was not replied to. There were as many men there on Saturday and Monday as on any day. The men were counted by Governor Dorr's order on Saturday. There were 200 or 225. After that, a detachment left the place and went home. Some went to Cumberland and some to Slattersville. Sixty or seventy left. Do not know by whose request they returned home. The men were counted a second time by Mr. Dorr's order. The number did not exceed 225 at any time. That is, this was the number of men armed and under orders. They were mostly farmers and mechanics. The men about the village were unarmed and under no orders. No strict discipline was maintained on the hill until Monday. No man was pressed into the service. All who did serve served voluntarily. Never heard of Mr. Knight's being fired upon, as has been related. I acted as adjutant general. Do not know of funds being provided to subsist the force. A contribution was taken up on the ground and $70 collected. There was no depot of provisions on hand. There were some barrels of flour and beef remaining when the camp broke up, which would not have lasted four days. Part of the cannonballs would not fit the pieces. What would fit would not have lasted more than 15 minutes in an engagement. A council of officers was called on Monday. It was evident that there were not artillery, ammunition, and provisions enough, and that we were not sustained by the force that was expected. The enemy were said to be at Greenville and Situate. There had been frequently such reports. It was reported on Saturday and Sunday night that they were coming, does not know by whom the order of dismissal was taken to the ground. The order was issued about four o'clock. Mr. Dorr left Chapachet about sunset. No person from out of the state was in Mr. Dorr's company when I saw him at Killingly. All with whom he returned into the state were officers and citizens of the state. General William Gibbs McNeil I appear as a witness on this occasion most unexpectedly, most painfully, and most reluctantly. Had been summoned, had been permitted to leave the state, and had been recalled by a letter from the Attorney General. 
was now again within the jurisdiction of the state and bound to give my testimony. I was desirous of doing this on account of some insinuations contained in the testimony of Duty J. Pierce, which slandered me most falsely and most foully. In the conversation which I had with Mr. Dorr, I was not a counselor or advisor except in opposition to him. I regard this conversation as private and in confidence. Mr. Dorr, I release you from all the honorary obligations which you regard yourself as being under, that you may relate all you know. General McNeil, being in New York in May 1842 and hearing that Mr. Dorr was there, called with Mr. Galliard of South Carolina to pay my respects to him at the Howard House. A great many persons were present, none of whom I knew. Mr. Dorr introduced me to Mr. Slam, which much to my surprise, as I had always regarded him as a fictitious character. Laughter. Do not wish to be understood that I found Mr. Slam other than a gentleman in all respects. Mr. Slam informed me that Mr. Dorr intended to return to Rhode Island and enforce the Constitution, which he regarded as valid. We conversed but little and upon the question of the necessity of his so doing. Did not consider that there was anything serious in the matter. Asked Mr. Dorr jestingly who was to command his forces. Dorr walked up to me and slapped me on the shoulder and asked me if I would not. Did not decline the offer because I did not consider it as serious. It was remarked that a majority were in favor of this constitution, which I had always denied, contending that there was no majority, meaning no legally ascertained majority. It was so stated by Mr. Slam that they could have assistance from abroad, as many as 10,000 from New York and 1,000 from other places. I left the house without an impression of anything serious being intended. The next day, the last time I had the pleasure of seeing Mr. Dorr, Burrington Anthony came to me and requested a car to run separately from Stonington to Providence. I acceded to his request, was censured for this, on the supposition that I had made an offer of this conveyance. The price was not specified. This was the last day I saw Mr. Dorr, but I hope that we may often meet again as friends as before. Cross-examined. In connection with the aid from abroad, think it highly probable that something may have been said by Mr. Dorr about an expected interference on the part of the United States government in Rhode Island affairs, but cannot now recall it. There were no enlistments spoken of as having been made. The language was general that thousands would repair to Mr. Dorr's standard from sympathy in the cause believe they would have come after Mr. Dorr had got possession of the city of Providence. I only speak from my general knowledge of the people of the cities and from mixing with them all over the county. Sympathy would have been an inducement to them. Conversation was hasty and general. Have not seen Mr. Dorr since until today. Had no communication in any way with Mr. Dorr after this interview nor was there any concert or understanding between me and Mr. Dorr. Afterwards held a commission from the authorities of Rhode Island as Major General, Commanding-in-Chief, was not a citizen of the state. Colonel Bankhead was not under my employ or command. I afterward understood that for the part I had taken in Rhode Island affairs, I was liable to be attacked in the city of New York, went immediately to the pewter mug to meet any assailants, but found no difficulty, was not molested. The Attorney General stated that all his witnesses had been examined and that the prosecution would rest here for the present. End of Section 5 Section 6 of American State Trials, Volume 2 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. American State Trials, Volume 2, by John D. Lawson. Trial of Thomas Wilson Dorr for Treason, Rhode Island, 1844, Part 5. Mr. Bosworth to the Jury 
The evidence exhibits the proceedings of a set of daring, worthless, desperate men, guided and directed by a leader who sought the bad eminence in which he was placed with his eyes open and warned of consequences, and who waged war on the sanctities of private life for the accomplishment of his foul, ambitious, and nefarious purposes, to attain which he was ready and willing to imbrue his hands in the blood of his friends and relatives. At the arsenal he was prevented from succeeding by the treachery of one of his men and by the desertion of others, but not until, descending from the honorable place of a commander, he had attempted with his own hands to light the torch of civil war against his relations and fellow citizens. After having committed such atrocious acts, he escaped from the state. The prisoner also took an oath as governor of the state at the foundry and exercised the duties appropriate to such a station. He issued military commissions, giving power to expel, kill, and destroy the inhabitants of the state. The General Assembly also performed the part of a legislative body. They assumed to exercise the authority of a legislature. Postponing the choice of judges, they proceeded in the election of military officers and passed diverse acts and resolutions, all which indicate most clearly in all of them a deliberate, wicked, and malicious intent. They knew what they were about, they acted with their eyes open, and the consequences are upon their heads." After remaining a short time abroad in the capacity of an extraterritorial governor and obtaining assurances of aid in his nefarious designs, the prisoner returned again into the state, still bent upon his wicked object, and urging on others to carry it into effect even at the sacrifice of life, willing, as he said, to leave his bones on the field, and calling on the people to stand by and support him. But fortunately he was not supported by his friends, on whom he called in vain. A formidable force was sent to break up his encampment, and when all hope of success had vanished, and he had nothing left to depend upon, he fled again, thereby manifesting a sense of guilt and a conviction that he was a wrongdoer who felt no confidence in his cause. For if he had been animated, as it was pretended, by a sense of duty, he would have remained to receive the justice that was due, and which he could have no reason to fear if he were not guilty. Mr. Bosworth then reviewed the testimony bearing on the particular overt acts and concluded with urging that the evidence was so clear, positive, and direct that the jury could not hesitate and must pronounce the prisoner guilty. May 3rd. Mr. Turner. Gentlemen of the jury, when you consider the novel character of the circumstances by which I am surrounded the high nature of the duties which have devolved on me as one of the counsel for our distinguished client, and the deep sense of professional and personal responsibility which a faithful discharge of those duties create in the mind, you will find, I trust, ample apology for whatever embarrassment may be betrayed by me in attempting their discharge, and will kindly extend to me such indulgent consideration as my position requires. The circumstances I have said to be of a novel character, for trials for treason have, happily for us, until the present time been entirely unknown in this state, and a very rare occurrence in this country. The duties of which I speak, inasmuch as they embrace the distinct assertions of principles of vital importance to the whole community, of which we are all members, as well as the vindication of the character of our client, may well be pronounced of a high and commanding nature. And the responsibility which it is impossible not to feel arises from a contemplation of the consequences to him and to us which will result from the verdict you may render in the present case, which verdict in a greater or lesser degree will depend upon the fidelity and ability with which the defense is conducted. 
In view of these circumstances, well may the defendant's counsel, therefore, feel a degree of self-distrust and embarrassment which ordinary cases would neither call for nor justify. But, gentlemen, in some respects, your own situation is not less difficult than ours. Your position as jurors has also its novelty, its duties, and its responsibilities. It is your duty, impartially and fairly, to try and true deliverance make between the state and prisoner at the bar, and this you, under your oath as jurors, are to do according to law and the evidence given to you. It is your duty, therefore, attentively and patiently to hear and seriously and carefully consider and weigh the matter, whether of law or evidence that may be submitted to you for the defense. We look to you for that on your parts. And on the other hand, we assure you on our parts that it will be our endeavor neither to tax your attention nor draw on your indulgence beyond what a complete discharge of our own duties may require. In point of responsibility, gentlemen, there can be no comparison between us. When we shall have faithfully acquitted ourselves of our duty to our client, all our responsibility ends. Yours then begins. Neither he nor the people of this state or country, nor our fellow men of this day, nor those after generations that may succeed us, will have cause to inquire after or care for us. But it will be to you that he and they will all look, and all will equally hold you while living and your memories after death responsible for the verdict you may render. You are at this moment, and it is the first that has occurred in American history, standing in a position between popular rights and popular supremacy on the one side, and legislative assumption and oppression on the other. And although you will decide the immediate fate of one person alone by that verdict, yet upon that verdict may hang suspended the destinies of freedom herself. By the indictment, our client, Mr. Dorr, is charged with the crime of treason. Treason, gentlemen, is an offense that differs materially and essentially in its character from most other crimes. In them, such as murder, rape, arson, etc., the injury intended is merely of a personal and private nature. They are directed against the individuals of a community only and are punished as such. But treason is a crime against an entire community collectively, and it is the highest crime that an individual can commit against a community or body politic, of which he is a member. It is therefore a political offense, and as such it ever has been and still is to be regarded. Such being the nature and character of treason, from the principles and structure of American government, its object is generally, if not always, a change either in the form of government or the administration of it. We are to look, therefore, for its origin in political causes. History will justify me in saying that treason has been most frequently created and oftentest punished under the most arbitrary governments, and those whose administration has been most wickedly conducted. Could a full and perfect history of all the proceedings against treason be written at this day, it would present to us such a picture of cruelty, depravity, oppression, robbery, and murder, sometimes with and sometimes without the forms, but always under the color of law, and avowedly for the better preservation of order. That as Americans, the citizens of a free country, which has hitherto escaped its desolations, we should turn in disgust and abhorrence from the detail of its monstrous atrocities. Treason, gentlemen, you must be aware, is a plant of a slow growth. For mankind are more disposed to suffer whilst evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they have been accustomed. And where prosecutions for this and similar offenses have been most frequent, it has been invariably found that injustice and oppression have ever been their precursors. It derives its origin most frequently, 
quote, from a long train of usurpations and abuses, end quote, on the part of government, whilst, on the other hand, under good governments well administered, treason is a crime scarcely known in history. It is of importance, therefore, gentlemen, that we should turn our attention a moment to the political history of our own state, as well for the purpose of ascertaining the remote causes of the present prosecution, as to fix our minds the great and broad principles upon which we intend to rely for the prisoner's defense. He would not himself, nor shall we in his behalf, seek by evasion or subterfuge to shun the great question you are to try. It is not the act, but the construction put upon it, which gives importance to the cause, and the question, when stripped of its technical investments and presented before you in its naked lineaments, are this. Are the people of a state dependent on the will of the legislature alone for altering its fundamental laws and reorganizing its government? This is the great question, and well deserving the deepest solicitude and the most profound consideration. It was my purpose, gentlemen, to have reviewed to you the course of legislation pursued by the charter government on subjects out of which this prosecution has grown, and to enlarge somewhat on the grievances under which about three-fifths of our fellow citizens have labored, in order to have shown you that justice to them and to their rights had long been not only neglected but denied, and to have satisfied you that the time had actually arrived for the people themselves to take measures for establishing a written constitution, but from all this I am debarred by the direction of the Honorable Court, and will ask your attention to the matter of the indictment itself. The points of our defense are as follows. 1 that in this country treason is an offense against the United States only and cannot be committed against an individual state. 2. That the fourth section of the Act of Rhode Island of March 1842 entitled An Act Relating to Offenses Against the Sovereign Power of the State is unconstitutional and void as destructive of the common law right of trial by jury, which was a fundamental part of the English Constitution at the Declaration of Independence and has ever since been a fundamental law of Rhode Island. That that act, if constitutional, gives this court no jurisdiction to try this indictment in the county of Newport, all the overt acts being therein charged as committed in the county of Providence. 4. That the defendant acted justifiably as governor of the state under a valid constitution rightfully adopted which he was sworn to support. 5. That the evidence does not support the charge of treasonable and criminal intent in the defendant. Before making any comments, I will call the witnesses for the defendant, who have been long detained here and are anxious to return to their homes and businesses. Witnesses for the defendant. Henry S. Hazard. Recalled. Stood at the door of the arsenal when Colonel Blodgett came to the door on the night of 17th May. Saw men with the pieces in the lower story, but cannot state whether the plan was to defend both stories or not, except from what has been said here by the witnesses. Colonel Charles W. Carter was present as an officer of the escort in the procession of the General Assembly from High Street to the Foundry on the 3rd of May, 1842, saw no persons in the procession unusually armed or having large cane sticks of wood or anything of that sort. The object of this assemblage was to organize the government under the People's Constitution, in the afternoon, Governor Dorr ordered the city troops, in which I was an officer, a lieutenant in the 4th Ward Volunteers, to be in readiness for the next day. The next day I called on Governor Dorr to ask him what service they were wanted. 
He replied that he regretted that his purpose of taking possession of the state house and of the public property was defeated by the opposition of the House of Representatives. He, Mr. Dorr, thought this was the right course and was in favor of it. Before we went to take the arsenal, or to attempt to take it, there was a meeting of military officers at Burrington Anthony's house at the request of Governor Dorr to consult about the steps to be taken. Some thought it would be better to march into the city before going to the arsenal. The majority were in favor of going to the latter, and the opposition was waived. After hearing the views of the officers, Governor Dorr gave the order to march to the arsenal, which contained the state arms. I supposed the soldiers then would follow Governor Dorr wherever he might lead them. This was my determination. Several of the officers suggested to Governor Dorr that he had better remain at Anthony's house with a guard. I was one of them. Governor Dorr replied that he had often publicly stated, and at the townhouse, that when danger should happen he wished to be found anywhere but in the rear, that he should be as good as his word, and would not send others where he was not willing to go himself. Mr. Dorr went out in the center of the column. I was near him. Henry A. Kendall was on one side. It was a very dark night, heavy fog and mist, difficult to distinguish anything a little distance off. The night was not chosen because it was dark. The fog came up late, seemed like an interposition of divine providence. Counted the men in sections before they started to go out and found 234 in all, although the number had been represented by some as larger. Saw Governor Dorr on the field doing his duty as an officer and attempting to rally and bring up the men. The two artillery pieces, six-pounders, were loaded with round-shot balls. Colonel Wheeler, the chief officer of the force, after the men had been halted, called on me to carry a flag of truce to the arsenal and demand the surrender of it. Colonel Wheeler told me to say to Colonel Blodgett, who commanded the arsenal, that there was force enough there to blow them all to hell. I replied I would say no such thing, but would say what was proper on such an occasion. Colonel Blodgett has given a perfectly true account of what took place when I went to the arsenal with the flag, went up to the lines and called for the corporal of the guard, was asked who's there, replied an enemy having in my hand a sword and a, with a white handkerchief upon it for a flag made demand for the surrender of the place in the name of Colonel Wheeler, but immediately thought that it should be made in the name of Governor Dorr, and corrected myself. Colonel Blodgett answered that he knew no such persons and should defend his post, went back and saw Colonel Wheeler, said Wheeler, what did he, Blodgett, say? What did he say, I replied, what the devil should he say but that he should defend the arsenal? turned round and looked toward the other end of the line, and when I looked back again, there was no Colonel Wheeler to be seen. He had gone off in the fog, went after Governor Dorr, and both looked for the Colonel, but could not find him on the field. Governor Dorr then ordered me to take command of the artillery, which I did. Saw Captain Dispo with the Pawtucket Company going off in the rear, asked him where the devil he was going, Dispo replied, there is danger here. Asked him how the devil he expected to go to war without getting into danger. The men were then ordered into line. The guns were placed in position and pointed at the arsenal. And the right gun was touched. It flashed but did not go off. The left gun was also flashed and primed again and was flashed a second time without going off. The first gun was touched off by a man named Andrews, the second by a Mr. Hawthaway. Governor Dorr stood in the rear of the guns. He did not have a torch in his hand that night or apply a port fire or torch to either of the pieces. I commanded them, stood close by them all the time, and I am sure that Governor Dorr did not attempt to fire them. Have heard the testimony of Orson Moffat that he saw Governor Dorr swing a torch and flash one of the pieces, and know that in saying so he has testified what is false. I gave the word to fire the pieces by the order of the commander, Governor Dorr. 
The guns were entirely unserviceable, powder old and poor, and, becoming damp, had hardened, so that the priming wire would not go down through it. The statement which has been made here, that the guns were plugged up with wood or something else, is untrue. They were bored out in the morning, after they were brought back at Anthony's house, with a gimlet and rod, which was the only way in which they could be cleared. There were no plugs found in them. The substance was dissolved powder, which had hardened and become solid. After the flash, the men began to scatter, so that soon there were hardly enough left to carry off the guns. I limbered one of them myself. Governor Dorr collected about fifty men to take the guns back. He went off the field with one of them, and I with the other. The rest of the men had left. There were about fifty men who went back to the house of B. Anthony on the morning of the 18th, and their number decreased. Colonel Wheeler, having gone, Governor Dorr that morning appointed Levi Aldrich Colonel and several others in the places of those who had left. The signals were not answered. The men did not return to defend the headquarters, and it became necessary for Mr. Dorr to leave the ground, which he did at about half past eight o'clock. Governor Dorr consulted with his friends and showed me a letter informing him that all the officers of the government in Providence had resigned and that he could expect no support. He was advised to leave. This was my advice to him. Understood he left an order with Colonel Aldrich to fall back with authority to dismiss his men. The colonel gave the order from the window. Sometime after Governor Dorr had gone, the charter troops, some six or eight hundred of them, came up. Twenty-seven of our men remained. They fell back to the edge of the hill, stood by the cannon, and would not suffer them to be taken from them by force. They meant to go off with the honors of war. Mr. Anthony requested me to give them up. My intention was that they should be given up to the artillery company to whom they belonged according to the agreement when they were taken, and they were so given up the next day. Prevented a cannon from being fired at the mass of men when they were coming up the hill by catching the match. After Governor Dorr had gone away, someone said something about a compromise with the enemy. Governor Dorr never mentioned any such thing, never believed anything about this compromise. When Governor King and the sheriff came up, the men saw that there was no such thing. I called this the soft soap story. There was no man on duty among the soldiers on Federal Hill who was under the influence of liquor or intoxicated. The statement that any of the men were in that condition is untrue. Was one of Governor Dorr's aides at Chapacha in June following. The average of the armed men there composing our force did not exceed 200. The men were coming and going as they pleased. The service was voluntary. A company from Cumberland went back on Saturday, knew of none being taken up and compelled to serve. Took up one of my own men who was drunk and kept him in the guardhouse till sober. He was the only one I saw in that condition. There was no command exercised over the men about the village and not much over the soldiers on the hill. Thirteen of the latter were from New York. Being in the confidence of Governor Dorr as his aide, I had frequent conversation with him. Heard him say that in case the President of the United States interfered in the affairs of the state, he wished and expected assistance from other states. Never heard him say that he desired or expected any such aid to interfere between the two political parties of the state and to strengthen one against the other. Mr. Dorr's view was that if the people were let alone from abroad by the United States, they would take care of themselves, and if they could not maintain their rights, they did not deserve to have any. There was a talk among some of the men that if they got to Providence, they could occupy the colleges for barracks. Governor Dorr forbade all marauding. He ordered that private property should be everywhere respected. A couple of beef cattle were taken, but the one that was kept was paid for. Governor Dorr said that the assembling at Chapachet was premature for want of a consultation. There was no regularly organized force there. The organization commenced after they got there. 
Council of Officers was held at Sprague's Hotel, before whom the state of affairs was laid. I was present. The opinion of the officers was given in favor of disbanding. Governor Dorr wrote an order to this effect, and General DeWolf carried it to Acoats Hill and made it known to the men. Governor Dorr said that it appeared by a newspaper that had been sent to him that many who had been just before our staunch friends in Providence were now going against us and denouncing us. Many had also expressed their satisfaction with the doings of the Chartered General Assembly. Governor Dorr said it made no difference how they went over to the enemy, whether from cowardice or by base means. It had become evident that the majority were against supporting the Constitution by arms, and if we remain there, we should have to contend as a faction both against friends and enemies. The order to disband was given when the sun was three quarters of an hour high. The soldiers broke up from the camp, as men do at the end of a general muster, without any haste or disorder. Governor Dorr left Chapachet at about sunset. I went with him. There were no others except the driver of the wagon. Went to Vernon Stiles Hotel in Thompson, Connecticut. There were only three colored men on the hill, and they were in the commissary's department. Heard in Norwich that Eddie had some money there to procure ammunition. The troops dispersed immediately on being disbanded. Of some 600 men in Providence who held meetings and agreed to come out into service when called for, only 35 came to Chapachet. Governor Dorr was informed that when he should move to carry the government into effect that he could depend on 1,500 men who were pledged to support him. He remarked at the disbandment that if those who had been deprived of their rights would not fight for themselves, they were not worth fighting for. Was present on Saturday afternoon and heard Governor Dorr deliver his address to the troops. Stood near him did not hear him use the expression about laying his bones on the hill, as has been stated. If he had used it, would have heard it. The flag under which we assembled was the standard of 1976. Cross-examined. The guns which were aimed at the arsenal were unloaded after they were brought back to Anthony's house in the morning. They were loaded with round shot, with cannonballs. When reloaded, they were loaded with slugs. The guns were pointed quartering at the arsenal, thought it would produce a better effect than if the balls went plump on. The guns were as far apart as the width of this room, saw the right gun touched and went to the left. There were not more than a dozen men around them. About this time they went away, behind woodpiles and somewhere else. After the return from the arsenal, I remained outside B. Anthony's house rallying the men was not by the guns the whole time after they were brought back, saw nothing but powder when the priming was withdrawn, didn't know when Governor Dorr was to return from New York. A man came to me and said Governor Dorr wished him to make some pikes, saw the pikes when made. The assemblage at Chapachet was to protect the people's legislature and the town against invasion. It was only talk among some of the men of going to Providence and taking possession of the colleges. There was no plan or conversation to that effect among the officers. Things did not admit of such a movement. Held myself ready to go anywhere that I should be ordered. Think I said something about preparing hot shot to be used when necessary, as they are sometimes in war. Do not know of any aid being called from New York to act in any other case than that of interference by the general government. Think I propose taking the armories in Providence first before we should attempt to take the arsenal. Governor Dorr wanted to take the arsenal because it contained the state arms. Saw Governor Dorr between the time of the Federal Hill affair and that at Chapachet. The plan was to procure men and ammunition and to maintain the people's constitution and government by force if necessary. I think I mentioned then that they had tried to take the Warren guns. Governor Dorr might have approved it. Cannot speak certainly. Do not think he disapproved of it. There were men about the village of Chapachet without arms. The men left the hill at first when they pleased, 
but that was stopped toward the last, and those who chose to become soldiers were required to stay. Two farmers, good men, came there and were going off the hill, told them that they had better not, but one said he had six cows at home and one heifer that kicked very badly and thought they had better go home and see to them, as they had left there nothing but women folks. I made them leave their muskets behind. The men generally wanted to go to Greenville to, to attack the charter troops. The reason they did not was the news from Providence that our party in town had given up entirely was not on the hill when the order to disband was read, heard no proposition from Dorr to go to Providence and take possession of the colleges or anything else, never heard anything from Governor Dorr which carried the appearance that he was acting for his own personal interest. He was acting for the people only and in their service, and if they had not abandoned him through cowardice, their government would have been this day in opposition. John S. Harris. No, where the votes given for the people's constitution now are, and of their being counted, and how many there are. The Attorney General objected to the admission of any testimony on this point. The court, such testimony is not relevant at all to the issue. Mr. Turner. A great deal of evidence has been offered to show that the defendant assumed to be governor of the state and pretended to act under a constitution. The assistant of the prosecuting officer has laid great stress on this point in his opening to the jury. In the present stage of the case, we offer this testimony for the purpose of explaining the motives of the prisoner. Mr. Dorr. I am entitled to this testimony, even supposing that all the proceedings in favor of the people's constitution and to elect a government under it were null and void. It was an explanation of my intentions and to show what authority there was at the foundation of my sets, at the foundation of my acts, and that I had not risen up in the midst of the people as an usurper acting of my own mere motion and without law. It is certainly proper to claim a right to repel the charge of wicked and malicious motives in exercising a pretended authority which has been so much dwelt upon by the prosecutor in the opening of the case. I am charged with usurping the duties appropriate to a governor of the state. Let us inquire whether this was or was not an unauthorized assumption. Let us look into the election and beyond at the votes for the Constitution itself at the formation and proceedings of the people's legislature, at my recognition by the assembly and by the people in my political capacity, and then it will be more easy to make up a fair judgment upon the character, motives, and intentions of the accused. Durfee, Chief Justice. The court rule that as evidence has been introduced very properly by the government to prove a conspiracy, it is for the prisoner to disprove that fact, but not to confirm it. It is not necessary in order to be a usurper that a man should set himself up alone and pretend to act in any authority. In fact, he cannot do so but by the consent of large numbers. But such a conspiracy can give no authority by its numbers and can excuse no one for the violation of the laws. No one knows better than the prisoner the maxim that ignorance of the law is no excuse for its violation. No crime can be permitted to be excused by showing that the prisoner acted under a mistake of the law respecting his natural rights. A prisoner might as well set up to an indictment for robbery the defense that he had a natural right to the possession of the property which he took from the person robbed. The evidence which the jury should consider is that which relates to the levying of war and the part which the defendant took in it. If the evidence proved this charge as laid in the indictment, then the jury should bring in a verdict of guilty, otherwise of not guilty. The evidence offered will not prove the absence of the malice charged. 
Mr. Dorr hoped not to be misunderstood in having it supposed by anyone that he set up the defense that he acted under a mistake of law in supporting the rights of the people or his own. Very far from it, he claimed to be justified by having done what he had a right to do. But the testimony was offered in this stage to explain his motives. Staples Justice the evidence of the prisoner's intention can be of no importance. There is no pretense of any private malice on his part, and the law infers general malice to constitute the offense if the facts be proved. Durfee, Chief Justice. All considerations of this kind are more properly presented after verdict by way of mitigation of the sentence. Brayton, Justice. I understand that no evidence had been offered to prove special malice in the prisoner. Mr. Turner, will the court have the goodness to state why testimony as to the fiendish looks and expressions of the defendant was allowed to be gone into? The opening counsel has indulged himself freely in harsh imputations against the defendant, and a great many things have been introduced here which can have no other effect than to prejudice the jury against him. We ought to be permitted to remove all these prejudices as we can if we be permitted to go into the whole case. Durfee, Chief Justice, the evidence proper for the jury is that which relates to the levying of war and the part the defendant took in it. Staples Justice No evidence ought to have the slightest weight with the jury, if any such has been put in, to show any personal malice or feelings on the part of the prisoner. The evidence must go to prove the facts laid in the indictment, and upon these the jury must render a verdict of guilty, if at all. The court rejected the testimony offered, and the defendant accepted to their ruling. At the request of the court, the motion to admit this testimony was reduced to writing as follows. The defendant offers to prove by John S. Harris that a large majority of the whole male adult population of this state, being citizens of the United States, gave their votes for the adoption of the Constitution, commonly known and called the People's Constitution of Rhode Island, in the month of December, A.D. 1841, under which said Constitution the defendant was elected governor of this state in the month of April, 1842. And this testimony he offers in this stage of the case to repel the imputation of malicious motives and intentions as charged in the indictment, and urged by the prosecutor in behalf of the state. Mr. Harris, after the People's Legislature broke up, Governor Dorr went to Burrington Anthony's house and the next day to Mr. Bradford Allen's house to meet a number of his friends and was occupied in signing commissions and in the business of government. When this was done, he set out for Washington. He went there at the desire of his friends and in compliance with the vote of a large public meeting in Providence for the purpose of making a true representation of our affairs to the president. Was not present at the arsenal and had nothing to do with military affairs. Colonel Benjamin M. Darling recalled, was present at Federal Hill in the procession on the 16th of May in the barouche with Governor Dorr when he addressed the people. The escort were arranged in a hollow square or circle. There were 375 armed men. The line of men extended nearly around the carriage, did not hear anything said about the sword being dyed in blood. If any such expression had been used, I must have heard it, as I sat within three feet of Mr. Dorr in front. Mr. Dorr said that it had been presented to him by the brother of an officer who died in Florida. He said it had never been dishonored and never should be as long as he had it. I waved my sword and gave the signal for a cheer. 
It was a loud and hearty cheer. Mr. Dorr stood on the seat while making a speech and held up the sword when he was speaking of it. No such language was used by him concerning the sword being dyed in blood, as has been related by William P. Blodgett and E. H. Hazard. Nor did he wave the sword. His beard was very long, and he looked very dusty. Recollect Doors saying something about the 5,000 men, but not exactly his remarks. The whole proceedings on the hill lasted for about an hour. The address was not more than three-quarters of an hour long. The meeting was peaceable and orderly, heard no threats made by any of them. Don't think anyone could have stood within 20 feet without distinguishing whether Governor Dorr stood in a carriage or on a platform. Samuel H. Wales was on Federal Hill in the procession when Governor Dorr returned from Stonington. Mr. Dorr made no such remarks concerning the sword as have been stated here by Blodgett and Hazard. The principal tenor of the speech was an account of his reception in New York. In reference to the 5,000 men, he stated that he was sure of aid enough from New York to paralyze any force which the United States might use against the suffrage party in this state. Governor Dorr drew the sword and held it up. He said it belonged to an officer who died in the Florida War, and the brother of this officer had presented it to him. Mr. Dorr added that it had never been dishonored in battle, and he hoped it never would be. Mr. Dorr said that he was willing to die with that sword in his hand, if need be, to sustain the constitution of the state. I stood very near the carriage, within five feet of Mr. Dorr, inside of the military. They occupied a large space around the carriage, paid particular attention to the speech, should have heard Mr. Dorr if he had used any such expression as testified by Blodgett respecting the sword dyed in blood. Mr. Dorr appeared fatigued and covered with dust. The applause was very hearty and might have been peculiar as it was a dusty day. There was no ferocious yelling as has been described. The meeting was orderly and soon broke up. Nathan Porter followed the procession to Federal Hill, Governor Dorr stood up on the middle seat of the barouche in delivering his speech. He said it had been reported here that he had solicited 500 men from New York. That was a mistake. He could have 5,000 men, but he did not want them except to repel the force of the general government. Governor Dorr drew his sword and held it up. He said it had belonged to a brave man who had fought in the Florida War that it had never been dishonored and never should be, that he had sacrificed all in the cause except life, and that he was willing to lay that down, if need be, in the cause of the people, that the sword had been used in the cause of the country, and he was ready to use it again, if need be. The appearance of Dorr was peculiar. His face was red, and he was very dusty. The wind was high and blew his hair about. His beard was long, and he looked haggard. I remarked to someone by that I never saw Governor Dorr look so badly. He looked as one would who had been riding in the sun uncovered, thought the speech was calm and dignified and a moderate one under the circumstances. The meeting was orderly and the cheer was a loud and hearty one and seemed to come from warm and manly hearts. I stood very near Governor Dorr, have heard the statement of Blodgett, Mr. Dorr used no expression of the sword dyed in blood or gore. Junes Thurber, Jr. I am acquainted with William P. Blodgett. On Tuesday, met him between here and the park house and passed the compliments of the morning with him. Spoke to him about the death of Major Power. He said, yes, the old man was used up. I replied, yes, and I see you was pretty much used up at Dedham the other day. He said they packed a jury against him and thus convicted him. I said, well, I do not know, but they will do so here with Mr. Dorr. Blodgett replied, I hope so, by God. I said, two wrongs do not make a right. Blodgett answered, I want to pay them in their own coin. He said he had not heretofore wished Mr. Dorr convicted, but now he would do what he could, and he should not have been down here had it not been for this. Burrington Anthony 
was at home when the men returned from the arsenal. Governor Dorr left about an hour before the charter troops came up, did not say to Colonel Blodgett, as he has stated, that the men on Federal Hill at my house were drunk. May have said to him that they were very much excited, but I did not mean by liquor. I offered them nothing to drink and saw none of them at any time affected by it. Pledge myself to Colonel Blodgett and General Gibbs when the charter troops were at my house that I would endeavor to have the artillery pieces restored that afternoon as far as was in my power, but I had no command over the men. Saw a letter containing the resignation of the officers of the government put into Doar's hands at my house. A great many of Mr. Doar's men who had returned to the house had then gone away. Heard no firing. After a few men had carried the pieces back to the edge of the hill, the charter troops came up near them, and a match was then waved over a cannon pointed at them. At this they sprang aside against the fence and all went down together. The piece was not fired. Heard Governor Doar's speech delivered at Tammany Hall in New York on the 14th of May. There were 5,000 persons in and around the hall. He expressly repudiated the idea of foreign aid, except in the event of the interference of the United States in the affairs of Rhode Island. He said, as he had always said, that if the people of the state could not maintain their rights against the charter party, they did not deserve to have any. Met General William G. McNeil in New York at the Astor House. He said he had seen Governor Dorr and had omitted one thing, and that was to offer him and his friends a car to go to Providence, provided that it should not interfere with the regular train. He requested me to step up to the desk and write an order to that effect, and he signed it. He had always expressed himself as a political friend. Understood him then to be favorable to the suffrage cause. Sheriff Potter must have been mistaken as to my requesting him to prevent the people without from firing. Did not use the language attributed to me. Asked Sheriff Potter if he had any objections to the people's legislature sitting in the courthouse. Potter said he had no intimation of his being superseded as sheriff and should not relinquish the possession of it. This was on the day of the meeting of the people's legislature. I was not authorized by the vote of the House to take the State House or to use force. I was directed to ask for it. Captain Josiah Reed was captain of the chartered United Independent Company of Volunteers of the City of Providence, was on Federal Hill in the afternoon of May 17th. A member and an officer of the old artillery company told me that the company were at the armory and wanted us to come down and get their pieces, two six-pounders. Soon after, I was called into the house by the governor and received an order from him to go down and take them. Went down with my company, saw Colonel Bennett, and demanded the guns in the name of Governor Dorr. Requested me to file my men round at the back door where the guns were, and asked if I would wait about five minutes for the key, which was not there. I stated that the company had not yet made up their minds to let the guns go. Shortly after, Lieutenant Colonel Wilkinson called me into the armory and asked me if I would pledge my word that the guns should be returned to the company after we had got through with them. Told him I would, and he gave me liberty to take them. After I went out, the key not coming, another officer came out and told them to wrench the lock off the door. I ordered Sergeant Dolly to do so. While he was in the act of doing it with his bayonet, the key was found and passed out of the window to William H. Potter, who unlocked the door, and we took the guns. The guns did not belong to the state. They were the property of the artillery company. The key was in possession of Lieutenant Colonel Wilkinson, who was not at the armory at the time we went there. These brass pieces were sent to the company by General Washington to replace three iron guns which were borrowed of this company and which were lost in the sound. These cannon were taken at the surrender of Burgoyne. Was at Anthony's house previous to going to the arsenal. 
Governor Dorr was requested by the officers to remain at the house, but he refused to remain, saying that, as he had promised, he should not be found in the rear when there was danger to be met. At the arsenal ground, I was sent with a detachment and lay in ambush close by the building on one side. The plan was that when the doors were opened to run out and fire the artillery pieces, my company should rush in and take possession of the building, which I did not apprehend there was much difficulty in doing. End of section 6. Section 7 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. American State Trials, Volume 2, by John D. Lawson. Trial of Thomas Wilson Dorr for Treason, Rhode Island, 1844, Part 6. Kingsley P. Studley was a lieutenant with the volunteers and went down with them to the artillery armory to take their pieces. The detachment which went for this purpose consisted of 50 men. Thaddeus Simmons was at the arsenal within 20 feet of the cannon, was one of the guard who marched out by the side of Governor Dorr, four on each side, and was close by him from Anthony's to the arsenal. The guns were placed under the command of Lieutenant Carter. They were southeast from where some thirty men were, near a tree. Heard the orders given by someone to fire. Both guns flashed, first one and then the other. Do not know who touched them, but no, it was not Mr. Dorr. Was so near as to be positive of this. Mr. Dorr moved about the field to bring up the men. Joshua Hathaway was not at the arsenal, was at Anthony's house the first part of the evening, and the next morning when the artillery pieces were brought back, know in what state the guns were when they returned from the arsenal, as I assisted in boring them out. The difficulty with them was that the powder had moistened and dissolved and then hardened. There was no pine or other plugs found in the vents. There was nothing but powder in the vents, and they had to be bored out with a gimlet before they were serviceable. I helped do it. Have a brother named Seth, who was said to have been at the arsenal ground that night. Benjamin M. Slade was commissary at Chpatchet. When the troops disbanded, there was not more than two days' provision on hand. It was mostly obtained by voluntary subscription. Some of it in Providence, some in Woonsocket. Some was sent in by the citizens of Chapachet. There were two colored people employed in my department. The whole number of our men under arms at Chapachet was from 200 to 250. There was no chaplain on the hill. The flag was the United States flag. Some tents were borrowed from Massachusetts. The marquee was borrowed by me and Captain Landers. William H. Potter recalled, was near Governor Door at the arsenal, stood within eight or ten feet of him near the tree where the pieces were flashed. Mr. Door did not wave a torch or touch either of the pieces. If he had done so, I must have seen him. Lieutenant Carter was near them and appeared to have charge of them. William J. Miller was one of the publishers of the Providence Express in June 1842. A proclamation for convening the People's Legislature at Gloucester was sent to us on Saturday for publication. Circumstances compelled us to decline its publication. An order of Governor Dorr for the dismantlement of his military force at Chapachet was brought to the express office on Tuesday morning, June 28th, by the hands of Walter S. Burgess for publication. It was printed by us in an extra by a permit of one of the governor's council. Colonel W. H. Potter recalled, the procession in Chapachet alluded to by D.J. Pierce as being formed at the hotel and moving toward the hill was entirely a civil procession. The men in it had no arms, nor were they under orders. All persons there in the street favorable to the cause were requested to manifest it by falling in and joining a procession. Walter S. Burgess 
The relations between Mr. Dorr and myself having been of a friendly nature, I called to see him at Mr. Anthony's house on the evening of the 17th of May, 1842. There was no doubt entertained that it was his intention to take possession of the state's arsenal that night. We had a conversation on this and other subjects, in which he requested me, in case of any accident to him, to attend to his affairs and take care of the papers in his office. He directed me where to find the books and papers which were in his hands as one of the state commissioners of the Situate Bank the files of papers pertaining to his office of president of the school committee in the city of Providence, which he had filled for some considerable time, also the papers, securities, and funds belonging to the Rhode Island Historical Society of which he was then treasurer, and sundry other valuable papers relating to certain administration and guardianship accounts, particularizing the location of each and giving me the keys that led to them. Never have I seen Governor Dorr before nor since manifest any motives or intentions other than as a public officer. May 3rd, Walter S. Burgess. Just before dark, on the evening of Monday, June 27, I received a letter from Governor Dorr. It was brought to me in my office by two officers of the Charter Party, unopened. The men who brought it, one of them being a Mr. Eddy, had been intercepted. I opened it in the presence of the officers. It contained information to me of an order being given for the disbanding of the troops at Chepachet, also a copy of the original order, under sealed cover, directed to the express office for publication. These were taken immediately that evening before General McNeil and the governor and council. The next morning they were returned to me by Governor Arnold, one of the council, who requested me to leave the order at the express office and have it published. I carried it to that office, but they refused to publish it, unless by an order from the governor and council. I returned to Governor Arnold and obtained his order or permission for its publication, and again carried it to the express office, and it was soon out in an extra. This was on the morning of the 28th of June. Mr. Turner, I recall the attention of the jury to the five points which I before introduced. Namely, one, that treason was not an offense against this state, but against the United States. Two, that if any treason had been committed, an indictment could not constitutionally be found out of the county where it was charged as having been committed. Three, that at all events, such indictment wherever found could not be tried out of such county. 4. That the defendant committed no treason, but acted justifiably having performed the acts charged against him in his capacity as governor of the state, and having been duly elected and sworn under a valid constitution. 5. That there was an absence of all the motives and malice which are necessary to the existence of the offense charged. These points I propose to take up separately, and to maintain and illustrate each in its order. The Court there has been no foundation laid in the proof of facts to sustain the fourth point of justification. Mr. Turner, the testimony on this point being distinct from the rest, I had intended to reserve it until I should come to it in the proper order, but I am ready to take up the points in any order that might be preferred by the court. Staples Justice all the testimony ought certainly to be put in in this stage of the case. It would be irregular after commencing the argument of the law to return to the introduction of new proof. Mr. Turner proposed to prove by the authorities that the people had a right to adopt a constitution of government and that in the exercise of that right they did adopt a constitution on December 1841 under which the defendant derived his authority. And in proof of this fact, he proposed to offer and authenticate the votes of the people themselves in proof of said constitution. The Attorney General objected to the introduction of this testimony and asked how the votes themselves were to be proved. Mr. Dorr, 
I intend to show that the votes were received and counted, and how many there were, and for what they were given. Then I will produce the votes themselves, and lay them on the table before the jury for their inspection, and that of the court. And in the next place, if the gentlemen be not satisfied, I will call in the voters themselves severally to verify their votes, commencing at any place he may please to designate. Durfee, Chief Justice. This subject has already been gone into at large in the case of Cooley, and such testimony as is now offered was rejected upon full deliberation by the court. We cannot permit it to go to the jury. It would fail to prove the point for which it is introduced if it were admitted. For the prisoner cannot be held justified by acting under any other constitution than that of the state. This court can recognize no other than that under which it holds its existence, and must take it for granted that the government preceding the present was also the government of the state until changed in due legal course. Any irregular action without legal authority is no action at all that can be taken notice of by a court of law, who are bound by the laws and sit to administer them. It matters not, therefore, whether a majority or what majority voted for a pretended constitution, as is alleged by the prisoner, and as he now asks to be permitted to prove. The numbers are nothing. We must look to the legality of the proceeding, which, being without form of legal authority, is void and of no effect. If such proceedings should be tolerated in a court of law and be accounted to hold any man justifiable for the violation of it, then law is at an end, and general anarchy would ensue, as what had been done once could be done again, and with as good effect, so that a succession of changes might be perpetual, and there would be no permanent form of government." Of what benefit, then, to the prisoner can it be to introduce testimony which cannot support his case, if conceded to its fullest extent? The question is not what was done, but what was done according to law, and numbers, however great, cannot decide this either way. The fact is, the prisoner asks leave to bring into this court a political question which cannot be settled here, and has been settled elsewhere. If a government had been set up under what is called the People's Constitution, and they had appointed judges to give effect to their proceedings, and deriving authority from such a source, such a court might have been addressed upon a question like this, but we are not that court. We know and can know but one government, one authority in the state. We can recognize the Constitution under which we hold our places and no other. All proceedings under any other are to us as nullities. It would be improper for this court to take any other notice of them, and if we did, we could allow to them no effect or importance whatsoever. Besides, the prisoner asked to prove a law, and the highest law by parole. Was ever such a proposition before heard of in a court of justice? If there be any such constitution, it must be found at the head of the statutes of the state, and the courts are bound to take notice of it. It is one of the laws, and the highest law of the state. But we find no such law, and again, if the prisoner was governor of the state as alleged, the evidence of it is a certificate of record from the proper officer. In every point of view, therefore, the testimony now offered is inadmissible. And as before observed, this question has been fully considered in another case. The court therefore decide that the testimony offered cannot be permitted to go to the jury. Mr. Turner, although this question may have been before considered, yet in a case of this importance, we may well ask to have it brought again to the attention of the court. It is indispensable to the main point of the defense that this testimony should be allowed to go to the jury, with all the effect that it may be entitled to. If it be excluded, the defendant is cut off from the full defense to which he is entitled, and great injustice must be done him in consequence. 
We contend that he was, at the time when the offense charged against him is said to have been committed, the governor of the state, acting under valid authority, deriving his powers from a constitution, rightfully adopted by the people themselves, the highest power in the state, in the exercise of their original sovereign capacity, and overruling and superseding by that transcendent act of sovereignty all other rules and authorities whatsoever. Any objection to this testimony comes with bad grace from the prosecuting officer, who had been permitted to show that Mr. Doerr acted as governor under the forms of an election and in the presence of a legislature, also purporting to be chosen by the people under the same constitution. If Mr. Doerr so acted as we know he did, and as has been again proved here, then we ask to show why he acted and by what authority he acted, and to discuss that authority. We propose to show by most abundant authorities as a foundation for what the people did in their sovereign capacity, that they are by the theory of our institutions, and in fact, the ultimate sovereign power of the state, responsible to no higher authority except that of their creator, for the manner in which they have used this sovereign power for their own good, and for that of the state, of which they are the judges, and which judgment no other tribunal can call in question. If we cannot go into this proof, what becomes of the full, fair, and impartial trial to which the defendant is of common right entitled? Without the liberty to investigate this vital and momentous question, which involves the liberty of our state and country, this trial denigrates into a merely formal process, a ceremony before conviction, and he is to be deprived of his civil rights and subjected to the extreme infliction of the law without a hearing and without an opportunity to justify himself before the jury who are thus to decide his case without hearing the whole of it, and without the due consideration of all the points and all the arguments which is necessary to the conscientious and satisfactory discharge of the solemn and momentous duty which has been imposed upon them. And further, this is not the same court that acted upon this question on a former occasion at the trial of Colonel Cooley in Providence, the court was then acting under the charter government, which has been done away with. This court sits under a constitution from which it derives its power. It is different in name and in the number of its judges. One of the judges on the bench has never heard any discussion of the subjects under consideration in his judicial capacity. Under all these circumstances regarding the entire novelty of this case, both here and in other states, and the careful deliberation to which, in all its important aspects and bearings, as affecting the liberty and rights of the citizens of the state and country, it is so peculiarly entitled, have we not a strong claim upon the court to be heard fully and dispassionately, and to the whole extent which the investigation may require upon this the main vital question of the case? We are prepared to show most conclusively upon principle and authority that the people had a perfect right to reorganize their government as they might see fit, and that in the exercise of this right they did in fact so proceed, and did adopt a constitution under which the defendant was duly elected, and exercised his appropriate power and performed his specified duties according to the oath of office which was administered to him. Staples Justice the admission of this testimony would be permitting the prisoner to show that we are not a court. The authority of this court is derived from the constitution of the state, and that constitution itself was formed according to legal proceedings originating with the government under the charter, which has now ceased to exist. If that was no legal government, as the prisoner proposes to show, then the present is no constitution, having no rightful origin, and we as judges have no powers under it. Can we permit such a proceeding as this to have our own existence drawn into question? The acts set up by the prisoner in his justification were revolutionary in their character, and success was necessary to give them effect. 
in this event, the judges chosen would have recognized the source which created them and would have treated the acts of the government as valid. The prisoner asks us to take notice of an organization which not only did not exist rightfully, but did not exist at all. Mr. Dorr, the defendant in this case claims the right to inquire and show who are the people of the state, what they had a right to do, and what they did as the basis of justification of his course and conduct in the recent political affairs of this state. He proposes to show that the people in a political sense are the adult male population, including qualified voters and those who are not qualified, the men who do not look for their origin to the state, but to their creator, and who compose the great mass of the community, bearing its burdens, contributing to its support, the authors of its prosperity and the defenders of its rights." In the next place, it will appear if there be any virtue in the solemn declarations of popular rights, in the constitutions of the states, in the decisions of the courts, in the opinions and arguments of the most eminent jurists and statesmen, and of the greatest and best men who have adorned our history, that the people, as thus defined, are the ultimate uncontrolled sovereign power in whose hands is vested not by grant or transmission, but by the hand of God, the right, the ability, the competency to provide for their own political safety and happiness by devising and creating such forms of government as in their several communities they shall deem best and most expedient and by altering, amending, abolishing, and renewing the same at such times and in such modes as to them shall seem proper and necessary, of the propriety and necessity of all which proceedings they are the sole and exclusive judges. It will also appear, if the defendant be allowed to make out his case, that in a recent exigency the people of the state so defined and so empowered did see fit to put in exercise this original ultimate sovereign power and did form and adopt a written Republican constitution for the government of the state, under which a government was duly elected and qualified, and among the members of which the defendant accepted and exercised the office of the chief magistrate. To prove the existence and adoption of this Constitution, the votes of the people are here, and we are ready to present them to the jury. The people also are not far off and may be called upon to authenticate their own acts if they be drawn in question. Your honors say that this testimony cannot be admitted. Why not? It will unsettle the foundations of the court? Is there any justice in this objection? The court will remain just where it is until changed by competent authority, and its jurisdiction will remain the same. This objection would have seemed to carry more weight under a state of things that now no longer exists. When the court sat under the charter government, it might have said that to have that government impugned and to admit testimony to show that it was set aside and superseded would be virtually drawing into question the existence of the court. But this court does not sit under the charter government, and it can now look back with equanimity upon a past state of things and can, for the purpose of justice, inquire what rights were then gained and lost, and upon what principles the actors in the affairs of that period are to be justified or condemned, without questioning their own existence under the present Constitution, which they are bound to regard as a fact, without admitting or denying other facts present or past. The Constitution under which they act has been carried into effect, a government is in operation under it, a judiciary has been elected under it, and by what possible act of the court or jury can this constitution be changed, or that part relating to the judiciary be abolished? It is not the province of courts and juries to make or unmake constitutions. That is the work of the people. If, after examining the votes and the proofs of his election and weighing the authorities, the jury should come to the conclusion that the defendant is not guilty, what conceivable effect can this opinion have upon the stability of the court?' 
Another jury may be of the opposite opinion. Does this place the court back again where they were before and save their authority? The opinion of the jury expends itself in the particular case on trial. It cannot extend beyond it. It convicts or acquits no one else. It is very difficult to comprehend the force of this objection. Why should not a jury be permitted to investigate a question of political rights as well as a question relating to person or property? We wish to ask the jury whether, upon American principles and upon a survey of all the facts, the defendant is guilty. If they should say not, they look at the facts and the law of this case and not an inch beyond it. They affirm and deny nothing respecting the failure of the government under the people's constitution. They say simply what the defendant did he had a right to do at the time. What became of his rights or those of the people, why and how the government was overthrown, whether another constitution was rightfully or wrongfully set up, and whether this court are to continue any longer in existence are all matters with which the verdict has nothing to do. The present constitution is a fact, which is taken for granted on all hands. It exists and is made effectual by a government operating under it. No other constitution has now any operation, and there is no other government in actual competition. But is this state of facts to decide a question of right? Because the constitution and government under it have been set aside by force, and because through the fault or misfortune of its supporters, and by external interference the plan of reform in this state failed of success, is the opposite forcible success the criterion of of all our rights? It may be true that the people have been defeated or have defeated themselves and have acquiesced or are disposed to acquiesce in a new order of things, and yet it may be also true that they were in the right and that those who attempted to serve them in 1842 were in the right, and this is what we now desire the opportunity to prove to a jury of this country. The court have taken an oath to support the Constitution under which they act, and they cannot escape from it while they continue to act, and until they are relieved by a competent authority. In what respect, then, can they be affected by any argument to show that the old charter government was two years ago rightfully superseded by that under the People's Constitution? If the court be convinced by this argument, still they are held by the obligation to the Constitution which they have assumed, and which they have assumed without qualification, or any reference whatever to its origin, or the question whether the charter government was valid or not at the time this Constitution was formed. If the court be not convinced, then they remain just as they were before, but whether convinced or not, they still remain a court, and the defendant, if heard, has the advantage and the justice of a full hearing in what he deems the most vital portion of his case. In addition to this, it may be remarked that the question of the effect upon the court of the people's constitution could not be a practical one, even if the court were now sitting under the charter government. For by the people's constitution, the judges were continued in their places until a new election should take place, and the legislature under this constitution made no such election, so that, in the case supposed, the court would be as much the court of the constitution as of the charter. But beyond all this, taking for granted that the court, by permitting the defendant's justification to go to the jury, would be permitting its own legal existence to be drawn in question, what right have the court to regard any real or supposed consequences, or to interpose them as barriers to a full investigation of all the principles and facts of the case? The court sit to do justice, let what will come of it, and let justice be done, though the heavens fall. What reason is there why a court should not hear all objections in good faith, not only against the soundness and legality of their decisions and against their jurisdiction, but against their own qualifications or legal competency or existence as judges? Some years ago, there was a controversy concerning what was called the Perpetuation Act. 
relating to the holding over of a part of the government till a new election could be effected by voters. Now suppose this court not to have held over by operation of law, but by act of such a perpetuated government, and the question had arisen whether the court had a valid existence, and its powers were legally continued, would not your honors have listened to such a question? If you had entertained any serious doubts as to your legal competency and the validity of your powers under such an act, would you not have hesitated to proceed or have postponed your proceeding until the difficulty could be removed? Suppose that it should be now suggested that your honors are sitting here under an election in which the prescriptions of the Constitution were not complied with or without being properly qualified and without commissions, would not such a suggestion deserve and require your attention? And, if well-founded, would not your action as a court be at once arrested? This doctrine that a person accused of treason cannot be permitted fully to defend himself, because if he do, certain consequences may follow, and the jury may take a different view of the constitutional or legal question proposed from that of the court has no limitations and may be carried out in their discretion so as to work an entire denial of justice and defeat of the trial by jury. If one consequence is to be regarded, why not another? A learned judge has recently observed that insanity and the alibi have become the castor and pollux of the criminal court so that the guilty have often escaped improperly under these forms of defense. Why not say at once that hereafter those grounds of defense shall be no longer permitted in this court, because they have been and may be employed to defeat the public justice? As to the proof of the people's constitution and the election of the governor under it by parole, which is deemed objectionable, the difficulty will be at once removed by presenting a copy of this constitution and a certificate of the election of the defendant as governor under the hand of the person who was secretary of state under said constitution in 1842. These your honors, of course, will not admit, and being thus deprived of the shortest and easiest mode of reaching the court and jury, we will proceed with parole proof, if we are permitted in the way that foreign laws are sometimes proved. Your honors, not regarding the Constitution and election as any part of the legal record of the state, this difficulty is not of our own making." It has been already submitted to your consideration that this is not the same court that before decided the question now in argument. This court derives its origin from a different source, and there is a new member on the bench. The question before you may be regarded as new. But it is said that the people of this state did not succeed in 1842. They did not permanently establish their constitution and government. And what of this? Is might the standard of right in a country of republics like this? Does the existence of a right cease with the establishment, possession, and enjoyment of it? Does success create rights or confirm them? In despotic countries, where rights are only concessions from the hand of force, this doctrine of contingent rights may meet with some countenance from the state of affairs and the long-suffering patience of the people, but it has no application here. If the defendant had a right to proceed as he did, in the discharge of his appointed duties, defeat did not take it away, and he ought to be permitted to assert it in his defense against the accusation which here rests upon him. It will not do to say that this is a political question which has been settled elsewhere. This is not an answer to the present application. One party carried the day and the other lost it. Is it to be asserted that the party which ought to succeed is always successful? And that which does not succeed is always in the wrong. 
If not, then so far as this case is concerned, the question has not been settled. And if, as your honor says, it be political, then political facts and arguments are appropriate to it, and more especially as addressed to a political jury. To say that the people's constitution was formed without authority from the government then existing, and was consequently null and void, and that therefore it would be of no benefit to the defendant to admit the proof of the facts, which show that this constitution was actually the work of the people, is begging the question. We deny the assertion that the people cannot act for themselves in the construction and change of government without the permission of that government. The court cannot take this for granted with our consent. We strenuously assert and stand ready to prove precisely the contrary, and by weight of authority an opinion that has never yet been successfully resisted. The defendant does not ask as a favor or indulgence, but claims as the citizen of a free country the right to show the court the entire validity of all the proceedings of the people in the adoption of their constitution, and the same right to exhibit the evidence of their votes and of his own election. There is no conjecture in a proof like this. The people set their hands to the work of the Constitution. The prisoner offers their signatures to the jury. To refuse this inquiry of law and this examination of facts is to cut off the right arm of his defense. Durfee, Chief Justice. We have decided this question. I am astonished that men of high intellect can take such views of it as they have. We cannot admit this testimony. In this stage of the proceedings, we cannot hear the argument to show its admissibility. After verdict, we shall be disposed to entertain the question. Mr. Dorr inquired whether this decision to hear no argument and to reject the testimony offered was a decision of the whole court? Brayton Justice said that it was. Mr. Dorr, I have sought to conceal nothing in this case. I deny nothing except the falsehoods with which it has been sought to surround it. I should be the last man I trust to make any such denial, believing as I did, and as I now do, that I was in the right and that my opponents were in the wrong. I have accordingly claimed here the right fully to justify myself to the jury, both in law and fact. Your honors have come to a different conclusion, but not more honestly than I have to the opposite of it. As you refuse to permit me to justify myself, I shall now once more offer the same testimony in a more general form than when Mr. Harris was called upon the stand to repel the charge of treasonable intentions. Levying war is not enough. In the language of Chief Justice Marshall, the levying war must be with the intent to commit treason, and treason is not to be inferred from an assemblage in arms without an examination of all the circumstances and reasons that led to it. Mr. Turner then made a third offer as follows. The defendant offers to prove by the votes of the people to be produced and verified that a large majority of the whole resident adult male population of the state, being citizens of the United States, gave their votes for the adoption of the Constitution called the People's Constitution of Rhode Island in the month of December 1841, and also to prove that under said Constitution, the defendant was elected governor of this state in the month of April 1842, and this testimony he now offers to repel the imputation of malicious and treasonable motives and intentions, as charged in the indictment and urged by the prosecution in behalf of the state. The court overruled the offer of the testimony, and the defendant accepted as before. Mr. Turner then proposed to offer to the jury a copy of the People's Constitution to show that the government provided under it was Republican in its form, agreeably to the requirements of the Constitution of the United States. The offering was overruled by the court as being immaterial, irrelevant, and inadmissible. Defendant accepted. Mr. Turner then offered the message of Governor Dorr delivered May 5, 1842, before the General Assembly under the People's Constitution to explain the motives and objects of the defendant. 
ruled out an exception taken by defendant. Mr. Turner then claimed of the court, in behalf of the defendant, the right of defendant and his counsel to address the jury on all matters of law involved in the case, as their undoubted privilege, inasmuch as the jury, in all capital cases, are the judges both of the law and of the fact, the province of the court being in such cases to lay before the jury their views of the law, and of the jury to judge them as they do of the testimony." Durfee, Chief Justice. The court entertain a different opinion. We must have the duty and responsibility of deciding upon the law. Mr. Doerr urged upon the court his right to be heard by the court upon this question and to argue the law to the jury who did not sit in the box as ciphers, but to hear, judge, and determine for themselves. If they could not do this, then as the court has made up their minds, the jury were to be governed accordingly, and this was but the shadow of a trial. Durfee Chief Justice, this question has been fully and ably argued in a former case before this court and must be considered as settled. Mr. Dorr, until it be overruled, the decisions of the court are not irreversible, and as there are no published reports from which we can learn the reasons of them, there is good cause for asking to be heard in a case of this importance. Mr. Turner, I have authorities that will convince the court if I can be permitted to produce them, and if your honors will listen to them, which will satisfy your minds that the prisoner has this right to go to the jury in a capital case upon the law, and that the jury have a right to judge of it, however they may be advised by the court." I have among the cases which I wish to bring your attention the impeachment of Judge Chase of the Supreme Court of the United States for official misconduct, one of the principal charges against whom was that in the trial of Fries, charged with treason, he refused to permit the counsel to argue the law to the jury. His own counsel on this occasion admitted the right of Fries to have the law argued to the jury, but denied that he, Chase, had refused to permit it to be so argued. Hail Justice! This state must have been extremely ignorant when they passed a law making it a special duty of this court to instruct the jury in matters of law. This question was settled at Providence in a licensed case some time ago. Mr. Doerr urged upon the court his right to have the authorities read and to go on with an argument upon them. Durfee, Chief Justice. Well, go on. Staples Justice. I am opposed to a re-argument of this question at the present time. In the course of a jury trial, I am willing to hear it re-argued when the court are at leisure. Hail Justice, nor am I disposed to hear a re-argument during the trial when this question has once been solemnly settled. At a proper time it can be heard, but it ought not to be heard in the hurry of a jury trial. Mr. Doerr, it falls strangely upon the ear of a man in my position when I hear the judge of a court, in a case of this kind and involving principles of such moment, make use of an expression like this, the hurry of this trial. I must be hurried through to judgment then, without a hearing, and after conviction I may be heard? Is the liberty or life of a man to be disposed of in this way? If there are any reasons why a conviction should not take place, why should they not be heard now? What reparation is it after conviction to hear the reasons why it was unjust? This is literally, according to a common observation, hanging a man first and trying him afterwards. Footnote. Here, one of the spectators remarked in an audible voice, that is the way of this court. The court ordered him removed, but he presently returned with the sheriff and made an apology stating that he was in the habit of speaking out and had not the proper command of himself. He was permitted to return to his seat. End footnote. Staples Justice The jury are kept here under much restraint, 
And can they be kept here week after week while we are hearing arguments which belong to another stage of the case? Mr. Dorr, the jury do not complain. I think they will hear all my defense patiently. Staples Justice, they are men. Mr. Dorr, I also am a man and claim the rights of one. Mr. Turner, we ask an opportunity to convince the court by the authority of the greatest judges that have ever lived in this country, Durfee Chief Justice. The Constitution of this state settles our duty to charge the jury upon the law. And we are to sit here with our juries receiving the law from judges of other states. The only duty of the jury is to take the law as given by this court and to judge whether it be applicable to the facts. Mr. Dorr, I wish to give some reasons for the position taken from high sources. Do the court refuse to hear authority and argument? Durfee Chief Justice, the court decide not to hear any argument upon this question. The defendant accepted to the ruling of the court. The court, after some consultation together, announced that they would hear an argument on the first point, which sets forth that treason can only be committed against the United States, as this was a new question not heretofore discussed before them. Mr. Turner said he should be ready to argue this point in the morning, and the court adjourned. May 4th. Mr. Turner and Mr. Dorr argued at length that treason could not be committed against a state, but only against the United States. Mr. Turner then took up the second point, that the Algerine law, so-called, which makes political offenses indictable out of the county where charged to be committed, is against common right, unconstitutional and void, and claimed to be heard upon it. The court declined to hear any argument upon this point, as they had already expressed the adverse opinion upon it in a former case. Mr. Dorr urged upon the court the importance of this point, and earnestly contended for his right to be heard upon it. If he were wrongfully indicted here, the whole proceeding was invalid and void, and a fair trial was not a trial pursued contrary to law. The Chief Justice remarked that this was not the proper time to hear an argument on this point, but that it could be properly considered after verdict, should this be desired by the defendant. Staples Justice remarked that this and other questions, which would now interrupt the case, would be properly heard after verdict and before sentence. Mr. Dorr said he despaired of being able to say anything which could change the determination of the court, though he had expected to be heard upon this question in this stage of the case after having withdrawn his plea to the jurisdiction. He was now satisfied from the action of the court that they intended to withhold from him the fair trial to which by law and justice he was entitled. Staples Justice if I were in your place, Mr. Chief Justice, I would not hear such language as that from counsel, whatever the prisoner may take the liberty of saying. Mr. Turner then took up the third point. If the defendant were properly indicted here, he could not, according to law, be tried here, as the Algerine Act is in derogation of the right of a prisoner in the county where the offense is charged to be committed and had made no provision for a trial out of the county. The Attorney General remarked that this and the preceding point were involved in the plea to the jurisdiction which the prisoner had withdrawn. Mr. Dorr said the plea was withdrawn in order to obtain a speedy trial by jury, but that he had not waived his right to raise the question in another stage of the case. Mr. Turner referred to some authorities to show that this point, respecting the jurisdiction of the court, might be raised during the trial of the case. The court refused to hear any argument until after verdict, as they had considered and decided this point in a former case. Mr. Bosworth for the state admitted that treason could only be committed against the sovereign power of a state, and also that the sovereign power in a state resides in the people as organized and defined by law, 
and it was therefore unnecessary to consider or reply to the long list of authorities which the defendant and his counsel had introduced. He must, however, deny in toto the doctrine of defendant's counsel that the whole people of the United States are sovereign in this state. The states were as sovereign as ever within their own jurisdiction, although they had given up certain powers to the general government, which was also a sovereign, but not over the states. What reason is there why acts which amount to treason should not be punished as such by a state? Without this power to punish, a state cannot protect, defend, or preserve itself. Treason may as well be committed against the state as against the United States, and the power of punishing it has not been surrendered to the United States. The Constitution defines treason against the United States only, and it also provides that a person charged in any state with treason, etc., and who flees from the same into another, shall be delivered up on demand of the executive to the state having jurisdiction of the crime, thus recognizing the offense of treason against a state. Besides this, in many of the state constitutions, and in many more of the state laws, treason is defined and punished as a crime against the state as well as against the United States, when it takes that direction. Writers on law also so regard it, and in proof of this he read a number of authorities. The Attorney General offered to put into the case the proclamation of General Jackson against South Carolina at the period of a threatened nullification. The court said it was hardly an authority. Mr. Dorr did not object, but said if it were admitted, he should offer other messages and documents of that distinguished individual. The Attorney General did not put it in. End of Section 7. Section 8 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rutger. American State Trials, Volume 2, by John D. Lawson. Trial of Thomas Wilson Dorr for Treason, Rhode Island, 1844, Part 7. May 6. Mr. Dorr spoke at considerable length at the close of the question on his side, respecting treason as an offense against the United States and not against a state. Mr. Turner, gentlemen of the jury, you will recollect that in the first remarks that I made in opening the defense of the prisoner at bar, I said that I proposed to rest that defense on five points which were then stated to you. First, that in this country treason is an offense against the United States only and cannot be committed against an individual state. It was my purpose, and we deem it the right of the prisoner, to have argued this, as well as the other questions of the law directly to you, as the judges in all capital trials, as well of the law as of the fact. But we were overruled by the court and permitted only to argue it to the court in your hearing. What their decision may be will be made known to you in their general charge. If it sustains the ground we have taken, then you can only acquit the prisoner, because the state courts can have no jurisdiction over the offense laid in the indictment. Upon the second point of the proposed defense, viz., that the fourth section of the Act of Rhode Island of March 1842, entitled An Act Relating to Offenses Against the Sovereign Power of the State, is unconstitutional and void as destructive of the common right of trial by jury, which was a fundamental part of the English Constitution at the Declaration of Independence and has ever since been a fundamental law in Rhode Island. The court would not suffer us to use argument to you, as it was a question of law, nor would they, for reasons which you heard, permit us to argue it to them, on the ground that it was a closed question, decided by them after solemn argument in another case. A similar decision has also been made on the third point, that that act, if constitutional, gave this court no jurisdiction to try this indictment in the county of Newport, all the overt acts being therein charged as committed in the county of Providence. <clears throat> 
because being also a matter of law, to be argued to the court, they will not interrupt the progress of the trial to hear it re-argued at the present time. Upon the fourth point, that the defendant acted justifiably as governor of the state, under a valid constitution, rightfully adopted, which he was sworn to support, which was the right arm of our defense, and which, if made good by the evidence, all which we had at command, must have acquitted the prisoner. The court, by ruling out that evidence as irrelevant and inadmissible, have very much abbreviated the labors of us both, and having deprived us of all the technical and purely legal grounds of defense, leave us none except the first and the last, that the evidence does not support the charge of treasonable and criminal intent in the defendant. On this point alone has all the testimony as well for the government as for the defendant been introduced. It has at no time constituted any part of the prisoner's plan of defense against this indictment to disavow or deny any act by him done, nor would he allow us to do for him that which he would not do himself. All the prominent and leading facts of the case he avows and justifies, and to save himself from misconstructions and false imputations, he himself presented evidence before you for the purpose of removing false impressions, disabusing the minds of the jury and the public, and of placing himself, his character, and his cause before you in a right point of view. With the same view also it is, that I will ask your consideration of some part of the testimony in the case. If the defendant, in what he has done himself or commanded others to do, has not acted justifiably and from a high sense of right and duty, he must suffer the consequences of his acts. But if the whole evidence and circumstances go to show that he has throughout acted justifiably, without traitorous intent, and believing himself to be right, with every reason so to believe, then you will give a verdict in his favor accordingly. The counsel on behalf of the state have been permitted to introduce testimony before you to show a criminal intent on the part of the prisoner as far back as the 3rd of May, the time when the legislature first met under the People's Constitution at Providence for the purpose of organizing the state government according to the provisions of that constitution. It is proper, therefore, for me to carry your attention to the testimony back to the same period. It is in evidence that on that occasion, Governor Dorr and the members-elect of the legislature passed from the Hoyle Tavern on Christian Hill through several of the streets of the city of Providence to a building called the Foundry, where they were to convene, attended by a numerous procession of citizens, an attempt was made by the witness boroughs to give the affair something of a warlike character, but the testimony of Salisbury and Carter place it in its true light. It was a civic procession, with a military escort in honor of the occasion, and to manifest respect in the usual way. There was nothing extraordinary or unusual about it. It was just like that which in a few days will in all probability attend the assembly here, at the organization of the state government for the ensuing political year, according to a long-established custom. And all the testimony agrees that it was conducted in the most orderly manner. The evidence of the witnesses as to the transaction and proceedings at the foundry fully establishes the facts, that the votes given in the election were duly returned, committed, counted, and reported, that Mr. Dorr with others was declared duly elected, that he took an oath of office, that proclamation of his election was made, and that all was done for the full and complete organization of the government, required by the Constitution, with the formalities and ceremonies usual on such occasions. The organization was perfected, and all the government and the two houses acted in every respect like other legislative bodies, and as though they had a perfect right so to act. Governor Dorr delivered an address of the usual character. Laws were enacted and others repealed or amended. Resolutions were passed. Officers, both civil and military, were elected under the new constitution. And according to the ancient usages of the state, the usual committees were appointed to attend to the transfer of the public property and records from the old to the new officers. In fact, everything that a new legislature could rightfully do was done in a legislative and proper manner. 
The prisoner was called and treated as the governor of the state, and having received a greater majority than had ever before been given to anyone for the same office, he had every reason to believe and did truly believe that he was a constitutional legal governor, elected by the free votes of the free people of a free state. There can then be no presumption drawn from these facts that he possessed at that time the traitorous intent charged in the indictment. If he was vested with rightful authority as governor, then he acted rightfully in attempting to enforce that authority. His intention to take possession of the public property for the uses of the state was fully warranted by the provisions of the Constitution under which he acted, and which, as has been shown, he was sworn to support, as well as by a resolution by the Foundry Legislature at that time. Shortly after the adjournment of the Foundry Legislature, it is in evidence that the prisoner left the state, and it has been charged by the prosecution that he escaped from the state to avoid apprehension, to excite sympathy, and to solicit aid in New York, Philadelphia, and elsewhere in, f in furtherance of treasonable purposes and by the introduction of foreign mercenaries to subvert and overthrow the charter government of the state by force of arms. Upon this point, gentlemen, the evidence is that, in consequence of indications received, that the power and force of the United States would be put in requisition to sustain the charter government and to defeat the operation of the People's Constitution at a large or numerous meeting of the Suffrage Association of the City of Providence, a resolution was passed unanimously requesting the prisoner to go to Washington and disabuse the president of the gross misrepresentations under which he was supposed to act, and to explain there and elsewhere the true nature and points of the question at issue between the two parties who were contending for supremacy in this state. The prisoner in a few days left the state and went to Washington in compliance with the request before mentioned, and on his return, whilst in New York, he addressed a very great assemblage at Tammany Hall, explanatory of the situation of affairs in Rhode Island. The counsel for the state have said it was a harangue soliciting aid in men and money to carry on a war against his fellow citizens in this state but it is in evidence by Burrington Anthony Esquire, who was present and heard the address, that Governor Dorr in express terms repudiated the idea of using any force from without the state except the contingency of the troops of the United States being brought to support the charter government, in which case he should expect and gladly receive the aid and assistance of the other states. Pursuing the chronological order of events, the evidence proves that on the 16th day of May, Mr. Dorr arrived in Rhode Island by the Stonington train of cars, attended by a few friends who had met him for that purpose at Stonington. He was received at the depot in Providence by a large concourse of his fellow citizens and friends. The whole number assembled from curiosity or sentiment of respect was unquestionably very great. Though no witness has attempted to fix the number, a procession, however, was formed to escort him to the place of his temporary residence at Mr. Anthony's on Federal Hill in that city. This procession, according to the testimony of the witnesses, was composed of from 1,200 to 1,800 men. In all probability, considering the population of the city, they might have amounted to 1,500, a portion of whom, say 300 or 400, were under arms, as is usual in Rhode Island, and I believe everywhere did escort duty on that occasion. There was an attempt on the part of the government, but wholly without success, to prove that on this occasion the military portion of the procession was furnished with ball cartridges, and thereby to give it a warlike, hostile, and treasonable character. But the whole evidence on this point, when taken together, shows that like the one before mentioned, its sole purpose was respect and honor to the chief magistrate and not war upon the citizens or treason to the state. When the procession arrived on Federal Hill, 
it is in evidence that the prisoner from the carriage in which he rode, surrounded first by the military, next by the unarmed procession, and last by the spectators at large, except that a very few personal friends were surrounding the barouche within the military lines, that the prisoner, I say, addressed the assemblage at considerable length, giving in detail a report of his proceedings during his visit to Washington, his reception in Philadelphia, New York, and elsewhere. The address delivered by Mr. Dorr on the occasion has been the source of much misrepresentation, not entirely confined to irresponsible newspaper publications, but widely circulated throughout the state and the country. He is represented as having, while abroad, excited sympathy and solicited the aid of men and money to carry into effect the government under the People's Constitution against that portion of the citizens of Rhode Island which adhered to the charter government. And through the instrumentality of such means to effect his purpose by force of arms and civil war, the opening counsel for the government took the same ground, and the effort on their part has been made to support such representations by proof. The falsity of these statements, gentlemen, is clearly established by the testimony of the government witnesses. On this point, the testimony of Mr. Pierce, who was in New York, Philadelphia, and Washington at the same time with Mr. Dorr, and who was also one of the commissioners sent to communicate with President Tyler on the subject of Rhode Island affairs, is clear and explicit. Quote, the prisoner repudiated the idea of bringing force from other states, unless in the event of the interference of the general government, end quote. Mr. Burrington Anthony, who heard Mr. Dorr's address delivered at Tammany Hall in the city of New York, the tenor of which Mr. Dorr was recapitulating at Federal Hill, uses the language, quote, he repudiated the idea of bringing forces from without the United States unless to repel the force of the United States. These two witnesses summoned by the government testify to the expressions of the prisoner made before and at the time of the Tammany Hall address, while the only testimony of a contrary character is that of Colonel W. P. Blodgett and Edward H. Hazard, to which, as it is relied on by the government, I will ask your attention for a moment. Mr. Blodgett says, quote, The prisoner said he had been accused of having procured the aid of 500 men from abroad, but the charge was false. He had been promised the aid of 5,000 men and could have them at any time. He drew his sword and said it had been dipped in blood, and rather than yield the rights of the people of Rhode Island, it should be buried in gore to its hilt. I cannot recollect his other expressions used at that time. End quote. Quote, I heard no reference to the general government, end quote. Mr. Hazard's testimony is to the same effect, and in nearly the same words, he, however, added, quote, I am not positive that he made any explanation, end quote. And on cross-examination, he said, quote, I have no recollection that the prisoner said the aid would be furnished him in the event of the interference of the general government. He might have so qualified it, end quote. These are the only witnesses sworn in behalf of the state who have testified to this point, except Orson Moffat, whose testimony is quite vague and indefinite. On the other hand, gentlemen, and in confirmation of the statements sworn by Messrs. Pierce and Anthony, we have the testimony of Colonel B. M. Darling, Colonel S. Wales, Mr. Anthony, and Mr. N. Porter. Colonel Darling sat in the barouche in which Mr. Dorr was standing at the time. The other three witnesses stood around it, within the space occupied by the armed escort, whilst their own showing, Mr. Blodgett and Hazard, as mere spectators, or rather hearers, were situated entirely without the circle formed by fifteen or eighteen hundred men, who had composed the procession. They must, therefore, have labored under great disadvantages in hearing accurately, and may have been mistaken." I think, and fancy you will think, they must have been mistaken. Because, gentlemen of the jury, you will recollect what was sworn to by Mr. James Thurber, Jr., in relation to Colonel Blodgett, who, smarting under a conviction of kidnapping at a court in Dedham, come up here to procure the conviction of the prisoner, if he could.' 
You can judge then under what feelings he must have testified on this trial, and you could not but notice the manner of Mr. Hazard, his apparent willingness to put into this case much that as a lawyer himself he must have been sensible was not legal testimony. What had the foolish fears of Joseph Sweet to do with the crime of treason charged against the prisoner by this indictment? What a cutler said about Parmenter buying a pistol, or the flood of tears that deluged Waybosset Street, and who, on another judicial trial before him, is reported to have said that he, quote, did not care a damn for the letter of the law, end quote. The evidence is with you and will decide whether in any degree the expressions of the prisoner on that occasion support the allegation of criminal and traitorous intent charged in the indictment. It is in the evidence that when speaking of the apprehended interference of the President with the United States troops in favor of the charter government, Mr. Dorr represented such to be the state of public feeling abroad that in that event he should call on other states for aid in the cause of the people against the President, and such had been the assurance given him that he could rely not on 500 only in such event, but on 5,000 or more if he wanted them. But as between the two parties in this state, the suffrage party and the charter party, the former being the large majority needed no aid, and if they did not choose to maintain their own rights, they were unfit to enjoy them. But if the president should employ United States troops to suppress the people's constitution and the government under it, other states would be then equally interested and would be called on for aid. In such case, the question would be entirely changed, because if the president could, in this summary way, decide on the validity of the new constitution of Rhode Island, he might do the same of other states also. How far the president, by the course he did pursue, by the aid he gave and promised, and by ordering at that time United States troops of a certain description into Rhode Island succeeded in the overthrow of the people's constitution is not a fit subject of inquiry here. It is, however, a subject now undergoing inquiry before a committee of Congress. But, gentlemen, further use has been made of the proceedings on the 16th day of May. And in order to give plausibility to the charge of long premeditated treasonable intents on the part of the prisoner, the same witnesses have sought to represent him in manner and action as a desperado and a fiend, a man bent on destruction, reckless of civil and social duties, wantonly regardless of human life, and a slave to the worst sort of mad ambition. They have commented on his fiendish looks and appearance whilst making his address, and have spoken of the cheers with which some passages of it were received by the audience, as the yells of fiends from the infernal regions. Although I live through the log cabin and hard cider campaign, I have little knowledge of such things. These gentlemen, however, seem well acquainted with the appearance of yells of fiends, but I shall leave you to compare their testimony with that of Darling, Wales, and Porter, who described the day as dusty, the wind very fresh, and Mr. Doris having been riding bareheaded in an open barouche through nearly the whole city of Providence. And you will then say whether the facts and proof before you will warrant you in drawing the same conclusion as they seem to have drawn from the prisoner's appearance. The next appears in evidence that on the afternoon of the next day, the 17th of May, the prisoner in broad and open day sent a small detachment of men from Federal Hill to take possession of the cannon of the United Train of Artillery in the name and for the use of the state. The result of a deliberation previously had by Governor Dorr and a council of his officers. It has been charged by the prosecution that these guns were stolen, and it constitutes one of the many calumnies which have been heaped upon the head of my distinguished client. If the prisoner was governor of this state, he not only had a right to order possession of these guns to be taken if they belonged to the state, but he was bound to do so by his oath of office as well as by a special resolve of the Foundry Legislature. There was, however, nothing secret, felonious, or like stealth to mark the transaction, notwithstanding Colonel Blodgett says they were stolen. 
in the first place, the guns did not belong to the state, but to the company. They were taken, as appears from the testimony of Captain Reed and Lieutenant Studley, by an arrangement made with the prisoner, by consent of all members of the company. The key was passed to them to open the door for the purpose, and has been stated all was done in open daylight, in the very heart of the city of Providence, without any attempt at privacy or concealment. Upon such evidence can you believe that these guns were feloniously taken, that the prisoner to accomplish any object, however important to his estimation, could commit a felony of that description? You do not believe it, gentlemen, nor does any one who has ever known him. The foul and slanderous charge has been made and reiterated against him solely for the purpose of attaching a stigma to the purity of his motives and the honorable consistency of his character. It has also further appeared in evidence that at the Council of Officers mentioned, it was determined that on the same night of the 17th of May, 1842, an attack should be made on the state arsenal, situated not far from Federal Hill, where were kept in deposit the arms belonging to the state, with a view to obtain possession of them, and thereby prevent their being turned by the charter government against that established under the people's constitution, and secure the use of them for its support against any unwarranted interference on the part of the president in the pending difficulties. It was known that aid and support had been pledged from that quarter to Governor King, and it was also known, as has been shown by the evidence, that the arsenal was manned, to what extent was uncertain, and under the command of a brave officer, Colonel Leonard Blodgett, who has been examined before you as a witness for the government. You are in no danger, I think, of mistaking him for the other Colonel Blodgett. With a view to the contemplated attack, the cannon mentioned had been procured and other necessary arrangements made or ordered by the prisoner. It also appears by the testimony of Colonel Carter, a witness summoned on the part of the state, that when it was understood that Governor Dorr intended to conduct the attack in person, he, Carter, and a number of the officers present endeavored to dissuade him from so doing, as unnecessarily exposing the person of the commander-in-chief, to all which the prisoner so liberally slandered by cowards, made this pithy reply, quote, that he had often publicly stated at the townhouse that when danger should happen he wished to be found anywhere but in the rear that he should be as good as his word and would not send others where he was not willing to go himself, end quote. You will bear in mind also, gentlemen, as relating to this period of time, the testimony of Walter S. Burgess, Esquire, by which it appears that the prisoner on the evening of that day, previous to the advance upon the arsenal, had an interview with his confidential friend, the witness, and with him made all the necessary arrangements of his business concerns, private, professional, and fiduciary, for the worst and most fatal event. It seems the prisoner at that time held several important trusts, yet on the very eve of a desperate adventure, as though to give the lie to all the floating calumnies against him, he could deliberately arrange and secure guard all the diversified trusts confided to him, whether of pecuniary or public nature, exemplifying by that act the high and honorable character of his own mind. To return, however, to the attack on the arsenal. The number of men engaged in that attack has been greatly exaggerated and is differently estimated by the witnesses who have been called to the stand, as well by the prisoner as by the government. On the part of the government witnesses, they are variously estimated at from 300 to 500. Henry S. Hazard says 400 or 500. George O. Byrne says 400 or 500, and a large body unarmed. On the other hand, we have the testimony of Colonel Carter, Darling, and Aldrich, all of whom were present taking part in the affair, and as you will observe, had much better means of knowing the actual number, who estimate them from 200 to 250. None go beyond that number, and Colonel Carter swears that before they left Federal Hill, he counted them by sections and found their number to be 234. 
so that it seems that it could not have exceeded 250 men. It had also appeared in evidence before you that the night of this attack could not have been selected on account of its darkness, as the first part of it was moonlight, and that after the moon set, a heavy dense fog came on, settled on the earth, and enveloped everything in its folds. So noticeable was it that Colonel Carter, in speaking of it, said, It seemed like an interposition of divine providence. The witnesses agree that the force under the command of the prisoner on arriving near the arsenal took their position in its front, within musket shot of its walls, the two pieces of artillery on a line, at some distance asunder, leveled at or flanking the door or gateway, and a small party of infantry lying in ambush on the ground at the left in advance and quite near the gate, so as to rush in whenever that should be opened to return the fire of the assailants. These dispositions having been made, the prisoner directed the usual and proper formalities in attacking a garrison to be observed. An officer with a flag of truce was sent to demand a surrender of the arsenal, which was refused. Nothing then remained but to take it by force of arms, or for the prisoner to suffer the people's constitution and the government organized under it to fall to the ground. So as it depended on him, he resolved on the former alternative. The plan was to make a simultaneous attack with the artillery for the purpose of forcing the doors of the arsenal, or cause the defenders to throw them open to return the fire, and then for the flanking party lying in ambush, as has been stated, to rush in at once and overpower the men who are in possession of the lower floor of the arsenal, the number of whom must necessarily be very limited, when all those in the upper part of the building could, in the end, do nothing but surrender. It was, however, ascertained, in consequence of the density of the fog and darkness of the night, that a change of position of the two pieces of artillery was desirable, and they were severally removed nearer to each other, and more directly in front of the arsenal gates, remaining, according to the testimony, about twenty feet apart, or as near as they could be conveniently worked. In the meantime, it appears that portions of men, especially after the return of the flag of truce, availing themselves of the surrounding obscurity, began to retire, some leaving the field entirely and others seeking shelter behind piles of wood that were somewhere near. Even the gallant Colonel Despo, according to Carter's testimony, who commanded a volunteer company of 90 men, about two-fifths of the whole force, then before the arsenal, awakes suddenly to the idea that there was danger there, and marches his men from the field. Colonel Wheeler, who had been entrusted by the prisoner with immediate command of the attack, who had himself sent to demand the surrender of the arsenal, and who probably thought discretion the better part of valor, before Colonel Carter could look the further end of the line and back, had gone off in the fog. Finding that the commanding Colonel Wheeler and Colonel Despo with his command had left the field covered by the fog, if not with laurels, parties of other men followed and passed Carter, who had gone to persuade Despo to return, so that when the moment arrived for firing to commence, the force of the prisoner had dwindled down from 250 to from 40 to 50 men only, and the command of them was by the prisoner conferred on Colonel Carter. When the order was given to fire, the pieces in succession flashed only, and being reprimed flashed again, both pieces thus proving unserviceable, at least for the time being. In consequence of these misadventures, and the delays occasioned by them, the time for successful action had passed. It was now after daylight, the force remaining was totally inadequate, the men hungry and tired, the fog liable to disperse in a moment, and the city troops might place themselves between two fires whenever they chose to do so. Under this accumulation of untoward circumstances, the prisoner felt himself compelled to order a retreat, which was accordingly executed with only about fifty men, Colonel Carter with a part of them carrying off one of the guns and the prisoner with the remaining men assisted in taking off the last, reaching Anthony's on Federal Hill at about sunrise on the morning of the 18th. Such, gentlemen, is the history of the attack on the arsenal, furnished by the evidence in the cause.
You will, however, recollect, gentlemen, that you were told by the opening counsel for the state that, quote, the prisoner sought the bad eminence of distinction in crime, end quote, end quote, and descended from the dignity of a rebel commander and condescended with his own hand to apply the match to light the torch of civil war, end quote. The uncalled for and untoward coarseness of these epithets will be passed over without notice. The language was used as applying to the conduct of the prisoner on this occasion, and with much of a similar character, was doubtless intended to create in your minds the most unfavorable prepossessions toward him and his general character and conduct. The prisoner is charged with having taken in his own hand a torch and touched off one of the guns at the arsenal himself. Had such been the case, in my opinion, it would have been neither criminal nor derogatory for the prisoner under the circumstances to have done so. The counsel for the state have thought otherwise, and have introduced a witness, Orson Moffat, to prove it. This witness swears that the order to fire was given by the prisoner whilst he, witness, quote, was in the midst of his lines, end quote, and, quote, near enough to have touched him easily, end quote. When the gun flashed, quote, heard Mr. Dorr call for the torch, saw him holding the torch, and saw the other gun flash, end quote. Yet, gentlemen, this witness, who swore that he had once or twice that night made report to Colonel Blodgett at the arsenal of movements on the outside, and also that he knew the prisoner perfectly upon his cross-examination, could not name another person upon the ground, could not tell whether the prisoner wore a hat or a cap, a belt or not, nor describe the position of either of the guns. You will recollect, gentlemen, that these guns were about 20 feet apart and within musket shot of the arsenal, which was thoroughly defended by artillery and infantry both. And in the case of an assault, the doors were to be thrown open and five six-pounders were to be run out and fired. That the witness, if his statements be true, which, by the way, are far from confirmed by that of General then Colonel Blodgett, must have been aware of these facts. Yet this witness tells you that he stood near enough Mr. Dorr to touch him when he flashed the gun, at a moment, too, when he might instantly expect to receive the whole deadly fire from the infantry and artillery of the arsenal, without any possible motive other than mere curiosity. Now, gentlemen, can you believe one word of the testimony of this Mr. Moffat? I do not, and upon the testimony taken by itself, no man but a madman or a fool could or would needlessly put himself in such a situation. It is not in human nature to suppose it possible, and I trust that you will not give to his testimony a particle of weight, more especially as the testimony of several other witnesses proves it to be groundless." Captain Wade stood within two feet of Mr. Dorr when the gun was flashed and swears that he did not know the man, but that it was not Mr. Dorr. Colonel Carter, then in command, swears that he himself gave the orders to fire, that Mr. Dorr stood close by him all the time, between and a little in the rear of the guns, that a man named Andrews flashed one, and a man named Hathaway the other, that Governor Dorr had no torch or port fire in his hand that night, and that Moffat's testimony, which he had heard, was false. Thaddeus Simmons was one of Governor Dorr's bodyguard, was near his person all night, and swears positively that Mr. Dorr did not flash the gun. The statements of these witnesses are confirmed by the negative testimony of several others, all of whom would be more likely to know the facts than Mr. Orson Moffat. End of section 8. Section 9 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker. American State Trials, Volume 2 by John D. Lawson. Trial of Thomas Wilson Dorr for Treason, Rhode Island, 1844, Part 8. At about seven o'clock on the morning of the 18th, after the return to Anthony's house on Federal Hill, 
it was ascertained that 27 men only remained under arms, attached to the cause and the fortunes of the prisoner. In the meantime, the guns had been examined, bored out, and reloaded. No plugs were in them, according to the testimony of Hathaway, who bore them out with a gimlet, as had been reported and sworn to by Hiram Chapel. His testimony on this point, however, was sufficiently contradicted by that of Colonel Despo. Upon the examination, it appeared that the powder was bad, that in consequence of the dampness of the night, it had first dissolved, then hardened, and would not ignite. By this time, the charter troops of the City of Providence, reinforced by those from Newport, Bristol, and Warren, were in motion. The concerted signal, a gun on Federal Hill, had been fired for a rally of supporters of the people's government, but instead of being answered to by men in arms, as had been pledged to Governor Dorr, he received a written communication from some of his friends in the city that he could not expect such support under present circumstances. Those circumstances were the strength of the charter military force then embodied in the city. The aid promised them of United States troops from Fort Adams, and the apprehensions entertained by many of the legal consequences of coming in conflict with the general government. Under all these circumstances, according to the proof in the cause, the prisoner urged by the advice of the few gallant officers who still adhered to him, and his hopelessness of maintaining a position on Federal Hill, issued orders for the few remaining men to retire and disband themselves, and withdrew himself beyond the lines of the state, assuring his officers, however, at the same time, that whenever the people were ready to support their own government in the great cause in which they were engaged, he should be prepared to return and join them. And for this act of prudence and necessity also had the prisoner been branded as a coward. From this period up to about the 20th of June following, the prisoner appears to have remained out of the state. It is in proof, however, that in the north and northwest part of the county of Providence, a determination still existed to sustain and establish the government under Mr. Dorr, and as the people's legislature had adjourned to meet again on the then coming 4th of July, a collection of military officers and partisans met at Woonsocket. It was resolved to purchase a suitable lot of land for an encampment and put themselves in a situation to sustain and, if need be, to defend the legislature during its proposed session. This was as early as about the 12th of June. A committee was appointed at Acoats Hill, contiguous to the village of Chepachet, in the town of Gloucester, about 16 miles from the city of Providence, was the spot selected. It appears to have been understood, gentlemen, that the people's legislature would convene and sit in that village. According to the evidence, companies and parties of armed men began to assemble there on the 22nd of June. Governor Dorr was known then to be at Killingly in the state of Connecticut. It further appears that a written communication was made to him by some of the military officers urging his immediate return to assume command and giving assurance that 1,500 men were detailed from different parts of the state to support him. Such, at least, is the testimony of Colonel Carter, 600 of whom were to be furnished from the city of Providence alone. Upon such representations and assurances thus urged, the prisoner, escorted by a very few officers who had gone from Chepachet to Killingly for the purpose, arrived at the former place on the morning of Saturday, June 25th, the day on which the overt act of levying war in the third count of the indictment is laid. Upon his arrival, instead of the fortified camp and a garrison of 1,500 men, which he had a right to expect, he found in arms about 200 men, a camp on two sides partially defended by very slight embankments or breastworks, composed of brush and earth, and five mounted and one unmounted old pieces of artillery of different calibers and descriptions. Evidence has been introduced on the part of the prosecution, however, the court overruling our objection, that it was irrelevant to either count in the indictment. 
showing that several days before Mr. Dorr came into the state and before he was in any way connected with the military movements of Chapachet, in consequence of a rumor that the charter troops were about to attack the place and arrest Lieutenant Governor Eddy, who resided in Chapachet, Charles J. Shelley, an emissary from Providence, had been on the 22nd taken as a spy and detained as such until the next day when he had been discharged two days before Mr. Dorr arrived there, which, as I have before said, was on the 25th. This evidence was thrown in as a matter of aggravation, although it is manifest that the prisoner could in no way be legally implicated by it, nor held responsible for it. It has appeared in evidence that Mr. Richard Knight was also made a prisoner on the evening of the 25th of June, the day of Mr. Dorr's arrival at Chapachet, and I call your attention to this testimony with a view of noticing some of his statements, which are calculated to create false impressions in your minds and intended to confirm newspaper assertions. He has testified that on his entrance into the village he was fired on by one of two men who were running down the hill as if with design to head him off. Upon this point we have the testimony of Mr. Doar's adjutant general, William H. Potter, who was on the ground and swears that he never heard of it, and that if such had occurred he must have known it. Mr. Knight also swore that at the same time he saw three black men on the hill, one of whom had a gun also. Gentlemen, you all know how often during the period of these troubles it had been asserted that Governor Doar's forces at Chapachet were the offscoring of the land, black, white, and gray, and this testimony is given by Mr. Knight, who had been a prisoner there to give color to such reports and to convey the idea that blacks constituted a part of the soldiery and were on the hill serving as troops, that a prejudice might be raised in your minds against the prisoner. But what is the true state of the case, as shown by the whole evidence on the point, that there were but three blacks connected in any way with the troops there, and that they were merely waiters or servants attached to the commissary department of the camp, as sworn to by B. M. Slade, who acted at the head of that department? The evidence produced relative to the gathering at Acoats Hill, from the time when the prisoner arrived there, and it is with that only we have to do, shows that it was throughout conducted in a most orderly and proper manner. Orders were immediately issued by him that all private rights and private property should be respected, and three instances only of the violation of those orders occurred. They were insignificant in themselves, but promptly repaired by the prisoner's orders, and in one instance he made pecuniary reparation out of his own pocket. As one means for the preservation of order, he caused the bar of the tavern of General Sprague to be shut, so that no liquor should be sold, and none was furnished to the men. It appears in evidence that on the afternoon of that day, the 25th, the governor examined the works of defense on the hill. The munitions of war were collected, reviewed, and ascertained the number of effective men assembled, and made a speech to them. Very exaggerated and extravagant accounts of the number of those men have been made and circulated by those opposed to Governor Dorr and the cause he was engaged in as an additional pretext for charging him with poltroony and cowardice in abandoning the post as he did on the evening of the 27th. But it appears by the evidence of Potter, Comstock, and Carter, confirmed by others, that the force of men under arms was fluctuating, constantly coming and going. On Saturday, the 25th, there were 225. On Sunday, the 26th, somewhat more. On Monday, the witnesses agree that they did not exceed 250 in all. The proclamation which had been issued by the prisoner, calling for the men promised before he came into the state, and on the military of the state generally, was not responded to 
Of those present, about two-thirds were sufficiently armed. The residue were miserably equipped. Some expression used by the prisoner in the speech delivered to the troops has been seized on and tortured into fancied evidence of traitorous malignity, derogatory to the character and to the purity of the motives of the prisoner. And two witnesses, Willis Bowen and Caleb E. Tucker, have been called on to establish the fact and prove the expression, the attempt, however, signally failed of success and was disproved by a number of witnesses called for the prisoner. On Sunday the 26th, the interview took place at General Sprague's, then Governor Doar's headquarters, between the prisoner and Mr. D.J. Pierce, the particulars of which have been fully detailed to you by Mr. P. on the stand, giving expressions and stating the views, objects, and intentions of the prisoner. And I leave you to judge, gentlemen, whether the testimony does not negative in the clearest and strongest terms the corrupt and traitorous intent with which the prisoner by the indictment is charged. You will bear in mind also, gentlemen, some important facts sworn by the witness, as have been stated to Governor Doar in that interview, that he had seen 2,300 charter troops pass by his boarding house in Providence the day before, that 500 or 600 in addition were expected then from the counties of Kent and Washington, that a requisition had been made on the President, which would without doubt be favorably answered on Tuesday morning that Colonel Bankhead was in Providence, awaiting the arrival of orders, and that many of his warmest political friends and officers under the People's Constitution had not only resigned their offices, but he had seen some of them the day before in the ranks of the charter troops. Some stress has been laid on the attack, which it is supposed was intended on the advanced post of the government troops stationed at Greenville but it does not appear by any evidence that such an attack was ever contemplated by the prisoner his object throughout appears to have been and was avowed to be to protect the people's legislature which was to be convened at chapachet on the fourth of july and it was clearly intended to adopt as far as practicable every measure necessary for that purpose and to sustain and defend the people's constitution and government and nothing more the purpose being defense not offense the private opinion of Colonel Carter respecting the taking possession of the colleges in Providence, converting them into barracks, and preparing a furnace for heating shot, is not material to the issue you are trying, and in fact has nothing to do with the present indictment. The prisoner had no knowledge of and is not implicated in such intention, nor is there the slightest proof or ground for supporting that he ever contemplated any such movement. Early on Monday, June 25th, the prisoner received intelligence that the charter troops were at Greenville and Situate. In the meantime, his friends in the city of Providence were deserting him and the cause. Fourteen members of the People's General Assembly had resigned their office at one time, no additional force coming to his aid and support. The charter and government force then, according to the information of Mr. Pierce, amounting probably to 3,000 men within six or eight miles of him, his own position unskillfully selected by others, other heights in the vicinity commanding his slight fort, having no extensive or adequate commissary department no ammunition sufficient for an action of more than 15 or 20 minutes duration. His military chest containing only $70 raised among the officers by voluntary contribution. Under these pressing circumstances, the prisoner deemed it his duty to call a council of war and disclose the true situation in which they were placed. A council was accordingly called and held at General Sprague's, his headquarters. All these facts were fully laid open to his officers and deliberately discussed. The final result of their deliberations was a resolution to disband forces forthwith as a measure dictated by the severest necessity. 
The order for this purpose was issued at about four o'clock the same afternoon, sent to the hill by General de Wolf, accompanied by Colonel Comstock, and was then and there duly read to the soldiery, upon which the men immediately separated and, as expressed by Colonel Comstock, dispersed as is usual after dismission, and as stated by Colonel Carter, without any haste or disorder. It appears also by the evidence of General Sprague and Colonel Carter that Governor Dorr himself remained in the village at Sprague's until about sunset, which at that season would be half past seven o'clock, when accompanied by Colonel Carter and a driver, he went to Thompson, Connecticut, passing in the route several parties of the retiring men. And yet, gentlemen, Governor Dorr has often been charged with precipitately running away from his men at Chapachet. It is also in evidence that on the same day, after the order for disbandment had been issued by the prisoner, he enclosed a copy of it for publication in the party newspaper in a letter to his friend Mr. Burgess. It will be recollected that the prisoner's headquarters were in Chapachet, 16 miles from Providence, that one body of the charter troops were at Greenville on the direct road and another body in Situate on the south road, so that the messenger, Mr. Eddy, was intercepted and probably somewhat delayed. Yet Mr. Burgess states that he received the communication at about dark, the same evening, while he was reading a newspaper by the remains of daylight, that he read the letter in the presence of the two charter officers who brought it to him, and though not by the request of Governor Dorr, immediately submitted both the letter and the copy of the order for disbanding to General McNeil and to the charter governor and council. The next day, at about eight o'clock in the morning, their troops took possession of the evacuated fort, and... I had almost said, sacked the village of Chapachet. While the place was in possession of the forces of the prisoner, the rights of person and property were held sacred, with the slight infringements before explained, and when they left, they left it in peaceful security. What the condition of the village and its inhabitants was when the chartered troops abandoned it, I am not permitted by the court to prove or state and such was the victory of the charter troops at a coats hill and the termination of the chapachet war entering an entrenchment thirteen hours after it was known to be abandoned but gentlemen it has been charged upon the prisoner here and elsewhere that he brought to chapachet from new york the spartan band with the design of leading them to the city of providence to sack the city and cover themselves with spoils of the Spartan band, I know only that in the popular slang of the day, they, with Governor Dorr and all his friends and the adherents to the People's Constitution, were classed under the general name of rowdies, and these were said to be foreign rowdies, and it has been said that they were to advance to the work of violation and havoc under the watchwords of the banks and the beauty of providence. Of all the thousand slanders circulated in the community to the prejudice of the prisoner, this was the most infamous and base as it was false. But with regard to the Spartan band, the only evidence in the cause touching the point is that there were from ten to fifteen, being differently estimated by different witnesses, who joined the encampment at Chapachet on the 24th of June, the day before the arrival of Mr. Dorr from Connecticut. They came direct from New York, and there is no evidence to show any improper design on their part. He found them as he found the others on the hill at his arrival. They were there as military men. They were treated and did their duty in common with the others as such, and for aught that appears were orderly and well-behaved. They may have been foreigners, or they may not. They were not Rhode Islanders, and there were also two persons there from the adjoining state of Massachusetts, General de Wolf, and a private. If, however, this be matter of, of reproach to the prisoner, the charter government are equally liable to it. Major General McNeil and some of his officers were invited here from other states, and why I can scarcely tell. 
it could not be from any deficiency of native military talent or capacity that we have men among us fit to stand by Caesar or Napoleon and to give directions. We have the very best evidence. It may be derived from the mouths of some of the government witnesses themselves when speaking of their own exploits. With the exception, however, that I have mentioned, the men composing Mr. Doar's force were all Rhode Island men, men of landed estates or hard-handed enterprising mechanics, men who had voted for the adoption of the People's Constitution and for Mr. Doar as governor under that Constitution. Such men, and I can say nothing against those accepted, as would be no disgrace to the service and the cause of political freedom. I have now, gentlemen, briefly gone over the prominent points of the testimony in the cause, so as to give you a clear and connected view of all the transactions in which the prisoner was concerned during the period of time embraced in the several counts in the indictment, which charges the overt acts of levying war against the state on the 17th and 18th days of May and the 25th and 27th days of June. I have done this for the further purpose of calling your attention more particularly to the question of criminal and malicious intent on the part of the prisoner. There can be no crime where there is no criminal intention. Intention is the very essence of all crime. There can be no treason where there is no traitorous intention. The mere act of levying war, whether it be actual or constructive, does not necessarily amount to treason. To constitute that crime, it must be levying war with a malicious and traitorous intent, and such is the averment of each count of the present indictment. If no such averment were there, the indictment would be fatally defective, and you could not find the prisoner guilty under it. And the question here is, does the evidence offered on the part of the prosecution support the allegations so as to justify you in finding a verdict against the prisoner? You have been already told by the court that there was no evidence or pretense of express malice or treasonable design on the part of the traverser, but that such malice and such intent where an overt act of levying war was proved was a presumption of law and changed the burden of proof from the government to the prisoner, as in homicide, the intentional killing a man, the law presumed to be murder, until the person charged offered evidence that should reduce the offense to manslaughter, or something less. This presumed traitorous intent, after all, is but a presumption, not a fact proved, and may be rebutted by facts and circumstances disproving the possibility of its existence. Such, gentlemen, we contend is the present case. You will recollect that, according to the testimony of the witnesses, it was with much reluctance, and after at least three other persons had been put in nomination and declined, that the prisoner consented to a nomination as governor at the election in April 1842, that he received upwards of 7,000 votes for that office, that the votes were duly returned to the Foundry Legislature, that a committee was appointed to count them, that the committee reported that the prisoner was duly elected, that the usual proclamation of such his election was made, that he took the required oath of office, that he delivered an inaugural address or message to the legislature, and that a government under the people's constitution was fully organized and put into operation, superseding, as we contend, all other government in this state. You will also bear in mind an admission made by the attorney general that if the prisoner was in fact governor, he was justified in all he did. Now, gentlemen, taking that evidence and that admission along with you, trace every act done, every expression used, and every measure proposed by the prisoner from the assemblage of the People's Legislature on the 3rd of May to his leaving Chapachet on the evening of the 27th of June, 1842. Compare and weigh the evidence whenever it conflicts, and say, if you can, where you find any evidence calculated to support this charge of treasonable intent. 
On the other hand, gentlemen, you will find him actuated by principles of the highest standard, intent not on subverting, but on establishing the government of the people, controlled by an all-pervading sense of official duty, and governed by a religious sense of the oath he had taken to support the people's constitution and discharge his duty faithfully to the people of the state." I shall not attempt here to recapitulate the evidence of these particulars, having somewhat glanced at them in passing, but it is such as frees the character of the prisoner from every imputation upon the purity of his motives and the unshaken consistency of his conduct. You have the evidence all before you, gentlemen, and under your oaths as jurors, you are true deliverance to make between the state and the prisoner at the bar. After all, gentlemen, who is the prisoner at the bar, and how came he now before you for trial? Mr. Dorr is an educated gentleman, a professional man, a member of the Rhode Island Bar, and of the most respectable family and connections. It is also in evidence that he personally has stood high in the confidence and esteem of his fellow citizens. He has represented for three years and a half the City of Providence in the General Assembly, at the time he is charged with having levied war against the state, he was treasurer of the Rhode Island Historical Society and had in his hands the funds of that institution to a large amount. He was a commissioner of the Situate Bank, having control of its funds and securities under an appointment of the legislature and he was president of the school committee of the city of providence it appears also that as administrator or trustee he had in his hands large amounts of the property of private individuals during the troubles that followed the affair at the arsenal the destitution of men arms ammunition provisions and money from the chipachet campaign during his protracted exile from the state, did Governor Dorr embezzle, divert, or supply these funds, or a farthing of them? No, gentlemen. As is shown by the testimony of Mr. Burgess, he guarded the whole with the most scrupulous care, guided by the highest sense of honor, and placed them undiminished beyond the reach of the perils which environed his own position. With this evidence before you, does he carry about with him any of the marks of that rowdyism of which we have heard so much? Has not his whole course of life, his sentiments, and his actions been such as to free him from the imputation of having in anything been governed by other motives than a desire and a zeal for the best interests of his fellow citizens and of the state? It has been urged by the opposing counsel for the state that the prisoner taking counsel from his fears at Chapachet escaped from the state. It would have been an act not of wisdom or courage, but of the wildest folly for Mr. Dorr to have bared his devoted head to the whirlwind of Algerine fury that then swept over the state, or under legislative martial law, to have confided his fate to the tender mercies of a drumhead court-martial. But when the tempest had passed over, when the excitement had become somewhat allayed by time, when martial law no longer fettered the legal tribunals of the state, he came voluntarily back to the state within the reach of its tribunals. He came when large rewards failed to bring him, because this was his native state, his home, and because he expected and had a right to expect that he should be tried by a jury of his peers of the vicinages among whom he had always lived. He is now in your hands, and I repeat, gentlemen, that in deciding on his case you may decide upon your own fate and that of your posterity. Your decision may involve the fate of American freedom, nay, of civil liberty itself. Finally, gentlemen, if the evidence to which I have directed your attention should fail to satisfy your minds fully as to the purity of the prisoner's intentions and the absence of treasonable design on his part, and doubts remain on the subject, you are bound and will be so instructed by the court to throw those doubts into the scale of the prisoner and return a verdict of acquittal. 
I now leave him with you under the conviction that the moment you take his life and liberty into your hands, you at the same time commit your characters through life and your memories after death to the award and decision of the great tribunal of public opinion, and I hope and trust that at its hands you may receive that justice, which in behalf of the prisoner I claim at your hands. End of section 9. Section 10 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rutger. American State Trials, Volume 2 by John D. Lawson. Trial of Thomas Wilson Dorr for Treason, Rhode Island, 1844, Part 9. Mr. Dorr. Having addressed to the court all I had to say on the subject of treason, which I had contended was an offense against the United States, without admitting that any such offense had in this instance been committed, I now thank the jury for the patience which they have thus far manifested in attending to the proceedings of a trial necessarily protracted beyond the usual length. Although the duration of the trial has been more than once alluded to by one of the honorable court, I desire to assure the jury that I have not intentionally trespassed on their time. Much of it had unavoidably been spent in impaneling the jury, which in a case of this moment could not be hastily done. I had a right by law to twenty peremptory challenges, and a large number of those who had been called as jurors had disqualified themselves, as they were called, by replying to the questions proposed to them, that they had formed and expressed an opinion upon the charges laid in the indictment, rendering it necessary to issue new process for summoning an additional number. It would also be recollected that I had been brought here from the county to which I belonged, professedly for a more impartial trial, and among those with whom I was but little acquainted, and whose qualifications and opinions could not be investigated and ascertained without special inquiry, which it had been sometimes necessary to make through witnesses, to whom the jurors were better known than to myself. The jurors now impaneled had severally responded under the oath that they had neither formed nor expressed an opinion upon the matters now in issue, and only through their avowed impartiality could the object be obtained for which the case had been in this unusual manner removed from the county where the offense was charged to have been committed into another which had been equally pervaded by the political feelings and discussions which had pervaded the whole state in the eventful period of 1842. As so much had been said about foreign notions and foreign interference, it is proper for me to remind you that I was no stranger in your midst. I had not come here from abroad to proclaim new and strange words at war with the original doctrines upon which our government was established. I am a native citizen of Rhode Island, and a portion of those from whom I claim descent were among the earliest settlers of the state. I am by birth, and still more in principle and feeling, a Rhode Island man. I do not stand before you as an alien to the common inheritance, and I am ready to meet my opponents in any attempt they might make to show that my efforts had been directed to any other object than the reassertion of the ancient liberties of the state and the inherent rights of the people. The case now presented to the jury is one of no ordinary importance, and is not likely to be disposed of by a hasty and inconsiderate judgment. It is not a matter of dollars and cents to be decided by an average of opinions, but a question affecting the rights and freedom, and to all intents, the life of the accused. The sentence consequent upon conviction is perpetual imprisonment, with the attending deprivation of the social and political privileges of a man and a citizen, an infliction which might induce some minds to prefer the more friendly missive of the military tribunal. It is the duty of the jury to contemplate the results of their verdict, 
for though they are not directly responsible for the law, and sit here not to make but to administer it, they may well be inspired when they regard the personal rights which are now put in issue with a solemn caution, with a spirit of sincere and earnest inquiry, fearful themselves of doing a greater wrong than that which is alleged against the individual they are called upon to try, and bearing in mind that the justice of the law is not revenge, and insists upon no doubtful constructions of the acts of the accused. The jury must be satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt not only of the facts, but of the legal meaning and purport of the facts, and they are not called upon to offer sacrifices to state policy or to the dignity of the law. At this distance from time, from the date of the transactions in controversy, a more dispassionate and candid investigation was to be expected and demanded. The offense charged is political, not against individuals but against the state, under a system now no longer existing. The defendant necessarily does not stand alone. He acted for others. In trying him, you try also the 14,000 citizens who voted for the People's Constitution in 1841 and who, if there be any guilt in the doctrine of 76, are equally guilty with him. Nay more, you may try the principles of the American government and the rights of the American people, and you yourselves will in turn be tried for any wounds you may inflict upon American liberty. You are not sitting here in one corner of a small state, out of the reach of observation, and beware that no political bias incline you to do any injustice to the defendant by way of retribution to the party with which he is connected or how you permit yourselves to defeat the ostensible object of a fair trial in the removal of this case, and let the public have reason to believe that it has been more fair than was intended. The opening counsel for the state, Bosworth, has not been satisfied with the customary epithets which the forms of indictment bestow on those who are brought within the pale of the courts, but he had launched out into the language of vituperation and calumny, the not uncommon substitutes for reasoning and argument. These ebullitions of malignity do not so much indicate the character of the object upon which they are poured as the condition of the sources from which they spring. Real valor never seeks to magnify itself by depreciating the character of those who have been overcome by the fortune of the day and avoids all questionable exultation. An honorable mind in a great political controversy like this between the two parties of the state, conscious itself of good motives, will be slow to impute the reverse to a fair and open political opponent. The coarse remarks of the assistant to the prosecutor are left to you with all the weight to which they are entitled. If he be not ashamed of them, they may cause some of his friends to be ashamed of him." Without any proof that it was known at the time to the defendant, the aid of the prosecutor has laid much stress on the fact that some of his relatives by law or blood were found in array against him on the 17th of May, 1842, and it is insinuated, by way of arousing the prejudices of the jury, that the object of the defendant was the destruction of his own relatives and friends. In reply to this false and malicious charge, I say that in periods of excitement it might happen, and sometimes did happen, to those who were near and painfully close to those who are also dear to each other to be widely separated even to the conflict of war. I stood almost alone in my political opinions among those who were connected with me by blood. Without consulting interests, I had asked myself what was right and pursued it. If my views of the sovereignty and action of the people were correct, then they who placed themselves in opposition to the government and attempted to prevent the recovery of the public property, whether strangers or relatives, did so in their own wrong, and might with equal propriety be said to have been bent upon his own particular destruction." I leave them to their motives and claim respect for my own. There are obligations of duty from which no interest or consanguinity can furnish a discharge. 
I was not aware at the time that any person related to me was engaged in the defense of the arsenal, but from what had fallen from one of them had supposed that he intended to be. This person was not my brother, now absent from the country, whose name had been forced in here with a very apparent object, and who, though opposed in politics, was entirely capable of appreciating my motives, as I was making the same estimate in return. But if I had been aware that all my clan were enlisted against the law and constitution of the state, I should not have been deterred from discharging the oath of duty which rested upon me. The offense charged is somewhat of a vague nature. What is levying war? It is not a gathering of men merely with arms in their hands. This is the description of every military training or review. Against whom is it levied? The state. Who represented the state at the time in Rhode Island? Which was the true government, or more properly, which was the government? And again, for what object was war levied, if at all? Was it for any lawless, unjustifiable purpose, or in the defense of government and the most valued rights of the citizens? Here we have, in addition to the mere question of fact, were certain things done or not, the much larger and more important questions of rights, of motives and intentions. The indictment charges that the acts laid in it were maliciously and traitorously done. To constitute a levying of war as it was held in 4 Cranch 75, there must be an assemblage of persons for the purpose of effecting by force a treasonable purpose. Enlistment of men to serve against government is not sufficient. It is not treason, it thus seems, to enlist men for service even against a lawful government, much less is it to enlist them and to bring them into service against an unlawful one, existing by usurpation and contending with force against that by which it has been rightfully supplanted. You will also bear in mind the admission of the Attorney General, who properly stated in the outset of the case that if the defendant were the governor of the state, he had a right to do what he did. It is thus perfectly evident that the true question essential to a fair trial is that of rights and motives. There must be a treasonable intent in the levying of war to constitute any treason at all, not a mere knowledge of what one is about, but a deliberate set purpose and treason of mind. As in cases of homicide, the act may be murder or manslaughter or no offense at all, according to circumstances and intentions. I have in the argument of this case the disadvantage of appearing before the jury without the aid of my principal counsel, Mr. Atwell, upon whom I had relied for all the closing arguments, who had been overtaken and disabled by a severe illness just before the commencement of the case, when it was too late for me to make any preparation. While I desire to acknowledge the zeal, fidelity, ability, and industry of the gentleman who assists me, I cannot but feel the absence of a counselor whose legal eminence and eloquence, practical experience, and just weight as a lawyer in this court were of so much importance to his clients. If I have anything to advance in my own favor, it will be said to come from a too partial source, and it weighs nothing. What I admit is taken strongly against me, and what I may say concerning myself may be, for the most part, better said by another. The defense as well as the prosecution has drawn out upon the examination of witnesses a long detail of facts. My great object has been to have all the facts of the case correctly ascertained, to disabuse it of all the falsehoods and calumnies with which it has been invested by the malignant ingenuity of political enemies, and to disprove all the pretended charges that have been so often repeated against myself, my political associates, and the political party with whom we have acted. I have aided by questions and by witnesses in bringing all the facts to light. There are and have been no secrets in the cause in which I have been engaged. There is nothing, so far as I am aware, that might not safely be brought to the light of day. 
In August last, I published over my name a statement of all the transactions now in controversy, from beginning to end, which was generally circulated in this state. It does not differ perceptibly from the present testimony. I am willing to put it into the case as a part of it, if the prosecutor do not object. I should have been willing to save this investigation by doing so, but it was not for the defendant to prescribe the mode of proceeding by the prosecutor, who, of course, would not have admitted the account of the defendant to be correct, and expected to make a case much more favorable to his own side of the question. And here let it be asked, of common candor and fairness, after listening to the testimony, what has become of the shameful and groundless imputation conveyed in the fabricated watchword of beauty and the banks, of the foreign desperados who were to plunder and burn the city of Providence and to invade the domestic purity of its homes, of the intervention of citizens abroad for any other object than to arrest the unjustifiable interference of the president with state rights, of the general appropriation of private property to military uses, of the lawless and intemperate character of those engaged in the people's cause, of the forcible enlistments of the state script, of the sword dyed in blood, of the waving of the torch and the firing of the gun, and the hundred other stories and inventions that were got up by political managers and editors for effect, and have had their day, and have answered all that was expected of them, they were no doubt believed by some with that credulity which alarm creates, and there were others who availed themselves of this slight pretense to go over and basely and treacherously abandon the cause of the people to the enemy. Henceforth let the retailers of these calumnies, which have been put down in and out of court, hold their peace. The alleged invasion of private property by the suffrage men at Chipachet, of which so much had been attempted at the time to be made by their opponents, was reduced to three instances, a horse borrowed, used, and returned, a cow taken and paid for, and a few boards burnt on the hill. The question was asked whether the village of Chapachet, the day after it was left by the suffrage men, was not sacked by the charter troops, but this, we were told, had nothing to do with the issue and could not be gone into. It was irrelevant. There was a contrast to be disclosed. Of all that was really done by me, aside from the fabrications alluded to, or that I had part in doing, I deny nothing. I should disdain to make such a denial here or elsewhere, to preserve either liberty or life. My defense before you is a justification throughout. What I did I had a right to do, having been duly elected governor of this state under a rightfully adopted and valid Republican state constitution, which I took an oath to support, and did support to the best of the means placed within my power. I must call your attention to the extraordinary embarrassment in which I was placed in this portion of the defense by the refusal of the court to permit me to make good my justification by exhibiting the proofs of my election as governor and the proofs of the adoption of the people's constitution under which I had been elected, the votes given upon it having been brought here for the express purpose of authenticating it to the jury nor was I permitted directly or otherwise than incidental remarks to maintain either to the court or jury the right of the people of Rhode Island upon American principles to form and adopt this constitution, nor to argue any other question of law to the court or jury than whether treason be an offense against a state or against the United States, nor to introduce proofs of my election and of the Constitution to repel the charge of malicious and traitorous motives, nor to show by authorities that the jury are in capital cases the judges both of the law and of the fact. It was with extreme surprise and regret that I thus found myself debarred from my true defense, the facts being thus plain before the jury that I had on several occasions attempted to carry into effect by military force the constitution and government of the people, and as the chief magistrate of the state, 
the jury will very naturally ask, how did all this come to pass? By what authority did the defendant these things? The reply to your very natural inquiry is a blank. The defendant is most anxious to proceed before you and to establish all these rights, but he is not permitted. He must look to you to take care of them. He is in the condition of the mariner whose bark has been stripped by an adverse gale and who in directing his course to the land can expect to reach it only with the aid of a jury mast. The votes that were cast for the people's constitution are at hand. They who gave them are not far off. The acts of the people's legislature under this constitution can be proved in a moment. These and the unanswerable proofs that popular sovereignty is the just source of government were what it was desired to lay directly before you. By the refusal of the court, the defendant feels that he has been deprived of a great right and that justice has been denied him, whether the doctrines on which the republic rests be admitted here or not, they are unchangeably the same. The defendant has no desire to retract his subscription to them. Some ages ago, a natural philosopher was accused and silenced before the Inquisition for teaching that the earth turned on its axis. As he retired after his forced confession to the contrary from the presence of the officers of the justice of that day, he exclaimed, Still it turns, and in spite of all opposition of false philosophy, it has turned ever since. There are other immutable doctrines and other honest convictions which cannot be forced out of a man by any human process. The sun will not rise upon any recantation by me of the truce of 76 or of any one of the sound principles of American freedom. The servants of a righteous cause may fail or fall in the defense of it. It may go down, but all the truth that it contains is indestructible and will be treasured up by the great mass of our countrymen. If I have erred in this Rhode Island question, I have the satisfaction of having erred with the greatest statesmen and the highest authorities, and with the great majority of the people of the United States, and I have the satisfaction also of reflecting that all errors of judgment here will be corrected by the great tribunal of public opinion, which assures to all ultimate and impartial justice." Here the defense might end. The facts are before you. You cannot avoid the question of right imperfectly as it comes to you. But there is one remaining point, the amount and purport of the evidence. It is due to myself that I should make some further allusion to it by way of explanation of my conduct and motives during the period of affairs that has passed in review. To this subject, the remainder of my remarks will be confined. It has been charged against me that I originated an unnecessary movement in this state, and that it had been persevered in without good reasons, both the charges I propose now to consider. It is impossible that any man should stand alone in any attempt at political reform like that which has recently taken place in Rhode Island. It is not within the compass of human ability to create a set of circumstances to suit a scheme of ambition involving any considerable change in the affairs of a state. The utmost that any individual can do is to be present and to take a part more or less efficient in a movement originating in general causes and affecting large portions of the people. The people of this country and of this state and it may be added, of the race to which we belong, are not addicted to change for the sake of change merely. It is a libel among them to say that they are not capable of thinking and acting for themselves. In all those movements relating to the organization and the amendment of forms of government, there are deeply laid causes beyond the control of individuals, and most frequently of remote origin and long continuance, to which the final result is to be attributed. 
the events of 1842 grew naturally out of a long train of evils and abuses running far back and which require a brief consideration in order fairly to indicate the remedy which was proposed and to explain the conduct of those who were concerned in applying it to the existing condition of affairs. A glance at our political history will exhibit the origin of all the troubles which have of late agitated and distracted this state. Mr. Dorr said he desired to repel the imputation which had been cast on those with whom he had acted and himself that they commenced their undertaking with disparagement of their ancestors, the venerable founders of our civil polity. Much had been said about the charter government and the early institutions of the state. He then paid a tribute to the character of Roger Williams as the founder of American democracy and the author of the true system of religious liberty in its relation to the political system and the inalienable rights of conscience and private judgment. To this illustrious man, the greatest in the anti-revolutionary history of the country, was the colony of Rhode Island mainly indebted for its unexampled degree of freedom here enjoyed and for democratic institutions to the origin of which every right-minded son of this state must look with a just and honorable pride. In the heat of political controversy, the sins of the royal grantor of the charter and of those whose maladministration of the government under it had subsequently planted the seeds of future evils had been laid upon the charter itself, which was in its day and long subsequently a monument of liberty. The charter had well done its office, and at the period of the revolution, or as soon afterward as circumstances would permit, should have been consigned to the archives of the state, to be held in perpetual veneration for the benefits that it had bestowed. It was the patrimony of Roger Williams and his associates which the colony long enjoyed. It possessed the freest government on earth, with a remote dependence on Great Britain. The result of the efforts and doctrines of Williams was the formation here of a peculiar people in advance of the times in which they lived, jealous of their rights, fixed in their opinions, disposed to think and act for themselves, and to exercise freedom of speech without regarding personal consequences. This spirit was confirmed by the local position of the colony with a limited domain between two stronger neighbors bent on aggrandizing themselves at its expense and never relinquishing down to the period of the adoption of the federal constitution the design of annexing it to their respective territories. The way of our fathers was to hear freely, discuss openly, to conceal nothing, and to act without fear. They were not to be driven by authority or dictation of any kind. This old-fashioned spirit, it is to be regretted, has been depressed by recent events, but let it be hoped not beyond the possibility of ultimate recovery. This originally free democratic government passed through a period of degeneration from which it has of late been partially restored. It is now 120 years since the first definite landed qualification of voters was established by law. It was at first a qualification for suffrage. It became at length a limitation of suffrage and a badge of exclusion from political rights. Nearly all the adult inhabitants were at first, as now among the western settlements, the owners of land. This landed qualification may have been justified at the time by the state policy of resisting undue influences from abroad through a requisition upon all who came to incorporate themselves with the colonists that before they became a part of the political body that they should identify themselves with the population by this visible sign of adhesion and permanent residence but such a policy has long ceased to exist, and through the property restriction as this qualification at length became, the government of the state was transformed into a landed oligarchy. Up to the period of the revolution, when the population was about three-fifths of its present number, there were no complaints, 
but with the increase of population, they were manifested and through neglect were deepened into a strong disaffection toward the existing order of the state. A committee consisting of the governor and other distinguished individuals was appointed at the breaking out of the Revolution of 1776 to inquire what changes in the government were requisite to adapt it to the new order of things. But the committee made no report. The subject was again revived about the period of 1799 without a result. In 1811, a bill drafted by the present district judge to extend suffrage to all persons paying taxes and performing military duty was passed by the Senate and was laid on the table in the House of Representatives. A bill of half a dozen lines would at any time have accomplished the desired end and have prevented all the subsequent difficulties. In 1819, the defects in the state government were again brought under consideration, principally as connected with the grossly unequal representation in the lower house, the county of Providence, in its rateable property, being liable through direct taxation to the principal burdens of the state, while it was entitled to a disproportionate force in the body by which they were imposed. End of section 10. Section 11 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker. American State Trials, Volume 2, by John D. Lawson. Trial of Thomas Wilson Dorr for Treason, Rhode Island, 1844, Part 10. In 1824, a Freeholders' Convention was held for the formation of a state constitution which was rejected. A proposition made in this body to extend suffrage beyond the landed qualification received three votes. The next attempt to obtain an extension of suffrage was commenced in 1829 by the non-freeholders, whose memorials to the General Assembly were treated with contumely in the report of a committee of the House, which described them as unworthy of any serious consideration. In 1834, the attention of the freeholders was again called to the restricted condition of suffrage in the state. In that year, the defendant was elected a representative from Providence as an advocate of political reform and of a Republican state constitution, and should my political life be now brought to a close, as one of the results of this protracted contest, it will end as it began, in the just cause of the disenfranchised inhabitants claiming their due share of the birthright of American citizens. The Constitutional Party of Freeholders, which was this year formed, received but little encouragement and expired after an ineffectual struggle of nearly four years. The condition of things brought to the consideration of the legislature was hardly to be paralleled in any of the states. A majority of the House of Representatives in this body was chosen to represent less than one-third of the inhabitants of the state, and the electors of these representatives were about a third of the adult male population in the towns that sent them, so that the conjoint operation of unequal representation and of limited suffrage was to vest all the political power of the state in about one-ninth part of the resident citizens of the United States in Rhode Island an equality too unjust and oppressive to be much longer tolerated in the land of Roger Williams, so long as there survived among the people any portion of the ancient spirit of the state. A freeholders' convention was again called in 1834, in which, as a member from Providence, the defendant, as he had before done in the legislature, urged upon his associates the immediate duty and expediency of redressing the political inequality of the state through the forms of law. A proposition made by me for the extension of suffrage received but seven votes, and the convention dissolved without proposing any constitution to the freemen. 
The natural conclusion from this brief view of the facts in the mind of every man of ordinary intelligence and candor will be that the responsibility for all the consequences is on the heads of those who have so long denied or have exerted themselves to defeat the just rights of the people of this state. And everyone will see at a glance the futility of the attempt to ascribe to the dissatisfaction or to the ambition of any individual or a few individuals the rising up of the men of Rhode Island under a sense of common wrongs for the final attainment of just and equal rights. It was in vain on the part of those who undervalue the right of suffrage and who flatter themselves with the ability to govern others better than they can govern themselves to repel the non-freeholders with the answer that they were better off under the protection of the landed system. While British subjects claim to be well governed, it is the birthright and glory of American citizens to govern themselves. The right of suffrage is the guardian of civil liberty. The only security for just and impartial and beneficent legislation is in the universal right to participate in choosing those who make and administer the laws. The non-freeholder who was worthy to be counted among the represented population felt himself equally worth to vote for the representative himself. He came to this conclusion from a just estimate of his own character, of his worth and natural equality as a man, of his proportionate contribution to the support of the public burdens, state and national, of his productive industry in creating the commonwealth and contributing to the common welfare of the state, from a view of the free institutions of other states, by which he was constantly reminded of his own privations, and which held up before him rights from which he felt himself to be debarred by no natural mark of inferiority or incapacity, but by the arbitrary and selfish exclusion of men no better than himself. The result of this long denial of justice was the creation of two distinct classes of citizens, the people at large claiming by virtue of the revolution the sovereignty of the state and the qualified freemen who possessed and exercised the political power and governed the rest according to their will and pleasure. And this state of things, always dangerous to the tranquility of a country where all are professedly equal, led to the collision between the two classes and to the events of 1841 through 1842. The next and final attempt to obtain their rights was begun by the non-freeholders in 1840 through the general organization of a political party. With its proceedings, you are already acquainted. The non-freeholders were excluded, as they always had been, from any participation in the choice of delegates to the convention to frame a constitution, which was called by the General Assembly in January 1841. They knew from experience what was to be expected from such conventions, but before they proceeded to assert their own rights, they looked once more to the legislature for a concession to their reasonable claims. At the subsequent May session, a bill was presented to the House of Representatives by Mr. Atwell, which was drawn by the defendant and which provided that the citizens generally should be authorized to vote for the delegates to the convention. At the June session, it was amended of his own motion by the member who had introduced it so as to confine that temporary extension to taxpayers only, a proposition which received but ten votes. The door was thus closed upon the non-freeholders of the state, and they turned away from the existing government with the entire conviction that the time had now arrived to redress their own grievances through that power which is the superior of all others. They called a popular convention on a free basis. That convention framed a Republican constitution, which three months before the rejection of that of the landholders' convention was adopted and ratified by the votes of a vast majority of the whole people. This would have been demonstrated to you if the court had permitted the votes, which have been brought here for the purpose, to be presented for your examination, as the defendants most earnestly desired. Under this constitution, the defendant was duly elected to the office of governor of the state, a fact which he is debarred from proving by the prohibition of the court. 
in the name and by the authority of those who are true sources of power, he has acted in the capacity to which he was assigned, not to his own will, but the will of the people of the state. This is his true and sufficient defense. The defendant was nominated for governor shortly before the publication of the letter of President Tyler, in which he threatened his intervention in the political affairs of the state. The defendant accepted the nomination, though his means did not warrant him in doing so, at the urgent request of political friends after three others, one of them connected with the opposite political party in general politics, had declined it, and it had become apparent that unless the defendant accepted, there would be no candidate, and an organization under the Constitution might be defeated. This he would not suffer to occur if he could prevent it. As chairman of the state committee, he would not see the Constitution die in his hands. He did not seek the nomination, nor did he decline it when the absolute necessity had arisen, nor shrink from any duty or responsibility connected with the office. He was elected by the people. At the appointed time, the General Assembly was convened and was attended by a military escort to the place of meeting. It is unnecessary to repeat the proceedings of that body, many of which have been detailed to you. By a remarkable oversight, they permitted the judiciary to remain unchanged. Upon a proposition made in the House of Representatives to instruct the sheriff to take possession of the State House for the use of the Assembly, there was a division of opinion, three-fourths of the members being opposed to such a step, and in favor of a simple request only for the opening of the building. This ill-judged omission was of fatal consequences. The day was thus lost, and ultimately the cause itself, through the vacillating and retreating disposition of its friends. They held on that day everything in their own hands. All might then have been accomplished without loss or injury to anyone. My views to the contrary of the course then adopted are well known to you and to my fellow citizens. I have been accused of dictating to others the conduct of our affairs. If this had been the case, and it had been in my power to enforce an implicit compliance on their part, it is not a little singular that at this most important crisis my associates should have sacrificed my judgment to their own. Believing that a government on paper was no government at all, I desired to see it put immediately into action by taking possession of the public property and bringing the whole case to a practical issue at once. This was my opinion, desire, and advice. They yielded to other feelings and opinions, dreading also the interference of the national executive. The first and best opportunity was suffered to pass by. The cause declined and died. Had the legislature been disposed on that day to avail themselves of that tide in the affairs of men, which, taken at flood, leads on to fortune, the people's government would have gone fully into operation and the state would have peaceably acquiesced. But although the legislature did not incline to active measures at this time, they nevertheless very near the close of the session passed a resolution requiring all persons having possession of any of the public property to surrender it to their successors in office, leaving to the defendant, as governor, the responsibility of carrying this act into effect under his oath of office to execute the laws." The time of the defendant was occupied with the signing of commissions and with the other business of the executive until he left for Washington at the request of a number of his friends and of a large public meeting held by the Suffrage Association in Providence. The object of this visit to Washington was to make a true representation of our affairs to the president and to avert his intervention to suppress the rights of the people. No favorable result was attained. The defendant remained some days on his return at New York and conferred with friends in that city upon one special subject by which he had been mainly induced to leave Providence at this interesting period of events. I refer to obtaining assistance of men from abroad to repel this threatened interference of the president, which I and others believed to be unconstitutional and a most unjustifiable outrage on the rights of the people of Rhode Island. 
He addressed the Democratic citizens of that place at Tammany Hall, stating to them most explicitly the sole ground on which they were called to act, not as intermeddlers between two political parties in a state, but only in the case distinctly proposed, freely avowing that if the people of Rhode Island, when left to themselves without interference of the United States, were not capable of maintaining their own rights, they did not deserve to be free. The appeal was cheerfully responded to. The answer was the outburst of warm and generous hearts devoted to the great cause of popular rights. Five thousand, nay, almost any number were disposed to pour themselves out to arrest this great injustice now threatened to the more numerous party in Rhode Island by throwing into the opposite scale the military forces of the United States. Mr. Dorr then alluded to his interview at New York with Major William G. McNeil, who had stated here in his testimony that defendant had, in a half-jesting way, offered to him the command of his men, and who, as defendant supposed, was friendly to the suffrage cause. Comments on Mr. Pierce's testimony, which fell from McNeil, had been occasioned by a misapprehension by Mr. Pierce of the defendant's conversation with him. Defendant did not say that at Chapachet he had been a few days before advising with Mr. McNeil respecting military affairs. Defendant meant to be understood that he had seen this gentleman not a long time before, alluding to this meeting in the city of New York. Defendant had never seen him since, nor had any correspondence with him during the recent difficulties, nor had he any reason to suppose that he had not been faithful to the charter government, though defendant was surprised to hear of his appointment as the charter general, having supposed him to be favorable on the other side. Mr. Dorr then passed to the public meeting on Federal Hill upon the day of his return to Providence. The reason of his producing a number of witnesses who stood very near him when he made his address on that occasion was to refute the testimony which had been given by two political opponents respecting the sword died in blood, an expression which they had attributed to him. This testimony was not founded in fact and had been clearly and sufficiently contradicted. The object evidently was to hold up the defendant as bloodthirsty and desiring destruction for its own sake, a representation which would not be readily credited by those who were acquainted with him. Affairs had now arrived at the point where the defendant must either surrender to the charter government, who aimed at his arrest, resign his office, or enforce the laws under the government of the people. The defendant had no disposition to abandon the cause while there was any ground to stand upon. He could not retire from the contest, believing himself to be on the just side of it, and encouraged by the voice of the citizens, who had so often and unequivocally avowed their intention and readiness to support the government whenever they should be called upon. Not to have proceeded would have been to incur imputations which no honorable man would suffer to rest upon him. The time had now come to carry the laws into effect. The assembly had directed that all the public property should be delivered up. This resolution had not been complied with. It was of great importance that the arms of the state should be recovered from the opposing government, which had rightfully ceased to exist. After consultation with the military officers present at a meeting in the evening of the 17th of May, the defendant ordered that a movement should be made to gain possession of the arsenal in Providence, where these arms were deposited. A force of 234 men proceeded to execute this purpose, not far from 2 o'clock on the morning of the 18th of May, first repeating the demand which had already been made by the General Assembly for the surrender of this portion of the public property. Mr. Dorr then described the proceedings at the arsenal after a demand for its surrender had been made and refused, the placing of the men and pieces in position, the change of position in consequence of the darkness, occasioned by a dense fog which had come up after the force had been put in motion for the arsenal ground, the detachment of a body of men to lie very near to the building, to carry it by assault, so soon as the door should be opened to return the first fire of the artillery without, 
the order to fire, the flashing of the pieces, which were rendered unserviceable by dampness or water, and could not be discharged, the immediate disorganization and retreat of the men without orders, the withdrawal of the pieces and the return of the defendant after daylight, with the last of the men, about thirty in number, to headquarters at Anthony's house. The statement that the defendant had attempted to fire one of the artillery pieces was not true. The tendency, if not the intention, of this story was to show a development of destructiveness on part of the defendant, which could not entrust to subordinates the performance of duties which they were ready and more competent to discharge. The defendant did not that night wave a torch or apply it to either of the guns. A commander may be placed in a position where it devolves upon him to do the work of others. No such necessity there occurred. The defendant gave the order to fire the pieces. The whole responsibility rests on him. End of section 11. Section 12 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rutger. American State Trials, Volume 2, by John D. Lawson. The Trial of Thomas Wilson Dorr for Treason, Rhode Island, 1844, Part 11. Mr. Dorr then further proceeded to describe the occurrences of the morning of the 18th, the return to Anthony's house of only 60 men, the appointment of new officers, the preparation to maintain the ground, the firing of the signal guns at 7 o'clock without the return of more men, the receipt of a letter from several members of the legislature in Providence stating that the members in the city had resigned their places and that all support was withdrawn from the governor the report to defendant of the commanding officer that the men who had remained were leaving the alternatives of a surrender or a retreat the order to the commanding officer to fall back with those who were left and to dismiss them in his discretion the departure of defendant at half past eight o'clock the arrival of the charter forces six hundred to eight hundred in number from one to two hours afterward in the forenoon the conduct of the twenty-seven suffrage men who fell back with the pieces and kept them the pretended compromise with which defendant had and could have nothing to do the suggestion to compromise a constitution bearing absurdity on its face if a rally had taken place in providence after he left on the eighteenth it was his intention to return defendant went directly to the city of new york where he remained till the twenty first of june when he left that place for norwich in the state of connecticut it will here be asked why after so unpromising a result and such a failure of support any further attempt was not abandoned as impracticable and hopeless, and the defendant did not regard himself as discharged from any further obligation to the cause and the government which he had thus ineffectually endeavored to carry into effect. The reply is that rights and duties are not to be measured by degrees of success or failure. The cause was the same. The obligations resting upon the commander-in-chief were not relieved by any events which had as yet occurred. The Constitution was valid and subsisting. The people could abandon it by their votes or by their acts. They had done neither this misadventure in the city of providence was attributed to unforeseen circumstances to accident to the want of a more general notice in the country towns for a general rally at the headquarters of the state to a temporary panic in the city to the pusillanimity of leading friends of the cause in that place from whom better things were expected and whose hearts had failed them in the moment of trial Encouraging reports and statements were received by the defendant through letters and by visitors from various parts of the state, all indicating an earnest desire to retrieve the late disaster, to regain the position that had been lost, and to carry into complete effect the constitution and government of the people. 
a second opportunity, he was assured, would not be lost upon the defenders of the common cause, whom defeat had aroused to new exertions. Favorable expectations were entertained by them from the transfer of the legislature to the country from the city, and which would have the effect of drawing together a great body of men for its protection, and to overcome resistance to its laws. The quotas of men in the several towns, including Providence, who were pledged to support the defendant whenever he should call upon them, amounted to 1,300. It was my duty to give the people another opportunity to sustain their government, and if it had not been given, the loss of the cause and the death of the Constitution would have been laid at my door, and by many who had promised to stand by them to the last. No such charge now rests upon me or can impeach my memory. I left New York with the general intention of carrying into effect the government under the people's constitution, but not without a proper consultation as to the time and manner of proceeding. I reached Norwich on the 22nd of June and sent an order to Gloucester to convene a council of military officers, who were to consult whether any steps could now be taken, and if so, what. If they should deem it expedient to select a spot of ground for defense, they were cautioned to find a position that was tenable. No council was held. A precipitate gathering of men took place at Chpachet without orders on the 23rd. The capture of Shelley and his associates gave the first impulse. They were supposed to be the scouts of an attacking party on the village of Chpachet. When Colonel Comstock, in his testimony, stated that this was an accidental meeting, he meant to be understood that it was voluntary and without command, or the specification of any definite object beyond the present protection of the place. Having been informed that 500 men in arms were already thus assembled at Chipachet, the defendant set out and arrived there on the morning of the 25th of June. He forthwith issued a proclamation to convene the legislature at that place, instead of Providence, on the 4th of July. He also issued and repeated special written orders to the military in all the towns of the county of Providence, and as much farther as practicable, to repair to headquarters and support the government of the state against all oppositions, present or intended. Ample notice was given to a large majority of the friends of the Constitution of the exigency which now required their services, and those who had pledged themselves to respond to the call of their commander had now the desired opportunity to manifest the sincerity of their professions and the reality of their devotion to the cause of the people. The appearance of things on his arrival was, to the defendant, justly the occasion of surprise and disappointment. A slight breastwork was found thrown up on two of the sides of a hill, which was commanded by several other heights. There were then about 140 persons in arms. On Saturday afternoon, an order was given on the hill by defendant to count all the armed men, and the return consisted of 180 or 90, some 30 of whom shortly after left the ground and returned to their homes. It was a volunteer movement. None were forced into the ranks. Until Monday the 27th, all were at liberty to depart as freely as they came. On that day, all who took up arms were required to retain them and to submit to the usual discipline of the camp. Of the large number of spectators from various quarters, few remained to share the fortunes of the field with those who occupied A. Coates Hill. Their curiosity was satisfied, and they departed. Of the 400 to 600 who were pledged in the city of Providence, 35 men and 10 officers arrived at the camp. The greatest number of the military at any time during the affair at Chipachet, including all in one place who were under arms and subject to orders, was about 225. This was the average statement also of all the witnesses who were in the best position to know, and you have heard their testimony. Among them are the colonel in command, the acting adjutant general, one of the aides of the commander-in-chief, and several spectators who visited the hill and took no part in the transactions of the time. 
Mr. Dorr alluded to the perversion by political malice of some of the expressions in an address to the troops, to the 13 Spartans, as they were called, from New York, whose numbers and designs were so much magnified at the time by opponents for political effect, as a company of mechanics, whose leader was an engraver and a man of remarkable abilities, to the capture of Mr. Knight as a spy, from whom it is now heard that he was fired upon before his capture by one of the guards, to the national flag under which the men were assembled, to the defective supply of provisions, sufficient only for a few days, and received by contributions or purchased with means collected on the ground, to the want of balls for artillery, there being only enough for an engagement of about fifteen minutes, to the means for carrying on a campaign which were too small to be named, the reliance being on the prompt action of the great mass who voted for the people's constitution, to the temperance which was maintained by closing and keeping closed at defendant's request the bar of the public house, to the respect paid to private property, which was enjoined on all by the commander-in-chief. With regard to the design to take the city of Providence, of which so much has been said, all that could have been implied in it was to seat the legislature in the house, which was appropriated to them, to defend them there, to place the public officers where they belonged, and to sustain them and the government generally by all necessary means. But there was nothing in the condition of affairs at Chipatchet to suggest this step, and no such plan was ever suggested among the officers, whatever might have been the wishes or the words of individuals. Of course, there was no proposition for occupying the college buildings in Providence as barracks, though they were tendered by the president of that institution to the charter troops and occupied for this purpose. All the surmises of an intention on the part of the suffrage forces to enter Providence with the watchword of beauty and the banks, and to invade the property and the homes of the citizens, were the base inventions of the enemy. I point the jury with feelings of just pride to the general appearance of the men of Chipatchet, who had been summoned here as witnesses, if the jury were desirous of seeing what description of persons they were, who took up and retained arms for the constitution and rights of the people. It appears from the testimony that these brave and true-hearted men were, for the most part, hard-handed farmers and mechanics already possessed of suffrage themselves and coming forth to contend for the rights of their unfranchised fellow citizens who chose to stay at home. Let no reproaches be cast on these men of Chipatchet. Let them rather fall on me, in whatever form or on whatever pretense, rather than on the associates who nobly responded to the call of duty, in the discharge of which they were ready to sacrifice their lives. They were not only, with the vast odds against them, ready to defend their post, but to meet their opposers halfway upon the road. When the rumor of an approaching force reached them, they stood at their quarters to return with interest whatever they might receive. However, it might now be the fashion to disparage the men of Chipatchet. The time was not distant when a general public opinion would attribute to their agency all the political liberty that is now possessed in Rhode Island. It is a fact that may be denied, but which is fully sustained by evidence that the bill to call a convention to frame a constitution was not introduced and passed in the Charter Legislature of 1842 until the legislature had become satisfied that an actual gathering of men in arms had taken place at Chipatchet. The shield of their attack upon one constitution was the premise to substitute another. Mr. Dorr then referred to the mortifying but indisputable evidence presented to himself and his associates that the people of the state had ceased to desire that their government should be defended and carried into effect. They had been called like spirits from the vasty deep, but they did not come. No attention had been paid to the military orders sent to the towns. We were not supported by the people. We had assembled at Chipatchet not as a faction to contend for our own special interests, but for the common welfare. We were not only abandoned by our party men, but remonstrated with, denounced, and condemned by them. 
They were even taking up arms against us. We were reduced to the necessity of fighting both our friends and our enemies. The will of the people thus manifested was obeyed, and we ceased to contend. Mr. Dorr went on to describe the call and proceedings of the Council of Military Officers and their deliberations on the course which it was most proper to pursue. The defendant laid before them the state of affairs and his own opinion that it was impracticable for them of themselves and in the midst of a general desertion to maintain the position which they had assumed. The conclusion of the council was that duty required us to disband. The order to this effect was approved by the separate voice of the members. It was communicated to the men in camp by the general commanding between 6 and 7 o'clock in the afternoon of June 27th. As it had not been discussed among the men, it may have occasioned surprise and dissatisfaction with some who were not aware of all the facts. But the feeling was momentary, and we separated, though with bitter regrets, yet with the conviction that our duty had been fully discharged to ourselves and to the cause. The order to disband was given when no enemy was near, and it could be issued and obeyed without dishonor. The charter forces did not present themselves in the village of Chepachet till the next day, thirteen hours after the disbandment, and then they would have found no trophies had the order to dismantle the hill been complied with. A letter containing the order to disband was forthwith communicated to Mr. Burgess, a friend in Providence, for publication in the Express, the paper of the suffrage party. But the order was intercepted in Providence, delivered to him, read by him in the presence of the captors, and shortly after, in the same evening, before the governor and several of his council, and the commanding general McNeil all of whom were thus early informed that they had no enemies to contend with and were able to govern their future movements accordingly. The defendant left Chepachet about an hour after the disbandment had taken place, at a quarter before eight, in company with Colonel Carter, one of his aides. Thus ended all attempts to carry into effect the government set up under the constitution of the people was abandoned by those who had most solemnly resolved to maintain it by all necessary means, and who had given the defendant the assurance of their prompt and unfailing support whenever it should be called for. He retired from the field conquered, not by his enemies, but by his friends. Mr. Dorr then proceeded to speak of his motive in returning to the state. He had intended to do so before the revocation of martial law, and aware of the consequences, but not at liberty in the view of honorable considerations or desiring to avoid them, he addressed a letter to some of his friends in Providence early in August 1842 to ask them if any duty in their political service remained undischarged, and if they had any further claims upon him. The reply was that his personal liberty was still of value to them, and that he might serve their cause by preserving that liberty and prolonging his absence from the state, while they were exerting themselves to retrieve their losses and save themselves by the power of the ballot box. But this instrument, the suffrage men of Rhode Island, seemed to hesitate in employing at the vitally important election of April 1843, as they had before hesitated to employ the cartridge box when force had become indispensable to the safety of their cause. Through desertions, they were overthrown at this election. The defendant's resolution was immediately taken to return to the state, and his return was deferred to the month of October, only by his private concerns and by bodily illness. He returned here not in strict defiance or courting prosecution, but as a Rhode Island man who had a right to be here who desired or sought no domicile abroad, and was unshaken by defeat in the avowal of the doctrines of liberty, which he had ineffectually attempted to reassert in the land of Roger Williams. The return of the defendant was voluntary and free. He was not forced back by the efficacy of rewards promised to his captors, or by any compliance abroad with the requisition of this state, in a case when no wrong was deemed to have been committed. The consequence of having thus obeyed by his return a sense of honor and duty is attested to you by the proceedings which have now so long occupied your attention. 
Mr. Dorr enforced upon the jury the conclusion which fairly and unavoidably resulted from this rapid survey of the course of action which he had pursued, that as the rightful elected chief magistrate of the state he had acted strictly in conformity with his duty and obligations, not omitting on the one hand what the constitution and laws required of him, or exceeding on the other hand the bounds of authority in the adoption of measures which the necessity of his position required, not inviting other men into dangers which he was not ready to share with them not drawing the sword for mere destruction, but in the support and defense of the government, which had been entrusted to his charge. The jury were thus brought back again to the great and vital question of the case, a question of rights and of principles, affecting not merely the fortunes of the defendant, but the liberty of the people, and reaching to the foundation of our republican institutions." Gentlemen, if I am in the right, as I then believed, and now believe with an unshaken confidence, in the truths for which I have contended in this state, then the blame, if any, is not that I served too well, but that I did not serve still better in this righteous cause. Claiming no exemption from the frailties of our common humanity, but at the same time conscious of having been animated by good motives in the pursuit of justifiable and honorable ends, I commit my cause into your hands with a just hope of your favorable consideration and with a firm confidence in the final verdict of my countrymen. Joseph M. Blake, Attorney General, began by remarking that there had been introduced such a mass of testimony in the case, so many motions made and inquiries started, with which the jury had nothing to do, that he feared they might lose sight of the true question and the only one they had to decide, whether in fact the defendant levied war against the state as alleged in the indictment. He said there were many subjects intimately connected with the crime for which the defendant was on trial, about which great diversity of opinion had been entertained, and which, on a proper occasion, were worthy of serious discussion, but on the trial of the issue before them the jury were not required or expected to give any opinion. He went on to enumerate some of them, such as whether a majority of the male adults of the state actually voted for the so-called People's Constitution, and if they did, whether they intended anything more than a simple expression of opinion in favor of a written constitution for the state, how far suffrage should be extended, and what residence should be required as a qualification, whether a majority of the people of a state without the assent of the minority and without any authority by law have a natural right at their pleasure to change a government founded on compact and declare and make such new government binding on all. With all these, however, important and greatly as they had been agitated during the late disturbances, the jury were not to meddle, all evidence on those points having been ruled out by the court leaving them only to decide whether the defendant had levied war against the state. If he did so levy war, then he was guilty of treason, the highest crime known to the law. That it embraced or led to all other crimes, murder, rape, robbery, and the whole catalog of human transgressions. That it aimed at the sovereignty of the state, and the subversion of all government, that no attempt at revolution can by any government be admitted as legal, that there could be no rank or absurdity than a legal or constitutional rebellion, that the success of rebellion gave it its legality, that in despotic governments attempts at revolution were often morally right and patriotic even when unsuccessful, because in them there might be no other available mode of redress of grievances, and justifiable as in the language of the Declaration of Independence, when government becomes destructive of the true ends of government, the security of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and when all other means of redress have been resorted to perseveringly in good faith and failed. In no case can such an attempt be justified unless the change would promote the general good, or unless the means are obviously adequate to the end. Bad government is better than none, and no condition of a people can from oppression be so bad as not to be made worse by frequent insurrections and civil war. 
Mr. Blake next spoke in terms of commendation of the principle of Rhode Island government as securing the people from oppression and of its correcting itself through the force of public opinion, an instance in the existing state constitution made and adopted by the freeholders liberally extending and securing the right of suffrage. He next took up the history of the suffrage cause in the state in reply to the remarks of the prisoner. He denied that there was any evidence that the legislature had at any time refused to conform to what they knew or believed to be the wish of a majority of the people on this subject, that prior to 1841 there never had been a majority in favor of a written constitution. He stated that even a small party in its favor could keep up its organization, but for short times, and that the prisoner himself, after he had been instrumental in that organization, had once been a candidate for Congress without making that a test question or placing his pretensions to support on that ground, that he was run as a Democrat merely, and on that principle received the support of the Democratic Party. He then proceeded to a review of the legislative proceedings upon the petition of Alicia Dillingham and others, presented in January 1841, praying for an extension of suffrage, stating that the General Assembly promptly responded thereto by calling a convention to frame a constitution. The sages who founded our institutions were fully aware of our danger, and with the wisest forecast provided against it, and constructed as our national government is, and as our state governments are, and connected together as they are, we have a more effectual safeguard against revolution than is possessed or ever was possessed by any other nation on earth. We look to the federal government to regulate our intercourse with foreign nations and to protect us against foreign aggression, but it is not a more effectual defense against assaults from without than against domestic factions and insurrection. The states are sovereign within their spheres, but all are intimately connected together. The sovereignty of one cannot be affected without affecting the sovereignty of all. No one of them can be stricken from its orbit without disturbing, if not destroying, the whole system. By the federal constitution, the United States are to guarantee to the several states the republican forms of government existing when the constitution was adopted and protect them against domestic violence. The state governments being thus protected by the general government, it is hardly possible that a faction can ultimately prevail by force in any of the states. From these premises, I argue that no successful rebellion or revolution could ever occur in this country, however it might originate or however widely spread, until a great majority of the people of a majority of all the states shall become infatuated for the horrors of war, rather than resort to the peaceful remedy of the ballot box. The defendant was aware that the United States would be bound upon application of the governor or the legislature to protect the state against domestic violence, and intended to call in forces from other states to resist the power of the general government and commit treason against the United States also, and therefore admitting the extent of the grievances to have been such as would justify revolution, still he had no right to to resort to arms unless he had adequate means to ensure success or strong reason for believing so. With all the aid derived from the sympathizers at the Pewter Mug and Tammany Hall, New York, his whole force either at Federal Hill or Chapachet was but 300 or 400 men. This was the extent of his means, and with them he commenced a revolution of this state and the United States. But the prompt action of our own authorities and of our own citizens rendered the interposition of the power of the general government unnecessary. Rhode Island proved able to take care of herself. The spirit that was with her early citizens in their struggle for regulated liberty is still alive, and her sons still possess hearts to cherish and arms vigorous to defend her institutions against assaults from within or without. I propose now to consider the question which has been previously argued to you by the prisoner's counsel and himself, namely, whether treason can be committed against an individual state. Durfee, Chief Justice. It is unnecessary for you, Mr. Attorney, to take up any time on that point. The court are unanimous in the opinion on that point. 
Mr. Blake, since then, gentlemen of the jury, that the court deem it unnecessary for me to say anything on that subject, we may well take it for granted that treason may be committed against a state. That levying war against a state is not necessarily treason against the United States, but is treason against the state. There is no dispute as to what is levying war. An assemblage of men for the purpose of making war against the government, and in a condition to make it, not to make it successfully, is levying war, is treason. Enlisting and marching men are sufficient overt acts without coming to battle. If an army avowing hostility to the government should march and countermarch before the enemy and then disperse without firing a gun, it would be levying war. I had intended to go into an examination of the testimony, but the defendant had admitted the facts, and I really do not know what I might not with safety have asked for a verdict against him, as upon a confession made in open court. It was, however, proved and admitted that the defendant collected forces, commissioned officers, and directed the troops as their commander in May at Providence and in June at Chapachet that he attempted to take the public property and ordered the guns to be fired upon those who defended it, that the troops under his command took prisoners of war and conducted in all respects like a hostile army, that the object of all these movements was to overthrow the existing government and to establish another in its stead, that the whole case was made out. But it is contended that in all these proceedings the motives of the defendant were pure and patriotic and not traitorous. You can judge of a man's motives only by his acts. There is no process for seeing the workings of the heart by which to determine the secret springs of action. The defendant says he did not intend to commit treason, but he intentionally levied war against the state, and the law makes that treason, whatever else he may have intended. The law affixes the intent to act. A man who should burn his neighbor's dwelling might as well set up in defense that he did not intend it should be arson. A man accused of theft might have a good defense on the ground that he took the goods by mistake, but it would hardly do for him at this day to admit the intentional taking and contend that he did not intend to commit theft, for the owner was rich and he sincerely believed a more equal distribution of property would promote the public welfare. I suppose that there never was a rebellion in which some of the parties implicated did not believe their conduct justifiable, but a jury cannot consider that question. The pardoning power made, juries and courts must be governed by the law and evidence. Did the defendant levy war is the only question you have to answer by your verdict, and there is no way for avoiding the question, for the facts are all proved and admitted. He has given you a history of his arraying of troops, of the attack upon the arsenal, of his leaving the state, of his encampment at Chpachet, and his plan of attacking the forces of the United States. It is not astonishing that a man of intelligence in a country like this, more blessed in her political institutions than was ever any other country on earth, should openly admit his intention to overturn the government of his native state by civil war and carry on the war, if need be, for the attainment of his purposes against the United States and detail the particulars of the whole affair as though it were a matter of everyday occurrence and as coolly and with as little emotion as he would detail the progress of a negotiation for merchandise or any other business transaction. He would even arraign the counsel who opened for the government and place him on the defensive because he characterized the treasonable acts of the defendant as they are characterized by law. He would have him concede that in his attempts to shoot down his fellow citizens, his motives were most honorable and disinterested, and, for aught I know, most benevolent and Christian. No small portion of the defendant's testimony was irrelevant to the issue the jury were trying, but intended for effect out of court. Although I well might, I did not object to its introduction, yet that on the part of the government none had been offered, which had not a direct hearing on the question before the jury. 
Such matters had been thus thrown into the case by way of embellishments I should not stop to discuss, but merely allude to some portion of the testimony in justice to some of the witnesses whose credibility was impeached. Mr. Blake next commented on the testimony of Colonel W. Blodgett and E. H. Hazard that they without doubt heard what they swore, although none of the defendant's witnesses should have heard the same. They might also have sworn to expressions used by the prisoner which neither Blodgett nor Hazard could recollect, and that the characters of the two government witnesses were too well known to require any vindication. It is contended that whatever acts were done by the defendant connected with the charges laid in the indictment, he did as the agent in the name and for the benefit of the people, and therefore you are urged to infer the purity and patriotism of his motives. Now what portion of the people was he the agent of, and how many of them were in favor of civil war? There could not at that time have been in the state less than six or seven thousand men in arms. How many of them were his followers? Why, 234 at the arsenal and 250 at Chapachet. These were for subverting the state government by a civil war and their will he was willing to regard as law and to sacrifice himself in effecting it. His own legislature in May would not give him countenance in using force, so soon after he, on his own responsibility, resorted to it in open defiance of their will and authority. The prisoner may have been governed by principle. If so, it was a cold, abstract principle, a principle which petrified the heart. The defendant declared he should not resort to other states for aid unless upon a requisition the president should order United States troops to support the state authorities. In that event, he did expect aid and intended to resist the troops of the United States, and he very coolly tells you his design was in that event to commit treason as well against the United States as against the state. For such is the law laid down by Judge Story in his charge to the grand jury in this courthouse in relation to this very case. It was the defendant's intention then, as he admits, to levy war against the United States at the risk of involving the whole country in all the horrors of civil war. Was ever so great a work undertaken with means so disproportionately small? with so little prospect of success was there ever a calamity so great produced by so trifling a cause admitting the establishment of the people's constitution to have been just and desirable after the question of suffrage had been conceded i ask if the cost of effecting it as estimated by the defendant himself would not have been greater infinitely greater than the good sought to be obtained Many of the original members of the suffrage party, when they found the defendant intended a resort to force, deserted and denounced him and took up arms with the charter troops to oppose him, must be ascribed the bloodless issue of the contest to the overruling care of a special providence that would still continue to guard and protect us. But it is urged by the defendant that in trying him, you also try the 14,000 men who voted for the People's Constitution. If you were trying him for voting for the Constitution, that might be true, but you are trying him for levying war, and if anybody else, it would be more proper to say the 200 or 300 who were with him and willing to carry out his plans by force. You, however, are not trying the validity of that Constitution or the legality of the existing government, but a naked question of fact. Did the defendant levy war or not? If he did, he committed treason. It is the duty of the jury to stand by the law. Their own interest and the peace and security of the whole alike require it. There might have been brave men with the defendant, but very few, and Colonel Wheeler, who ran off in the fog, I consider a good type of the insurgents generally. All the points of law raised by the defendant had been ruled against him by the court, but the defendant, after a verdict against him, could move the court for a new trial or an arrest of judgment or apply to the legislature for a pardon. 
If the defendant did levy war, you must find him guilty. You have nothing to do with the law. The court would take care of that. The defendant himself had confessed all the facts, and if you refuse to find him guilty, it will be the severest blow which you can afflict upon the judiciary of the country, the palladium of your rights and liberties. The defendant says that the public will hold you responsible for the verdict you may render in this case. Well, be it so, gentlemen, and recollect that nothing will so brace up a man amidst friends or foes in the conflict of parties as being conscious that in trying times, regardless of consequences to himself, he had performed his duty. Gentlemen, you are the sworn guardians of the law in a case of momentous importance, one involving principles that reach to the very foundations of civil government. I will not doubt that you will prove true to the trust, without regard to personal or political or party considerations, nor suffer them to deter you from a faithful performance of the obligations imposed upon you by your oaths. End of section 12. Section 13 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rutger. American State Trials, Volume 2 by John D. Lawson. Trial of Thomas Wilson Dorr for Treason, Rhode Island, 1844, Part 12. The Charge of the Court. Chief Justice Durfee, gentlemen of the jury, in delivering the charge in this case, I shall confine myself very strictly to the notes which I have prepared for the purpose, making, however, such remarks in illustration of the general propositions which may be advanced, as may seem necessary, in order to render them more intelligible. I take this course that we may not be misunderstood here, nor misrepresented elsewhere, without having it in our power to apply a corrective. We find it necessary in this case to guard against misrepresentation, not particularly against misrepresentations made to the people of this state, who know us, but against those which may be made to the people of the United States, and perhaps to posterity. For no one wishes to disguise it, I let it be proclaimed to the whole world and through all time to come that the principle which is involved in this issue lies at the very foundations of all our political and social institutions, and that upon your verdict does the future confidence of all considerate men in the durability and safety of our institutions depend. We have, therefore, some ambition to appear as we really are constitution of this state and the act under which this court is organized make it our duty to deliver to the jury in all cases the law in charge. No very desirable responsibility in any case, least of all in one that has so roused the passions and deeply stirred and agitated the popular mind, but bound from the nature of our organization as a court and with the oath of God upon us we shrink from no duty, we recoil from no consequences. In discharging this duty, I speak not for myself merely, but for the court. It is of some importance to know what the duties of a court are, and what the duties of a jury are, for they cannot be one and the same in relation to the same case. If it be our duty to decide what the general law of the land is, it is not your duty also to decide it. If it be your duty to ascertain what the facts are, and then apply the law to the facts as you find them, it is not our duty to do the same. A judicial tribunal, which is but a growth of the wisdom of ages, is not so absurdly constituted as necessarily to bring the court into conflict with the jury, and the jury in conflict with the court, and thus to defeat all the ends of justice. If such were the state of things, we could have no law. What the court did, the jury might undo. What the jury did, the court might undo. And thus, at the very heart of the system, would be found in full operation the elements of anarchy and discord. Let us see if our duties are so jumbled together that we as a court can perform the duties of a jury, and you as a jury can perform the duties of a court. 
It is the duty of this court, and of all other courts of common law jurisdiction, to decide upon what evidence shall pass to the jury, and what shall not. Questions as to what is evidence and what not will arise, and in all time it has been made the duty of the court to decide them. It is the duty of this court, as of all others of like jurisdiction, to decide what shall pass to the jury as the law of the land, touching the indictment on trial, and what shall not. For questions as to what is law and what is not law will in like manner arise, and the law has appointed none but the court to decide them. If it errs in its decisions, it can correct them on a motion for a new trial if the verdict be against the prisoner. If it willfully decides wrong, its members are liable to impeachment and disgrace. When the evidence has passed to the jury, it is their duty to scan it closely, to decide what is entitled to credit and what not, and when they have determined what the facts are, that are proved or confessed, they apply the law which has been given them to the facts thus ascertained, and then acting as judges both of the law and of the evidence, return a verdict as to them, deciding under their oaths, may appear to be right." There is no conflict of duties. The jury act in harmony with the court and the court with the jury. Gentlemen, it has been our desire in this case to adhere strictly to our ordinary course of ruling upon all questions that were brought before us. We were determined, if possible, to go not one hair's breadth beyond our duty, nor fall one hair's breadth short of it. In the eye of the law, all men who stand at the bar of this court, accused of crime, stand equal. We have no favors to deal out to the man of distinction or notoriety, which we deny to the lowly and obscure. In the eye of this court, all are equal, and while we allow them the same rights, we subject them to the same rules. We have been earnestly pressed in this case to depart from our ordinary course of ruling in criminal cases. This I attribute mainly to the want of familiarity on the part of the accused and his counsel with our usual course of ruling here in criminal trials. We have been urged to permit them to argue questions of pure law to you, gentlemen, questions touching the jurisdiction of this court, questions touching constitutional law, to argue over again questions which have once been solemnly decided after full argument by eminent counsel, and which we considered closed questions, and that in the midst of a jury trial. All these motions we have been obliged to overrule, reserving to the accused the right to be heard, should it become necessary on a motion for a new trial. Not that we have any doubt of the correctness of our former rulings, but that we will not refuse him a hearing in the proper stage of the proceedings. And now, after those rulings, the case comes to you to be decided according to the evidence which has passed to you, and the law which shall be found applicable to it. What is the crime set forth in the indictment? It is treason against the state, the highest crime known to the law. In this state, punishable with imprisonment for life, in all others where it is named, punishable with death. And if we pass from our own to foreign lands, and particularly to that country whence we derive all our political and legal institutions, punished with death inflicted under circumstances calculated to strike the greatest terror, and to fix on the memory of the criminal the most lasting infamy. I mention this not forgetting that many noble hearts have fallen victims to the accusation of treason under arbitrary governments, but simply that you may estimate the universal sentiment of abhorrence with which this crime is regarded, and that you might, while you thus estimate it, feel that it is your duty to require the most satisfactory evidence that it has been committed, and that the defendant is guilty before you return a verdict against him on the one hand, Hand, and that you may feel on the other the necessity of discharging with firmness and fidelity that duty which every juror owes to his country, under the oath which he has taken, to return a verdict of guilty on legal proof of guilt. It is no less the duty of the jury than of the court 
to secure the peace of the state by aiding in the firm and impartial administration of the laws. Now, the first question is, can this crime be committed against one of the states of this union? This question can be considered wholly irrespective of this indictment, wholly irrespective of the guilt or innocence of the prisoner. It involves, in fact, no impes. It is a question of mere constitutional law and for the court alone to decide. And as the organ of the court, I say to you, gentlemen, that wherever allegiance is due, there treason may be committed. Allegiance is due to a state, and treason may be committed against a state of this union. The defendant and his counsel have gone into an argument to show where the sovereign power is, and that it is in the people of the United States, considered in their primary and natural capacity, and that it is that people which is sovereign in the state of Rhode Island, and not the organized people of the state itself. In answer to that, it is sufficient to say that we know of no people of the United States, save that which the Constitution of the Union has organized and formed, and they are sovereign only to the extent and in the qualified sense which that instrument expressly grants and defines. Against the natural people, the primary capacity people, I wish I could command a better phrase, no crime whatever can be committed, save that which in violation of the laws of God one man may perpetrate on another. It is against an organized people only that any crime, and especially the crime of treason, can be committed. We cannot enter into those speculative inquiries as to the origin of government. Sufficient for the court and jury is it that government exists. They must take it as it is and where the plain letter of the law prescribes to them their course, that course they are bound to pursue, no less from a sense of duty than by the requirements of the oath of God which is upon them. The Constitution of the United States itself, an instrument in which it is hardly to be sought for, recognizes the fact that treason may be committed against a state by an implication too strong to be resisted. It expressly provides that a person accused of treason in any state who shall flee from justice and be found in another state shall on demand of the executive authority of the state from which he fled be delivered up to be removed to the state having jurisdiction of the crime. The result of the debate in the convention that formed the Constitution of the United States in reference to the article defining treason is in accordance with this view. The decision of all the courts of these states that have had occasion to touch the question, the opinions of all our commentators on constitutional law recognize the same fact. The circuit judge of the United States who presides in this district, Justice Story, in his recent charge delivered in this district, in contemplation of the then unsettled disturbance in this state, repeating almost verbatim the language of the Virginian commentator on Blackstone, distinguishes between treason against a state and treason against the United States. As I understand his views, treason against the state and treason against the United States are to be distinguished, the one from the other, by the immediate objects and designs of the conspirators. If the blow he aimed only at the internal and municipal regulations or institutions of a state, without any design to disturb it in the discharge of any of its functions under the Constitution of the United States, it is treason against the state only. Though, if the object be to prevent it from discharging those functions, as the election of senators or electors of president and the like, it becomes treason against the United States. If any further judicial opinions delivered with reference to our recent troubles were wanting, in order to confirm these views, we have them in the opinion of the same court and the same judge deciding on the sovereign authority of this state to proclaim martial law. Can it be doubted that the power which, 
of its own constitutional authority can proclaim martial law is sovereign or a delegated sovereignty and that it may define and proclaim what treason is. If any further authority were requisite on this point, we have it in the fact shown in the argument of the question to the court that 11 out of 26 states of our union have inserted an article in their constitutions defining the crime and providing for its punishment, and that two others have made the same provision in their statute laws. The statutes of no other of the states have been referred to, nor have been examined by the council. The probability is that if they were examined, we should find not that 13 only of the states, but that the whole 26 have defined this crime and made provision for the punishment of it. The power to provide for the punishment of this crime the legislature derives not from the United States or the people thereof, but from our own people, from the organized sovereign people of the state. That legislature exercising this power has declared that treason against the state shall consist only in levying war against the same, or in adhering to the enemies thereof, giving them aid and comfort. This law, we now say to you, is constitutional and binding on all, and that the sovereign authority of this state is such that treason can be committed against it. We are now prepared, gentlemen, to consider the indictment. The indictment consists of four distinct counts, upon either or all of which you are to return a verdict of guilty or not guilty, according to the evidence which has passed to you, and upon that evidence alone. Nothing that comes within your mere personal knowledge is to be taken into account. You are to presume that the defendant is innocent at the outset, and to be led to a conviction of his guilt, if to that conviction you come, solely by force of the evidence given to you, or of the admissions made. Each of these counts substantially charges that the prisoner, being under the protection of the laws of the state, and owing allegiance and fidelity to the said state, not weighing the duty of his said allegiance, and traitorously devising and intending to stir up, move and excite insurrection, rebellion, and war against the said state, with force and arms unlawfully and traitorously did conspire, compass, imagine, and intend to raise and levy war, insurrection, and rebellion against the said state, and in order to perfect, fulfill, and bring to effect the said compassings, imaginations, and intents of him, the said Thomas Wilson Dorr, he, the said Thomas Wilson Dorr, with a great multitude of persons, amounting to a great number, armed and arrayed in a warlike manner, being then and there unlawfully, maliciously, and traitorously assembled and gathered together, did falsely and traitorously assemble and gather themselves together against the said state, and then and there with force and arms did falsely and traitorously, and in a warlike and hostile manner, array and dispose themselves against the said state, and then and there, in pursuance of said traitorous intentions and purposes aforesaid, he, the said Thomas Wilson Dorr, with the said persons, so as aforesaid traitorously assembled and armed and arrayed, in manner aforesaid most wickedly, maliciously, and traitorously did ordain, prepare, and levy war against the said state, contrary to the duty of his said allegiance and fidelity, against the form of the statute, in such case made and provided, and against the peace and dignity of the state. The particular overt act charged on the prisoner in each count is that he together with the armed multitude described with force and arms did falsely and traitorously and in a warlike and hostile manner array and dispose themselves against the state. The only essential difference in the counts is that the first two charge the overt acts to have been committed in Providence, the first on the 7th day of May, 1842, the second on the 18th of the same month. The two succeeding counts charge the overt acts to have been committed in Gloucester, in the city of Providence, one on the 26th day of June, 1842, 
the other on the 27th of the same month. The overt act charged in each of these counts must be proved by at least two witnesses or by the prisoner's confession in open court. They may be the same two witnesses or other two witnesses, but two witnesses at least there must be. There must be two witnesses to prove the particular overt act or part which the prisoner is in each count charged with having taken in the levying of war. And when once any particular overt act is fixed upon him by the two witnesses required or by the confession, he must be deemed guilty of levying war as described and proved under the particular count which contains such overt act. The acts of the armed assemblage then become his, unless he proved that he had abandoned the conspiracy or was so absent that he could not have participated in it. Now the first question of law is, what is it which constitutes the levying of war within the meaning of the act? In giving you the meaning of these words, we shall rely as little as possible upon our own judgment. We shall endeavor to be governed as much as possible by the opinions of those able jurists who, undisturbed by the excitement and alarm of an agitated community, have, after calm and deliberate consideration, pronounced their meaning. To constitute, says Justice Story in the charge to which I have already referred, an actual levy of war, there must be an assembly of persons met for the treasonable purpose, and some overt act done, or some attempt made by them with force, to execute or toward executing that purpose. There must be a present intention to proceed in the execution of treasonable purpose by force. The assembly must now be in a condition to use it, if necessary, to further or to aid or to accomplish their treasonable design. If the assembly is arrayed in a military manner, if they are armed and march in a military form, for the express purpose of overawing or intimidating the public, and thus attempt to carry into effect the treasonable design, that will of itself amount to a levy of war, although no actual blow has been struck or engagement taken place. This construction of the meaning of the words levying war against the state accords entirely with, with the opinion of Chief Justice Marshall, delivered in the case of Aaron Burr, and in the main with that of all eminent American jurists and writers on the same subject, and we now give it to you as the construction which this court places upon those words. Let us now consider this construction of the meaning of those words with reference to the evidence which has passed to you under the first two counts in this indictment. It is for you to say what that evidence proves, but I may put these questions to you. Has it been proved by two or more witnesses or by confessions in open court that on the 17th and 18th of May or either of those days there was assembled in Providence a body of armed men arrayed in a military manner that they had provided themselves with artillery, musketry, or like implements of war for the express purpose of making an assault upon or taking possession of the state's arsenal or magazine of arms in Providence, that they marched on the night of the 17th or morning of the 18th with the intent of carrying into effect their design, that they arrayed themselves in arms before the arsenal, that the arsenal was at the time in the actual occupation of the military forces of the government of the state, that they sent a messenger with a flag to demand its surrender, that upon the refusal to surrender the messenger returned, and that upon his return or before it one or more of the guns were aimed at the building, that there were two attempts made to discharge them into the building. If you believe these facts have been proved by the two witnesses or by the confession of the prisoner, it is the opinion of this court not only that war was levied, but actually carried on against the state, although not a single gun was discharged and no engagement actually took place. But supposing you should be satisfied that war had been thus levied, this will not justify you in returning a verdict of guilty. You must be satisfied by the two or more credible witnesses, or by confessions in open court, that the prisoner took a part in it. 
In other words, his particular overt act must be thus proved upon him. It is observed in the case of Bullman and Swartwout that if a body of men be actually assembled for the purpose of effecting by force a treasonable object, all those who perform any part, however minute or however remote from the scene of action, and who are actually leagued in the general conspiracy, are to be considered traitors. Both circumstances, says Judge Marshall, must concur. They must perform a part which will furnish the overt act, and they must be leagued with conspirators. He who comes within this description levies war, arrays, and disposes armed men against the state. If this applies to the private in the ranks, it preeminently applies to the commander-in-chief. As to him, it can only be necessary to prove that he claims to be such commander, and to prove his presence at the scene of action, for it cannot be supposed that an assault can be made on an armed arsenal or fortress in the presence of the commander-in-chief without his orders unless it be made so to appear. Indeed, it has been declared by the highest authority that to appear at the head of a rebel army is itself an overt act of levying war. The main question then is, did the prisoner march with this body of men to the arsenal, or was he then and there present, and is the fact proved by the two or more credible witnesses, or confessed by him in open court? If you believe from such evidence or confession that he was leagued with the conspirators and performed a part, the overt act or acts charged are fixed upon him, and there is no alternative but to return a verdict of guilty on one or both these counts in the indictment. I now pass to the other two counts in the indictment. These charge the levying of war against the state in Gloucester on the 25th and 27th of June. Was war then and there levied within the meaning of the law? That is the first question which you have to decide. An assemblage of armed men for a treasonable purpose may sometimes accomplish its object by the terror which it inspires, and hence it has been decided that actual violence to external objects is not necessary to constitute the levying of war. It can hardly be doubted that if a rebel army, to use the language of Chief Justice Marshall, avowing its hostility to the sovereign power should front that of the government, should march and countermarch before it, should maneuver in its face, and should then disperse from any cause whatever without firing a gun, it can hardly be doubted, I say, that it would amount to an act of levying war. True, the government troops were not present and under the eye of the insurgent force at Chipatchet as at the arsenal, but a portion of the state, if not actually invaded by a foreign force, was nevertheless, as all the testimony goes to show, in the actual occupation of a body of armed men hostile to the government. The laws of the legal government did no longer there afford protection to its peaceful citizens. Men were taken and treated as prisoners of war. Property was seized by the strong arm of military force. The hostile force occupied an entrenched camp on a hill commanding the public highways, and a number of pieces of ordnance were mounted and loaded and so directed as best to defeat an assailing force. Ammunition was there. A commissary department was established, and from two to three hundred men were daily drilled on the height as preparatory to further operations. Everything indicated preparations for a permanent military occupation of a portion of the state. Knowledge of these facts threw the whole state into military array and subjected it to martial law. This was the external appearance of the movement, and certainly it does present an appearance of a movement of a warlike character, and equaling at least a mere military maneuver in front of the government forces, as mentioned by Chief Justice Marshall. 
Should you be satisfied by the confession in open court or by other evidence that an armed force of two or three hundred persons was actually embodied at the time and place mentioned in the indictment, there entrenched in a fortified camp with the avowed object of overturning the existing government and establishing a new one on its ruins, and to that end taking prisoners of war and seizing private property, there is no doubt in the mind of this court but that such acts amount to a levy of war within the meaning of the statute. But though from the proof in the case you should come to this conclusion, you still cannot find the prisoner guilty unless you are also satisfied by the two or more credible witnesses or by his confession that he performed a part which will be the proof of the overt act. Here also to prove that he was present acting as commander-in-chief is, as under the two preceding counts, at once to prove that he took a part and was leagued with the conspirators. The material point here to be proved is the overt act, and any two credible witnesses who swear that they saw him with the insurgent force armed marching with them, or performing any other part in furtherance of the common design, are sufficient to establish the overt act. The intent with which he was there, or the character which he, as their commander-in-chief, assumed, may be established by proof of his own admissions, or by his declarations in open court, or by his acts, and may be proved by one or any number of witnesses, each testifying to a distinct admission or a distinct fact. Now, gentlemen, if it has been thus proved, under either or both counts, that he performed a part with the insurgent force, that he was their commander-in-chief, these two counts also are sustained, and it will be your duty to return a verdict of guilty, otherwise a verdict of not guilty on the same counts or either of them. But it is due to the prisoner, since such has been his course, to say that from the testimony which he has put in, and his declarations here in court, he has seemed to be rather ambitious to show that he was there performing a part, what that part actually was, and how he stood related to his associates. It may be, gentlemen, that he really believed himself to be governor of the state, and that he acted throughout under this delusion. However, this may go to extenuate the offense, it does not take from it its legal guilt. It is no defense to an indictment for the violation of any law for the defendant to come into court and say, I thought that I was but exercising a constitutional right, and I claim an acquittal on the ground of mistake. Were it so, there would be an end to all law and all government. Courts and juries would have nothing to do but to sit in judgment upon indictments in order to acquit or accuse. The accused has only to prove that he has been systematic in committing crimes and that he thought that he had a right to commit it, and according to this doctrine you must acquit. The main ground upon which the prisoner sought for a justification was that a constitution had been adopted by a majority of the male adult population of the state, voting in their primary or natural capacity or condition, and that he was subsequently elected and did the acts charged as governor under it. He offered the votes themselves to prove its adoption, which were also to be followed by proof of his election. This evidence we have ruled out. Courts and juries, gentlemen, do not count votes to determine whether a constitution has been adopted or a governor elected or not. Courts take notice without proof offered from the bar what the constitution is or was and who is or was the governor of their own state. It belongs to the legislature to exercise this high duty. It is the legislature which, in the exercise of its delegated sovereignty, counts the votes and declares whether a constitution be adopted or a governor elected or not, and we cannot revise and reverse their acts in this particular without usurping their power. 
Were the votes on the adoption of our present Constitution now offered here to prove that it was or was not adopted, or those given for the governor under it to prove that he was or was not elected, we could not receive the evidence ourselves. We could not permit it to pass to the jury, and why not? Because if we did so, we should cease to be a mere judicial and become a political tribunal, with the whole sovereignty in our hands. Neither the people nor the legislature would be sovereign. We should be sovereign, or you would be sovereign, and we should deal out to parties litigant here at our bar sovereignty to this or that according to the rules or laws of our own making, and heretofore unknown in courts. In what condition would this country be if appeals could be thus taken to courts and juries? This jury might decide one way and that another, and the sovereignty might be found here today and there tomorrow. Sovereignty is above courts or juries, and the creature cannot sit in judgment upon its creator. Were this instrument offered as the constitution of a foreign state, we might perhaps, under some circumstances, require proof of its existence. But even in that case, the fact would not be ascertained by counting the votes given at its adoption, but by the certificate of the Secretary of State under the broad seal of the state. This instrument is not offered as a foreign constitution, and this court is bound to know what the constitution of the government is under which it acts without any proof even of that high character. We know nothing of the existence of the so-called people's constitution as law, and there is no proof before you of its adoption and of the election of the prisoner as governor under it and you can return a verdict only on the evidence that has passed to you. Our ruling on this point is in exact accordance with that on the same point in the trial of the indictment of the state against Franklin Cooley, where after an elaborate argument, it was unanimously decided that no such evidence could be received by the court or passed to the jury. This case is now with you, gentlemen. You can find the prisoner guilty on one or more counts in the indictment and not guilty on the residue, or you may return a verdict of guilty or not guilty generally, according as you find the law applies to the evidence given you. The court has now performed its duty. Go, ye gentlemen, and do yours. Mr. Turner, we wish the court to further charge the jury that in criminal trials for capital offenses, the jury are the judges of the law as well as of the facts in the case, and also that the evidence for the state does not support the charge of traitorous and criminal intent as laid in the indictment. Chief Justice Durfee, we can charge the jury only as we have charged them. They are to apply the law as laid down to them by the court, to the facts as they find them proved before them. On the other point, the only question of intent which the jury have to consider is, if they find all or any of the overt acts of levying war sufficiently proved, whether the defendant at the time intended to commit those acts. End of section 13